uh, that way you can figure out the loss tangent of the material. And for instance, in this graph on the left, we can see that you know the sapphire, the bulk sapphire seem to have a, a loss tangent of order two to the minus seven, which is uh, significantly less of what has been measured by uh, other experiment, which uh, do not use uh, uh, thin uh, uh, sapphire, which has been you know uh, chemically uh, contaminated by photoresist, uh, by developer, by all that kind of stuff, and has not been diced. Uh, there is an experiment, for instance, uh, done by uh, Tober in Australia, which you know shows for a a uh, big uh, chunk of uh, bulk uh, uh, diamond, a, a, a quality factor of 10 to the 9 uh, uh, at, uh, at, at 1 Kelvin. It's not in the milli Kelvin, but it's at 1 Kelvin that is, uh, you know, with a few hundreds uh, photon. But still, you know, these measurements are instead the single photon uh, level measurement, so they might be slightly different. And the, on the other on the other side, the graph shows that you can actually observe a difference in the quality factor of a piece of silicon diced uh, versus a piece of silicon cleaved. And, uh, and it appears that the cleaving of the sample makes it, uh, makes it for a higher quality factor than uh, using a saw and producing some uh, dislocation and breaking uh, at this, on the side of the chip. In uh, uh, at MIT, they have tried a different uh, way of quantifying losses uh, in which they use a multiple design with different participation ratio so that they can characterize over different processes and different design uh, some of the surface uh, participation and the bulk participation that are currently unknown. Of course, uh, because they use different geometry and different uh, processes, the result might be uh, non-consistent. And uh, in some cases, there is not enough sensitivity. And when there is not enough sensitivity, you see that there is only a bound, not an actual number. But the general idea of solving uh, uh, the linear system of equation 1 over Q, A, 1 over Q, it's, of course, uh, a smart idea, and we have ourselves applied uh, using multimode resonator. This multimode resonator solve a problem because the, all the modes are present at the same time. The preparation of the so, this, of the cavity is the same. There are no different preparation. You are not doing different processes. You are measuring everything at once, and so you can take, for instance, a three mode and uh, and uh, solve uh, the the system of equation which is there and in particular we have chosen a uh, sim insensitive mode uh, a uh, another sim insensitive mode where uh, the participation of the ma of the uh, metal air is larger and a conduction limited mode where both the y sim and the uh, metal air interface were at zero. And uh, that way we can solve, you know, in multiple steps, we can solve the system of equation and obtain the actual values. Of course, you know, measurement noise makes for problems. Uh, because you don't measure uh, the quality factor with infinite precision, you have errors, and these errors might be big enough to make uh, uh, the system uh, non-resolvable. And if you are in that case, well, too bad, you are again getting only a bound uh, to, the, to the parameter, but otherwise you can actually obtain number. And at this point, those number make sense because they are obtained on a, on a single sample, treated in a single way, and in a range of frequency, I would say typically four to 12, uh, gigahertz in which we can reasonably expect that the that all the parameter stays the same stay constant through the different frequencies so in general you can solve a general problem and of course if the rank of the matrix a 
is larger than the number of, uh, of unknown that you have, you can uh, exactly solve it. And if you have as a condition that the error in your measurement is such that for each of the variable, the, uh, the delta X over X is larger, uh, is less than one, then you can resolve the system exactly and know exactly, quantify exactly the losses in your case. And of course, these are losses due to the material, but also to the processes to which you have, uh, uh, with which you have uh, uh, generated that particular uh, geometry of the material. Here, I show you this cavity I was mentioning before, where, you know, this T311 mode of this elliptical cavity shows a quality factor of uh, 1.1 billion. So a T1 of order 14 milliseconds. Now, an elliptical, ellipsoidal uh, cavity is not the ideal way of uh, cavity for uh, coupling qubits. So we're now modifying the cavity in the right way, but we are uh, close to get uh, a qubit uh, measuring a cavity with the uh, equality factor of order billion. And, uh, and that will, of course, improve things. Let me let me now go one moment on the substrate and the metal on the substrate to show you how that uh, technique is useful also for understanding uh, uh, and separating surface losses from bulk losses on a planar fabricated uh, transmit. Uh, there, the the parameter that count are the bulk and the three surfaces. And since it's difficult to separate these surfaces because they have linear dependence that goes pretty much in the same way with the geometry for all three, we punch them up all together, call them you know, P-surf or Q-surf. So that now we have just to separate the bulk from the, surf, the surface. Now with the dipper, as I told you before, we measure a quality factor with, which is a combination of the two the bulk and the surface, if you uh, dip the sample right in the middle. We believe that uh, by changing the thickness of the sample or moving the sample on the side, we should be able to have enough sensitivity to separate bulk and surface, but we haven't done it yet. We have done that instead for films on, on the substrate. So let me show you now what how we do that. The technique is using these uh, strip line uh, adhesion uh, uh, strip line uh, resonators in which two lines go parallel on the substrate. And now you can define a differential mode, which you can imagine is very sensitive to the surface, and a common mode, which is instead very sensitive to the bulk. You can see the E field in the two uh, uh, different configuration. And in particular, even if uh, the differential mode has a 89% contribution and energy dissipated into the bulk. Its uh, surface contribution is 10 times larger than the surface contribution from the common mode. And so you can uh, possibly separate them if you have enough sensitivity. In order to measure them, we put many of them inside the packaging, which is properly closed and sealed with indium so that we have uh, negligible uh, seam losses, and we can neglect that contribution to the quality factor of the device. And then what we do, instead of depositing just a single uh, layer of metal, we use electron beam lithography, so the same technique that we would fabricate transmit with, and uh, using the same uh, uh, polymer, copolymer uh, resist uh, bilayer that we use for making uh, the transmit, double angling uh, aluminum by evaporating uh, uh, the trilayer aluminum and with the oxidation in the center so that each of these strip line is in fact a complete trilayer so that we can actually simulate the the the, the entire process of fabrication of a transmit and uh, and here you see what we observe are quality factor and because we know the 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 participation ratio of the bulk and the surface from the simulation, we can uh, observe quality factor that for the differential mode scale by a, approximately one order of magnitude going from less than a photon to 100,000 photons. 
and uh, by a factor of uh, something of order seven for the common mode going from uh, uh, almost to, uh, a single photon to order of a million photons. So, of course, you know, this dependence uh, uh, of the quality factor has uh, a source in uh, possibly in, uh, in the, uh, in, uh, nobody knows what the source is exactly, but everybody calls it two level system. Uh, I don't think that we have a clear uh, microscopic understanding of what we're talking about, but because they are well separated in, we can uh, uh, assuming uh, that we have uh, a, an error not larger than 20% in the measurement and, you know, the error bar uh, show that this is true. We can actually obtain the tangent delta of both the surface and the bulk and the, the bulk uh, sapphire uh, tangent delta correspond to the one that we have independently measured with the dipper. So we're pretty confident that we might be reading the right number and that this 10 to the minus three of the surface, it's equally uh, correct. Of course, to be honest, this tangent delta is calculated with some uh, uh, parameter that we have assumed, like the thickness of this uh, layer, of the surface layer, the epsilon of the surface layer. Probably a more correct way of quantifying would be to uh, multiplying by the tangent delta by T, by the thickness of this layer, and dividing by the epsilon of this layer and calling, you know, a, uh, if you want, a uh, loss factor. Uh, in that case, it would be independent from any choice of thickness and, uh, and the dielectric constant that you can make. And once you do that, you can do a breakdown of the loss uh, in, in uh, on the single photon loss in this device. And you can see that, you know, while uh, the differential mode is 92 of the losses coming from the surface. Uh, the ball, the, the, the common mode is 44% of the losses coming from the bulk. So the differential mode is almost entirely dominated by the surface, while the, the common mode is almost uh, half and half bulk and, uh, and surface dielectric. Of course, if you base yourself on this number, you can make a, a geometry description of a typical transmit and, uh, and calculating the participation ratio of this uh, uh, particular geometry and using uh, the, the quality factor, the intrinsic quality factor that we have obtained for our deposition and processes, we can estimate that a typical transmit should be of order 140 uh, microsecond T1 plus or minus 40. And so, you know, if you want, all our transmit are inside the uh, two sigma from that average. And, uh, you know, we have seen up to 220, 210, but no more. Now, of course, uh, a question comes immediately. Since uh, both the bulk and the surface limit the, uh, you know, it's a 48, 52% the transmit. What can we do something? Can we modify significantly the bulk? Can we do, I don't know, surface reconstruction of the sapphire? Can we do some proud different, can we use a different uh, substrate uh, maybe with better treatment? Can we modify the deposition or some of the chemistry using the patterning? Maybe instead of using aluminum, using other material. And I know that our friends in Princeton have uh, walk that path uh, with the tantalum and they have observed uh, 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 T1s of order three to 500 microsecond. And yesterday we learned that at IBM, they got to a millisecond. And I presume, even if I don't know for sure, that they must have done something similar using uh, either better defined surfaces or different material with different processing of the of the layers and you know we'll we'll learn uh, in the next few weeks the detail and we can uh, then uh, uh, quantify the losses using this loss analysis that that I have proposed now of course you know because the bulk is as important as the surface you know one idea that can naively come to your mind is like why do what can I get rid of the of the substrate what do I need the substrate 
So a few years ago, we, we wondered about that and we tried uh, to remove the substrate. In that case, we were using uh, uh, silicon as a substrate, not sapphire like we we're doing recently. And silicon is uh, more, much more easily removable. Uh, and if we can use a vacuum, uh, since uh, nobody has ever measured the imaginary part of the dielectric uh, constant of uh, vacuum, uh, we can presume the vacuum uh, is uh, uh, the best uh, dielectric that we have uh, available, no tangent delta. So what we did was, you know, take some uh, highly uh, resistive silicon, which is the substrate uh, of uh, uh, favorite uh, by IBM, for instance, and uh, deposit our transmit on top. And instead of masking uh, the aluminum and then doing some uh, etching, we decided to use the aluminum as the mask itself and etch uh, the, the silicon using what is called a, a, a dry reactive ion etching process, a Bosch process, in which you first do an etching with SF6, and then uh, you follow with a, a C4FA passivation, and then a new etching, followed by a new passivation, and so on and so forth, until you make uh, a, a, a removal as deep as you can. And of course, you know, under the big pad, there is still going to be a, a pillar, but the junction itself and some part of the circuit might be suspended, like you can see in this picture, where the side uh, pads of the transmon are uh, still residing on top of a layer of uh, silicon, which has been, you know, now uh, shaped by the consecutive uh, removal and passivation. And uh, the junction itself is instead completely uh, suspended uh, and has no substrate underneath. This is a better picture of it, right? Uh, you can actually see the suspension. And here in more detail, you can actually now start seeing the junction itself. And you see the passivation etching forms, all those little uh, uh, slices of, uh, you know, of silicon that are still under the, the uh, that piece of uh, wiring. And here you have a junction which is completely suspended and it's uh, because of some, uh, probably there is some uh, uh, compressive, uh, uh, sorry, tensile stress that once the silicon is removed, uh, relaxes down and, you know, takes like sort of a banana shape in the air. And of course you can do that, but you can make the deep, the hole deeper and deeper, you know, you know tens of micron or 200 nanometer, 300 nanometer, 400 nanometer. And uh, this way you can hope to observe different quality factor for the same substrate. Uh, and uh, we are, we, we have done some analysis of that kind. And unfortunately what we found is for the type of silicon that we were able to procure, the advantage was such that uh, in the best case, the quality factor was the same as uh, uh, the sapphire that we were able to uh, to buy. So no advantage there, but it's good to know. Another tool that we have recently produced in order to uh, remove sources of contamination and study the contribution of, of contaminants to the to the fabrication of our devices, it uh, uh, will be explained by me in the next few slides. Let me show you a typical squid design, and you can see that at the end, uh, there are some area where there are clearly some black mark residue around the, the, the superconducting layer. They might be organic residue related to the uh, presence of E-beam resist. They might be chemical used during the fabrication for cleaning the substrate at the beginning or for producing the development and the trenches into the resist. Could be degassing of the organic mask during uh, the UHV 
deposition uh, in the UHV deposition system. Uh, and also when you do AFM micrograph of a device, you can sometimes notice uh, some very small, very, very uh, thin of order nanometer thickness or at most 10 nanometer thickness uh, feature that might come from uh, a contamination uh, on the surface. So how to how to minimize contamination? Can I, can I make the substrate contamination free? Well, the idea that we had was to use a, a different wafer to produce the mask and then use that mask to deposit the, the device on, the, on a separate wafer, which will be at that point not treated chemically in any possible way. So, but now how you make this uh, mineral mask? We call it a mineral mask. You, know, you have to have uh, some uh, uh, spacer to separate physically the mask from the, uh, from the wafer so that you don't have contamination coming from uh, residual on the mask itself. You have to have a, a thickness of the mask itself so that it doesn't break. And you have to have some handle so that you can actually move the mask around, couple it to the wafer and clamp it to the wafer in order to do shadow deposition through the mineral mask. There are different ways you, we, we try to do, in which we try to do that using either silicon with silicon nitrite layers or silicon on insulator wafers. I'm gonna describe for you the silicon and insulator wafers because it's the one that has given us more uh, more and better results. So in this case, we have a silicon substrate that whose thickness vary between three and six hundred micron, depending on the particular wafer, uh, with a one two micron insulator on top, and on top of that, a high resistivity micron thickness uh, piece of silicon. So, of course, using uh, uh, easy fabrication technique uh, borrowed by, you know, the semiconductor industry, you can pattern uh, the, the, the top layer, and then you can remove uh, uh, the silicon, the, 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 the isolator from, uh, with reactive ion etching. You can then strip the resist away, immerse in potassium hydroxide, and shape the wafer in a way that makes it uh, possible to realize a mask. Now you are left with the uh, homework of making the mask itself. Uh, you are left with a five micron thick, let's say in this particular case, a piece of silicon that you have to shape pattern as a mask. And you can do that using a traditional electron beam lithography technique. You can make spacer using HSQ. Like here, you, you can see some of the spacer, and the purpose of the spacer will be at the end to physically separate the mask from uh, the substrate. And then you can spin coat with, with electron beam resist, write down, develop, and then using the deep reactive ion etching, the Bosch process. I explained before the one that we use to remove uh, the silicon substrate, you can actually pattern the mask to make the structure that you want. At this point, it's all, you are only left with the task of putting clamping the mask on top of your wafer and using an evaporation source, you can uh, and uh, you know deposit. For instance, in this particular case, the the mask that we have made on the silicon was a transman in which the junction would have been obtained by a Manhattan technique with two line with two different angle deposition you, and using the undercut given by the spacers, you can actually form a Joseph junction. And here are images of the silicon before the deposition and here are optical images of the Joseph junction and uh, and uh, and you know of this plasma made uh, this way. Uh, we have done AFM imaging of those in order to be able to actually figure out the the width and the height 
Of course, the width and the height are determined by the pattern that we made on the wafer, right? By this patterning that you see here, but they are not identical because unfortunately the mask it's separated by a few micron from the substrate. And so there is some shadowing and some, uh, uh, you know, long tail of the metal uh, due to the shadowing effect. We count in the future to reduce the spacer to make uh, this better. But anyway, we measure normal resistance. We pull it down. We measure frequency. And in general, the normal resistance uh, can be, can, depending on width, and on process, on, on oxidation process, can be made to vary between 1 and 18 kilo ohm. And the average critical current density that we can obtain is of order 20 angstrom, uh, ampere per square centimeter. And they age very little. But why try only Manhattan? Let's try also the Dolan Bridge. And this is what we have done here. We have patterned uh, the uh, the silicon in the form of Dolan Bridge. You can see that in the in the picture in the SCM images, and we have deposited. Unfortunately, what happened in this case was that because uh, the mask is made very very weak, where the junction is formed, uh, the heat of the deposition bend the mask, and the design comes up not to be exactly what we wanted. So it is, is it possible to better control the junction overlap? Yes, we have already uh, fabricated a different set of clamps that beyond clamping maintain also the mask under some uh, tension stress to avoid this uh, phenomenon. We hope uh, to get some uh, device uh, soon. But you see, the important thing is that with this technique, we now can fabricate devices that have on substrate that have never seen any chemical and any processing except the deposition itself. And there'll be no lift off, no reacting on etching on the substrate. And uh, if you make the substrate in the right uh, uh, um, shape and with the right aspect ratio, you don't need the, to uh, cleave it or uh, dice it uh, after that. And with that, I think I've concluded. I hope that I convinced you that it's possible now to measure uh, all the factor of uh, all the different parts of a uh, superconducting cavity and transmit circuit. And uh, uh, based on that, it's possible to start thinking about ways of separating the losses that are not yet known, as well as uh, trying to eliminate known source of, uh, of contamination and losses. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Fronzio, uh, for this very nice talk, giving us uh, great insights into the, the details of all the fabrication processes and the materials uh, that are involved and how to optimize them. I really, really enjoyed that. So uh, we'll have, uh, yeah. So we'll have time for uh, a few questions, probably. So, sure, please. Uh, yeah, so I have uh, first uh, Rajesh Kumar. Uh, can you please go ahead with the question, Rajesh? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question regarding the uh, cavity resonator uh, materials. Uh, is there any significant uh, advantage of using uh, pure aluminum over aluminum 6061? Okay, so uh, the reason for which we uh, use aluminum 6061 when we make uh, preliminary uh, shape of the cavity is that it's uh, uh, much cheaper and much easier to uh, uh, shape, you know, with uh, with a lathe or drills or that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, it's not the quality factor of aluminum 6061 would not compete with high quality uh, aluminum. For instance, you know, we have made cavity with a, a five uh, nine purity aluminum and those are much, much higher quality by at least a factor of uh, 10. But the problem is that uh, aluminum, uh, uh, high purity aluminum is very difficult to metallurgically work with. And so 
uh, uh, fabricating a, a cavity in aluminum uh, in five uh, and purity aluminum is expensive because the material is expensive, as well as the uh, uh, fabrication of the device becomes expensive, requires uh, different type of machines, requires uh, uh, continuous changing of, of the drills on the lathe, and, and so it becomes uh, ex high, you know, much higher uh, cost. And so we prefer to do the uh, prototype in aluminum 6061 and then to work out, once we work out all the kink and, uh, away, we then fabricate the actual uh, device for quantum information processing using high purity aluminum. Now, okay. uh, to be completely open, at Fermilab, as you probably know, they've tested different material than aluminum. They have now made uh, very high quality cavity, uh, as uh, high quality as ours, in uh, in Nairobi. And actually, if they uh, steal those cavities and uh, bake them at very high temperature in such a way that the niobium oxides are completely evaporated away, they show coherence time of order second. Unfortunately, nobody has yet proven that bringing cavity containing transmon at 400 uh, centigrade will not degrade the, the transmon completely. So we're not yet sure if these two second cavity can be used in an, act, in an, an actual uh, circuit. I know that the friends of Fermilab are working on that, but uh, that has not been proven yet. But anyway, even if you don't uh, do any uh, particular treatment, the ability of fabricating uh, high purity niobium and to control the formation of oxide has brought them to a, a cavity in the 2 to 10 gigahertz range with coherence time of order uh, 20 milliseconds, which you know, it means a, a quality factor of order billion, uh, maybe between 1 and 2 billion. So uh, kudos to them, very good cavity too. Uh, and this is only aluminum and niobium. You know, there is an entire periodic table of metal for you guys to work with. Of course, okay. you can use the one that are superconducting. Otherwise, uh, uh, the game um, uh, will have no winner. But uh, but there is uh, many other material that we can think of, and uh, of which we don't know yet the property once they are made into cavities. Okay. Answer Thank your you. Question, Rajesh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yes. You're welcome. Okay, thanks for that. So the next we have uh, Praveen who has a question. Praveen, if you can go ahead, please. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Lugi, for you for a wonderful presentation. Actually, amazing. Actually, the work you have done is really terrific. So amazing. Uh, really impressed. Really. <laughs> the first one actually, if you show that suspended aluminum bridge, you have used a DRA process. Yep. Yeah, but actually, uh, what I feel is actually like uh, creating the uh, that have a suspended bridges. Actually, that normally what we do for creating the transform that is the finally we we process whole wafer and finally we do the uh, uh, transform fabrication. Here you can right. fabricated the transform and you have done the lot of process. During that process, that is not uh, caused any surface that aluminum surface damage or some kind of thing. That is my first question. Uh, the second question is actually like, uh, uh, what is the coherence time uh, you achieved with the mask instead of like uh, the second process you have mentioned? You have used a instead of uh, uh, this photo mask, sorry, EBL mask. You have used a uh, silicon mask. Yes. So what are the coherence time improvement you got in that case? Yeah. Okay, so we're still in the process of uh, measuring those devices, so I can give you yet numbers. I believe that we can, uh, we will be able to demonstrate uh, 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 different quality factor than the usual fabrication because the fabrication is completely different. Now, as you are saying, you know the the mask is made out of silicon. It's a high resistance. Silicon, and you know, we use high resistivity just to make sure that it's uh, uh, pure and doesn't contain any uh, dopant that might act as a contaminant on a two level system if uh, released on the substrate. 
the substrate in that particular uh, experiment was uh, uh, um, EFG uh, sapphire, uh, whose surface was not prepared in any way, as it comes from the from the company that makes it. Uh, we use a company called Kyocera, which is based in Japan, and uh, and uh, the, the the surface of the substrate has a one nanometer peak to peak. Uh, 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 um, roughness, so it's very very smooth, but it's not reconstructed in any way. But you see, while it's difficult to reconstruct the surface and then put it into a evaporation system, in this case, be, uh, because there there is no actual mask, but uh, no uh, carbon based mask, but the only mask is a, a mineral mask. It's possible to bring the substrate very high temperature, let's say of order 1100 C, and reconstruct the surface in C2 before the deposition. And then using technique like read or stuff like that, make sure that the deposition is actually done uh, in the proper way. And, and, and we believe that in uh, proceeding in that way, we can probably achieve better quality factor for the film that constitute the electrode of the of the transmit. Will that improve the T1 of the transmit? Maybe if the T1 of the transmit is, as we think, bleeded at least 50% uh, by the bulk substrate, uh, that might help. And if uh, the surface con uh, contribution, some of the surface contribution, which is another 50% of the current uh, limitation of the Korean's time are reduced by the absence of contaminant, maybe we can improve it. And of course, you know, you can do that with many different uh, electrodes like you know, niobium or tantalum, because now since it's, not a, uh, since it's a mineral mask and not a uh, organic mask, it won't burn while you're depositing. You know, electron beam deposition of niobium and tantalum reaches very high temperature, which completely burn the resist and makes it impossible to remove. A mineral mask instead remain completely uh, untouched by the high temperature. It's a bulk silicon, uh, micron thick bulk silicon, and uh, and so we can hope to fabricate uh, uh, tantalum, uh, uh, aluminum, aluminum oxide, aluminum tantalum junction, or niobium, uh, uh, niobium oxide, niobium junction. Those actually a little secret that I give you. Those we have already fabricated, we have not measured yet, so but we are in the process of doing it. Mm -hmm. so answer your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Gordon. Thank you yeah. very much for the question. Okay. So we are almost out of time, but I see Vikas uh, has been raising his hand for quite some time. So maybe one quick question, Vikas, from your side. Yes, uh, yeah. Thanks for this very, uh, very good presentation. Uh, can we have junction made of made of aluminum and cavity made of some other material like niobium, or is there any rationale that we want to keep both junction and the cavity of same material? Oh no no no! Uh, in uh, in the niobium uh, cavity that Fermilab has fabricated, I know for a fact they are testing. Uh, Aluminum uh, based devices fabricated at Rigetti. So, uh, yeah, you can mix up the two. Actually, it might be an advantage because you see, when you cool down the system, the cavity, especially if it is higher TC, will cool down first, will undergo transition first, and might expel magnetic field, reducing uh, vortices trapped into the uh, lower. Uh, 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 the lower TC material, if the design of the cavity is done properly. Um, uh, so there might be actually an advantage in using different material. Okay, so I guess that answers Vikas's question. And before I move on to the next speaker, I have a personal curiosity, a very quick one maybe. So do you think that a material that does not form a native oxide uh, will give us more advantage in this regard? So I'm going to disclose another little secret. We're trying to use a material that do not form oxide to passivate the top surface of, uh, 
of material the form oxide, like niobium. And we're using a bunch of material metal, uh, highly expensive metal. If I can give you a hint, I cannot tell you more than that, that uh, will not form any oxide. And in a very thin layer, they can be fully proximitized and probably eliminate the forming of uh, aluminum oxide, which is uh, the suspect in uh, forming of spin that might be part of the noise observed in, uh, in, in superconducting uh, circuit uh, like squid. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that answer and thanks for this great presentation. So I guess we all applaud uh, Dr. Thank you very uh, much for this. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot for your talk. And now it uh, it's time to invite the next speaker uh, for today. So our next speaker is Professor Stephen Gervin. Uh, he is the Eugene uh, Higgins Professor uh, of Physics at Yale University, and he has served also as the provost of, uh, like, deputy provost for research at Yale from uh, 2007 to 2017. Uh, Professor Gervin is a very distinguished academic. He has been elected fellow of the APS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Art and Sciences. He's also the foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and member of the US National Academy of Sciences. In 2007, he was awarded the Oliver Buckley Prize for, uh, of, of the APS for fundamental and experimental theoretical research and coordinated many electron systems in low, uh, uh, sorry, many electron states in low dimensional systems. He is one of the pioneers of uh, the technique of circuit fluidity, and uh, which is the application of quantum optics to superconducting microwave circuits. He is currently the director of co-design center for quantum advantage at Brookhaven National Laboratory. So, with great pleasure, I welcome Professor Stephen Groving. Uh, he will be presenting his talk on bosonic quantum error correction codes and quantum simulation in circuit QED. So, Professor Gervin, uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the invitation to speak at this meeting. Uh, so, as mentioned, I'm the director of the C2QA, which is a consortium of five national laboratories, 18 universities, and IBM is our industrial partner. And we're one of five national quantum information science research centers recently funded in the US by the Department of Energy. Um, so let's see if I can get my screen to advance here. So, let me start with my take home message. Uh, both quantum error correction and quantum simulation of physical models that contain bosons are both vastly more efficient if your hardware actually contains bosons natively, if it contains harmonic oscillators. I'm not going to have time to talk to you much about quantum simulations. I'll flash one slide at the end, but I'll mostly speak about quantum error correction and try to convince you that uh, this is a very difficult uh, problem. Uh, and it's less, slightly less difficult if you use bosons rather than ordinary qubit codes. So, uh, if I have discrete variable um, systems, let me see if I can bring up my pointer. If I have qubits or discrete variable uh, systems, so when transmon qubits have many levels, but they're sufficiently anharmonic that I can approximate them as two level systems. If I have three of them, then I have a Hilbert space of dimension two to the three, uh, eight states uh, represented uh, like this in the, in the Z basis. If I have a harmonic oscillator, I formally have uh, an infinite number of states. 
Uh, but if I use the first eight states, photon number zero through seven, that's the same dimension as over here, and I can represent it in terms of three qubits, or I can efficiently represent three qubits with one single oscillator. The oscillator is in some sense much simpler than the qubits, there's only one of them. It uh, doesn't, it it's, uh, can be a two dimensional coplanar waveguide resonator or a three dimensional cavity, such as Luigi was talking about. Uh, but because the dimension of the Hilbert space is countably infinite, this is, and you can talk about wave functions uh, as a function of the coordinate, which in this case is the coordinate is the electric field in the center of the cavity. This is called a CV or continuous variable uh, quantum system. It can be a microwave oscillator, a mechanical um, oscillator. And there's a lot of interest now in hybrid discrete variable, continuous variable architectures. The um, original version of circuit QED that we developed focused on discrete putting the information in discrete variable uh, quantum systems, namely uh, transmont qubits and uh, communicating, having them communicate with each other through quant the quantum bus, uh, passive bosonic resonators, microwave resonators, through which they could exchange virtual microwave photons. That we'll call this the DV dominant, uh, discrete variable dominant, uh, version of the architecture, but more recently we've been exploring um, a CV dominant architecture in which the quantum information is stored in superpositions of different numbers of microwave photons stored in these resonators. And the transmons take on a secondary role as controllers that allow us to create and uh, modify these uh, photon states in the resonators. So it's a kind of dual picture in which what was the, the passive communication bus now becomes the primary information carrier and what was the information carrier, the qubit, now becomes a secondary controller. The uh, benefits of using bosonic codes to uh, uh, carry the quantum information are that you can have uh, error correctable code words of standing uh, photons trapped in resonators, and you can outcouple them and tr uh, immediately transmit them with uh, down. Uh, coaxial cables uh, to another module uh, which captures them. Uh, and if there are errors along the way, uh, you can correct those uh, uh, because you've already encoded the information in a quantum error correction code. Another possibility which we're exploring in my center is transduction of those microwave quantum states to telecom wavelengths for transmission over longer distances. So there are a number of recent uh, sort of theory or review papers about how to control uh, bosonic modes of superconducting circuits using uh, qubit and scillas. And the ability to have universal control to carry out, to be able to create or modify any state and measure it in a complete way. Both of those abilities are required if you're going to create logical qubits and uh, correct errors. 
so the Hamiltonian of the system, which consists of a single mode of a cavity, electromagnetic mode, that's the harmonic oscillator here. Um, uh, a dagger creates a photon. The ancilla qubit uh, we approximate as a two-level system. We assume that it's a, its resonance frequency is different than that of the cavity. They're far detuned. And in that so-called dispersive coupling limit, the effective Hamiltonian uh, from the dipole coupling of the charge oscillations and the transmon and the electric field in the cavity uh, looks like this with a dispersive coupling strength chi that can be hundreds or thousands of uh, times stronger than the damping of either of the modes. In addition, there's a, um, a uh, drive, which you can put on the qubit to change its state, or a drive you can put on the cavity. I see there's some peculiar font problem on this computer I'm using. Uh, and as a result of this strong coupling, which uh, in the quantum optics world is uh, four-wave mixing, uh, you can do displacements of the cavity of the oscillator conditioned on the state of the qubit, and you can rotate the qubit in a way which depends on the number of photons in the cavity. And this combination, all powered by this dispersive coupling, provably gives you universal control of the combined state of the discrete variable and the continuous variable system. So here is uh, one example of this uh, uh, universal control preparation of a photon flux state with exactly six photons in it, something that you cannot do by applying a classical drive to a harmonic oscillator. We apply uh, one pulse sequence to the transmon controller and one pulse sequence to directly to the cavity. These are computed theoretically ahead of time from the Hamiltonian. And uh, with very small adjustments uh, thereafter in the experiment, you find that you can take the system from the zero photon state to the six photon state uh, in about 500 nanoseconds. And this state has definite number six and completely indefinite phase. So you can do state tomography on that with this so-called Wigner function. It's a kind of quasi probability distribution in the harmonic oscillator where this is the coordinate, the electric field, and this is the momentum, the magnetic field. And you see the circular symmetry here from the fact that the phase of the oscillation is completely uncertain when the number is certain. And the key enabling resource for measuring this Wigner function, which is equivalent to the density matrix, and therefore gives you complete information, is the ability to measure the photon number parity, whether the photon number is even or odd, without finding out what the photon number is. And these universal control and measurement techniques that we have allow that. So with this control, we want to now see if we can create quantum error correctable code words and do the error correction. So first, let me briefly review error, quantum error correction in qubit systems and discrete variable systems. And it's extremely hard. The way you do it is you uh, take many physical qubits, let's say nine qubits for the short code, and you entangle them in uh, special states that hold the logical qubit information, one qubit's worth of information, but it's spread out in a non-local way uh, and hidden from the environment by spreading it out over all these qubits. Then you need a control circuit, a kind of Maxwell demon, which can 
uh, identify which of the three types of errors, you know, bit flip or phase flip or both that can happen on a qubit and which of the nine qubits has the error. So there you have 27 possible single qubit errors. So the, it's very complicated. No one has actually succeeded in doing this with discrete variable uh, systems, uh, made worse by the fact that the circuit that does all of this makes mistakes itself. So we believe there's a better way to do this, and that is by storing the information not in material objects, superconducting qubits, but as microwave photon states stored in high Q superconducting resonators. And uh, so here are a few references, the cat code, which was the first to break even, meaning when you have n physical qubits to make one logical qubit, you have an error rate which is n times larger than if you had just used one physical qubit. So you've taken a giant step backwards. And then your error correction code has to, if it, uh, it you applies error correction and extends the lifetime by a factor of n, you'll be just exactly back where you started at the lifetime of a, a single physical qubit. That's called reaching break even. And uh, the analog of that has finally been achieved, but only in bosonic codes, the cat code, and some other codes which have come close to uh, break even. Uh, and here are a few references. I'll talk about some of this work. So, uh, single mode resonators, just harmonic oscillators, they're just empty boxes, vacuum surrounded by superconducting walls, essentially no moving parts. They have a very large Hilbert space and they can replace multiple physical qubits uh, using this larger Hilbert space. So that turns out to be a great hardware efficiency. And it also reduces the number of different physical locations in which errors can occur, which makes them easier to identify. So uh, in order to represent, we have an infinite, formally infinite Hilbert space, in order to represent a logical qubit, we need a two code words, a logical zero and a logical one, which are uh, some uh, linear superposition of these states that are orthogonal to each other. And that will act as our logical qubit. The simplest possible code you could use would be zero logical would just be zero photons in the oscillator and one logical would just be one photon in the oscillator. This has the smallest possible number of photons and therefore the longest natural lifetime of any encoding. But a superposition of zero and one if the uh, oscillator, uh, no matter how high its Q is, it still has weak damping. And that rate of loss of photons is proportional to how many photons you have. So that's why we want to keep it small. Uh, but if you do lose a photon, then the state, the system figures out it was in state one because it was able to decay and emit a photon. And it ends up in state zero and you lose all information about the coefficients alpha and beta that carry the quantum information. So this is not error correctable. Um, so this is nice. Uh, if we, we can't use that, that's the target we have to beat sort of. Uh, but we'll use more complicated code words, for example, superpositions of zero and two and four photons. Um, and uh, there's a single uh, simple error, which is a weakly damped oscillator uh, slowly loses photons. 
So there's only one thing you need to measure rather than 27 things. And uh, we choose, for example, code words like this that have definite photon number parity. So the, the both code words are plus one eigenstates of what's called the stabilizer, which is the photon parity, photon number parity. And if you lose a photon, if you apply the oscillator lowering operator, uh, it changes the parity, it anti commutes with the parity. And it turns out that measuring the parity uh, is relatively easy to do uh, with high fidelity in circuit QED, quite difficult in ordinary quantum optics. And it can be measured in a way which is 99.8% quantum non demolition, as illustrated in this paper here. So, um, this is the simplest error correctable code. It has an average of two photons in it. It's more than the zero one encoding, but it's so it has errors at a faster rate, but it's um, error correctable. If I lose a photon from this logical state, well, I can't lose any from zero, but if I lose one from four, I go to state three with a, uh, an amplitude square root of four and divided by that square root of two gives me square root of two. If I'm in this state and I lose a photon, I go to photon number one with a amplitude root two. And the fact that these amplitudes are the same is very important for the working of the error correction code. So, Using the universal control that we have developed, you can then, if you detect a parity jump from even to odd, you can apply a unitary transformation which maps the three photon state back to an equal superposition of zero plus four, which is where it came from, and it maps the one photon state back to two, which is where that error state came from thereby uh, correcting the error and uh, uh, you're ready to let, let the system extend its lifetime and go longer. There's another subtlety that if after some time the photon number parity has not changed, this is called the no jump evolution and it you have to update your knowledge of the state of the system by saying it's slightly less probable than we thought that there are four photons here and slightly more probable that there are zero. And so even if there's no error detected, there is a small error, but it is correctable with a different unitary. Um, so breaky, so here's where these codes, this is just one of many different possible binomial codes and um, break even for such codes is defined if by the following, if your error correction circuit is fast enough and accurate enough to keep correcting the errors, in such a way that even though the code words have on average two photons and therefore have errors faster than a linear combination of zero and one photons, if the error correction can get the state to live longer than this longest naturally lived encoding, then you have uh, exceeded the break even point. That's the analogy of what I described before to the uh, best the logical qubit exceeds the lifetime of the best physical qubit that it contains. Uh, so this particular code was tested by uh, Lu Yan Sun and Qinghua and came very, very close to the break-even point, 92%. So a head-to-head -head comparison I like to do uh, between a discrete variable <clears throat> logical qubit and a, and a uh, bosonic logical qubit is the following. Let's 
uh, <clears throat> we know that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the <clears throat> harmonic oscillator has amplitude damping. You can consider a model for qubits that only has amplitude damping, no bit flips, no phase flips, just decay from the excited state to the ground state. So it's the same analogous error model. It turns out it takes only four qubits to correct this to lowest order. And so that's a good comparison. And so here are the logical code words for the qubit case, 1100 plus 0011, et cetera. And notice there are two qubits in the excited state here, and there are two photons here. Notice here there's a superposition of zero excitations and four excitations in the qubits. And here in the bosonic code, zero and four uh, photon. So it's very analogous uh, code structure. But here there are, you need many uh, stabilizers. You need to me measure several high weight operators, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, and product of all the X's, in order to locate which of the four qubits decayed from one to zero. So that's hard. Uh, over here, you just have to measure the photon number parity and see if it jumped from 0 to 1. And both codes can correct a single uh, decay error, damping error like that. Um, okay, I will skip over these uh, algebraic details, but uh, in both cases, the rate of decay is proportional to the number of excitations in the system. So <clears throat> the uh, comparison of the four qubit code to the bosonic, uh, what we call the kitten code or binomial code uh, is um, here. And uh, here you have to measure three stabilizers that are fairly difficult to measure. Here you only have to measure one. And uh, the reason is that the four qubit code has four different physical locations where the error can occur. And so this additional complication is why to date <clears throat> only bosonic codes have succeeded in reaching breakeven. Um, the, excuse me, the, um, previous to this, uh, binomial code, a cat code was developed, and this was actually the first system to reach the break-even point. You use a superposition of, uh, coherent states with the oscillator coherently oscillating with this phase or that phase or this phase or that phase. And uh, because of the plus sign in these superpositions, the oscillator is in two positions at once or two momenta at once. And with a plus sign, that means that it's the states are made only of even numbers of photons. So we can use this photon number parity uh, to uh, uh, locate and correct the errors. Actually, in this code, you only need to record the errors. You can kind of correct them at the end. You don't have to correct them on the fly. And the Maxwell Demon was a set of very high speed FPGA electronics, sending signals back and forth and making decisions about what to do after with the measurement results. And uh, this code, uh, Luigi already showed this data, uh, broke exceeded the break even by about 10% and nearly by a factor of two if you allowed for heralding of cases, about 20% of the cases where there was a heralded error. Okay, so uh, another bosonic code that's of great interest right now uh, is the GKP, Gattesman Kataev Preskold code, uh, invented in 2001. This is the 20th anniversary. And at the time it was developed, people were sure that it was, you know, 
invented by theorists. There's no way any experimentalist could ever uh, make such a thing. It's a kind of Schrodinger cat living in 35 places at once in phase space on this grid of points. But in the last couple of years, uh, Jonathan Holmes group has achieved uh, first state preparation, but not error correction in a trapped ion system where the mechanical oscillation of the ions was the boson. And then uh, Michelle Devere's group at Yale achieved both state preparation and quantum error correction for all errors near the break even point in uh, circuit QED. And that at the uh, very recently, the Jonathan Home Group has uh, simul uh, independently of our theoretical work discovered an autonomous error correction protocol, an improved version of the protocol, and done an experiment, uh, again, approaching break-even. So you'll hear more about this, uh, uh, these protocols for creating and stabilizing this, these states in the very last talk of the conference from uh, Shraddha Singh. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction background on how to think about continuous variable states uh, in phase space, where you have both position and momentum, and you deal with the fact that the, uh, those two coordinates don't actually commute. So I'll just remind you a little bit about how to think about states in phase space. If I have a harmonic oscillator as a function of its coordinate, the wave function is a Gaussian. And the coordinate for our electromagnetic oscillators is the electric field in the center of the cavity, as I mentioned. You can also have the momentum representation of this wave function. It's just the Fourier transform of psi of q which uh, also happens to be a uh, Gaussian. And if you, uh, so you're uncertain in both position and uh, momentum, but that's just a reflection of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, that, that's caused by the fact that position and momentum do not commute and the product of the uncertainties has to exceed one half in some units. Um, and so, the state is represented in phase space, not by a point as in classical mechanics, but as a kind of Gaussian blob representing the uncertainty. And the area in phase space taken up by a state is Planck's constant, which in our units is two pi because H bar is one. Now, Suppose I made a squeezed state. I somehow uh, measured the position of the oscillator with very little uncertainty. So the, the wave packet uh, is not the ground state wave function, but some squeezed version that has smaller variance. Of course, the Fourier transform of that will be broader, will have a greater variance in momentum. And so the phase space representation of this state, instead of being a circle, will be an ellipse in which you squeeze this axis and you anti-squeeze, it kind of pops out in the other direction. Consistent with the fact that phase space seems to be kind of incompressible, that the, this still has an area of two pi, the same area as this, it still holds one state. Uh, and whenever you try to reduce the size in one direction to keep the area the same, it has to grow bigger in another direction. So, uh, Gottesman, Katayev, and Presko in this um, uh, paper proposed encoding a logical qubit in oscillator grid states, states that lived on a lattice of points in phase space. And these lattice of points are uh, smaller in size than, uh, than this blob. They seem to be squeezed in both directions at once, in both position and momentum. 
How can that possibly be? Well, it turns out that you can kind of beat the uncertainty principle in a special circumstance where you are in a lattice with a certain special lattice constant. And uh, each blob can be squeezed in both directions as long as you're uncertain which blob you're in. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, some more now. It's a little <laughs> counterintuitive. So because uh, position uh, and momentum do not commute, it turns out that translations of a state around a system around and phase space do not commute because translations in momentum are generated by Q and translations in Q are generated by P and they don't commute. So translations in um, uh, position like this are, are exponentials of the momentum and, and momentum boosts are exponentials of the position. Like if this were a plane wave and you multiplied it by e to the i some number times the coordinate like e to the i k x, of course that increases the momentum. So if you work out how these translations, finite translations uh, commute, you find that if you go this way around versus that way around, the difference is a, is a phase proportional to the area. Another way to say it is if you go around a closed loop, you pick up a berry phase proportional to the area in phase space that you've traversed. And that phase, if, if you go around an area that contains one quantum state, <clears throat> that is, has area two pi, then this phase factor is a multi, e to the i multiple of two pi, and these translations commute. So by choosing out of this infinite Hilbert space, a, a, um, a uh, constraint that you live on a discrete lattice, you can end up with a finite number of states to represent a like so two states, for example, to represent a qubit. So if I have a lattice that has area four pi, it contains in each unit cell two states, and all the unit cells are equivalent. They're just sort of periodic extensions. So this system of uh, grid has two logical states hidden inside of it. And the way we pick out out of this infinite set of states uh, a finite subset is to require that the states be stabilized, that is that they be plus one eigenstates of these translation operators in position and translation in momentum. And because this area is four pi, these translations commute with each other. You're commuting, uh, translating by distances of two root pi, so the area is four pi. Now, what's really amazing is that all of the Pauli operators, the logical Pauli operators for these two uh, logical states are simply translations. So first, um, uh, X is the X Pauli operator is just translation and position by half the distance of the stabilizer. Same thing for Z. So we know that the Pauli operator X squared is the identity, right? You flip a bit twice, you get back to the same state. Here, X squared translating twice, well, that's just a stabilizer, and our states are plus one eigenstates of that. So within this logical space, this translation acts just like <clears throat> the X operator. This translation by half a lattice constant acts just like uh, the Z operator. And then if the fact that this little area here, X, Z, X dagger, Z dagger, 
uh, contains area pi means that z and x anti-commute just like the um, Pauli operators do. And this translation represents y. So x and then z, or z and then x, gives you uh, i times y, where that i comes from the fact that this area <clears throat> is pi over 2. So amazingly, you can you get out of a simple, you define this lattice and you get a set of translations which form a representation of the Pauli um, operators for a single qubit, which has two states and that lives inside this area of four pi. So you can uh, create these uh, error correctable words. And the way experimentally you explore this space space and create uh, interesting lattice states is by using a special unitary called a controlled displacement gate. And it says if the ancilla is in zero, you displace the cavity by plus alpha, where it's, if alpha is real, it's a displacement in position. If alpha is imaginary, it's a displacement in momentum. And if the ancilla is in one, you do the opposite displacement by minus alpha. And it turns out that this is very, very simple to create using the dispersed, same dispersive Hamiltonian for which we're using to do everything. And to convince you that translations in phase space do not commute, we're going to measure their phase kickback on an ancilla using these not simple displacements, but conditional displacements. So we're going to have a circuit with a qubit in zero, apply a Hadamard, so now we have a superposition of zero and one. And the part of the wave function where this is one, we're going to do uh, these uh, conditional displacements a certain way. And when part zero, we're going to do the opposite displacements. So we start here in phase space. The one part of the wave function, where the one with the ancillas one displaces to the right, the zero goes to the left. Then we do an unconditional displacement where they both go up. Then a conditional displacement where they come back together. Then an unconditional displacement and the system ends up back at the origin. But the part that had the qubit in the one state went around anti-clockwise. And the part that had the qubit in the zero state went around the same area, but clockwise. So they pick up opposite phases, which are kicked back uh, to the uh, ancilla and rotate the ancilla. So this is a direct manifestation of the uh, fact that tra um, translations of phase space don't commute. And that rotation of the ancilla produced is just directly gives you the berry phase or the, uh, the, the phase acquired by going around this area. And by making the translations larger and larger in amplitude, you can see these beautiful uh, Ramsey fringes as the phase kicked back to the ancilla varies by greater and greater amounts as the area increases. And this is a fantastic way, this is from the Devere group, a fantastic way to calibrate the size of your displacements because you can directly see what uh, amplitude, what displacement will produce uh, a phase of 2 pi. This is a, so this type of experiment is the first thing you need to do to be able to uh, test your system and create these grid states. <clears throat> so the grid states, if you think of them as wave functions, they're just little uh, almost delta functions on a, on a lattice with a lattice constant two root pi. That's the zero logical. The one logical is just displaced half a lattice constant because remember, 
uh, the X operation flips you from one logical state to the other, and X was just translation by half a lattice constant. The nice thing about these states is that the the stabilizers, the translation by a lattice constant, uh, is sensitive to small displacement errors. Unlike ordinary qubit stabilizers, which typically have eigenvalues plus one and minus one, we have a whole uh, continuous family of eigenvalues that live on the unit circle in the complex plane, e to the i theta. And Shraddha Singh will tell you how you can use measurements of things like sign of the position or sign of the momentum to detect whether the lattice has shifted due to an error and then uh, feed, apply a feedback signal to correct that and stabilize this uh, manifold, this logical manifold against errors. So that'll be the subject of her talk, but I thought it'd be useful just to give you some background. Um, yeah, so that'll be the, in the last talk of the conference. So, uh, to summarize, uh, again, quantum error correction is vastly more efficient if you store the information in bosons, in microwave photons and high-Q cavities. It's the only <clears throat> technique and, uh, to uh, have exceeded break-even and, and, uh, or come close to break-even with a couple of different, several different uh, recent experiments. I didn't have time to talk to you about doing quantum simulations of physical models like quantum field theories uh, containing bosons, but this is also uh, vastly more efficient. You can rep people understand that it's hard to represent fermions with qubits, but they don't, it's not as widely appreciated that it's hard to represent bosons with qubits. Uh, because there can be many bosons in one mode. And uh, simple things like the boson creation or annihilation operators, which are naturally available if you have a harmonic oscillator, correspond to very complicated multi-qubit gates if you represent the states by qubits. And we used this simplicity recently to do a quantum simulation of the molecular vibrational spectra of triatomic molecules like water and ozone with, uh, with very high fidelity. We were able to sample from the, the so-called Frank Condon factors the, uh, from these 256 spectral lines predict their intensities with rather good uh, precision, you know, sort of 85 to 95 percent, uh, just the intensities of these lines, with a very small quantum circuit that represented the vibrational modes of the molecule by photons in a microwave cavity. Uh, so we had three transmons and two cavities, very small system. And the calculation, if you had tried to do this on what I could call a conventional quantum computer based on qubits, uh, it would have required many tens of qubits and thousands of very high weight operations, complex operations, which cannot be done uh, with today's hardware. So this is uh, uh, another big area that we're interested in doing, extending this to simulations of quantum many body systems and so forth. Okay, so uh, yeah, these uh, uh, molecular vibration simulations were done uh, in the Shulkoff lab, as was some of the error correction experiments. And the uh, GKP work uh, is done in the lab of uh, Michel Deveray, who uh, you heard speak at the beginning of the conference. Uh, so I will stop there and happily take questions. Thank you for listening.
Yeah, thanks, Professor Gervin, for this uh, talk on quantum error corrections. And it's really fantastic to see that some of these protocols have been actually experimentally implemented, and some of the implications of what you have uh, what you have said. So I would open this session up to uh, for for questions. Uh, please, if you have a question, if you can raise your hand. I see uh, Praveen has his hand, uh, hand raised. So, Praveen, do you have a question? Uh, no, 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 I think it is the previous one. Sorry. Ah, okay. Uh, so, questions, please. Question uh, already. Um, Sudhir. Now I. Yeah, yeah. I, no, yeah, please, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah. Uh, I. I don't know if uh, this makes sense, but uh, when we want to code using continuous variables and oscillator modes, uh, would it be of any advantage to use um, Hamiltonians which are PT symmetric? It's, which are like, uh, for example, harmonic oscillator with I, K, X type of terms where the spectrum becomes real and remains real and, and has some special properties around exceptional points. Uh, would, would, would you care to comment about this? Yes. So there's a great deal of interest in PT symmetry and exceptional points. Typically, those are realized by having equal amounts of gain and loss in a, in a system and, or uh, taking the average of the two losses and ignoring the, <laughs> the fact that it, it doesn't, there isn't any gain. Um, so there have, you know, people have done experiments in circuit QED, Cater Merch, for example, um, my colleague Jack Harris has done this in optical mechanics. Um, I don't, you know, be, because the exceptional point involves both loss, which causes noise, and gain, which actually adds noise. Um, there, you can control, there are interesting topological ways to control them. If you move the controls a certain way, it, it transfers energy from one mode to another, for example. Uh, but I, I'm not aware of any advantage for quantum error correction. It's fascinating physics and interesting for control uh, in, in uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of a a way to harness it for quantum error correction. It is what of is interest for sensing, however. Ah, yes. This is one, one more short question if I can ask. So, please, uh, please go ahead. you talked about coding using bosons. Uh, are there any, any uh, attempts or uh, does it make any uh, sense to uh, do coding using anions. Oh, sure. Uh, so, you know, there's an enormous theoretical effort and experimental efforts um, using, uh, for example, uh, Laughlin quasi particles, or attempting to use Laughlin quasi particles or Majorana fermions. Um, uh, to make topological quantum memories in which the logical operations are executed by braiding, uh, braiding uh, anions. Um, but that's very, very hard. Uh, no one has succeeded in doing that yet. And there may even have been some steps backwards recently. Um, but it's fascinating physics and, you know, the energy scales are very tiny. I mean, sort of one millikelvin. And there are lots of things that can go wrong, quasi-particle poisoning and par the analog of parity jumps. And so um, 
people are still trying, but they're not, they're st they still haven't made one qubit yet. So it's, uh, you know, but if it, if it does succeed, it could be extremely interesting. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so that's great. Uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, I don't, um, yeah, Sai, please go ahead if you have a question. Hi, uh, yeah, hi, uh, hi, Steve. Thank you for the very nice talk. So I was just wondering, um, so in the uh, VQA um, literature, this whole encoding fermions onto qubits is, uh, you know, it's it's a bit of a kind of difficult task, right? I mean, because you have to, uh, you have to pay attention basically to uh, uh, to two pieces of information, basically, um, and uh, and so the different encodings that are there, you know, try and track this problem, so on and so forth. So can you just speak a little bit to uh, basically the advantages that you have by uh, uh, when you were trying to simulate this uh, using um, harmonic oscillators? Because that sounds very interesting. Uh, yeah. So, so the uh, uh, qubit is basically a spin and a half. It has two states, and you know a fermion in a mode has occupancy either zero or one. So that's very nice. It's a very nice mapping. The problem is the minus signs, right? When uh, <laughs> a fer fermion operators don't commute. So then you have to have some kind of fancy uh register of extra qubits to keep track of all those minus signs that's the hard part um for bosons uh there aren't any minus signs so it sounds much easier but if there are eight bosons in a up to eight bosons in a mode then you would need three qubits you only need log n uh, qubits to represent up to n occupancy n. So that doesn't seem too bad. But when you look at simple operations, like I'm going to destroy a photon, a boson, uh, it turns uh -huh. out you could be flipping all of the qubits at the same time in the representation, or half of them, or it depends on which state you're in. So it's a very complicated uh, representation of a very simple operator like A or A dagger. And that turns out to be the part that's hard, not the minus signs. I see. So there is actually a conservation of hardness here. Yes, but <laughs> if you but if you have actual harmonic oscillators in your hardware, then you have direct access to A and A dagger. Sure. You know, just apply sure. drive. There they are. So, so it's hugely advantageous. Now, you know, our first experiment approximated the vibrations of the molecule as purely harmonic, just to make this our lives easier. Uh, and so the problem, we didn't do a problem that was difficult classically. Uh, and But for future generations of experiments, we'd like to synthesize um, using our qubit ancillas and harmonic Hamiltonians for the oscillators. And, and that's certainly perfectly possible. It's just more challenging than than what we did in the first experiment. Sure. Thank you very much. Sure. Oh. I, what, what I'd love to do, and I'm, I'm we're working on a paper now, is an array of uh, resonators containing bosons, and when they hop, they pick up phases as if they were charged particles in a magnetic field, and do the bosonic fractional quantum Hall effect. But and you know. We've demonstrated all of the individual pieces of the technology experimentally that you would need to do that. But, you know, assembling a large lattice and doing all of those things simultaneously, we, we have not done yet. And it, it's still challenging, but it's not well beyond what we can do. So I'm hoping that this paper will encourage the experimentalists to try it. Okay. So maybe time for one last one question. Last question. Uh, uh, so we have, so we have Sanjay Malhotra, Sanjay Malhotra, Sanjay Malhotra. Sanjay Malhotra.
uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, very nice talk, Professor Steven. Uh, Steven, this is uh, uh, regarding this incompressibility of face space that you showed. Um, how does uh, uh, this again um, Hamiltonian mechanics? How does it uh, manifest the Liouville's theorem manifest itself here? Again, that is uh, conservation of face space. Is, yeah. Yeah, this yeah, this is, is Liouville's theorem. theorem. Yes. Uh, so the transformations that you make to do squeezing are uh, symplectic transformations, just as the classical uh, Hamiltonian evolution is symplectic. It uh, preserve instead of preserving the um, Poisson brackets of position and momentum, it preserve they preserve the commutators. So you can you can take the coordinate and squeeze it by a factor of two and the momentum and expand it by a factor of two. And then the commutator has a one half times a two, it still comes out to be H bar. So it's, it's exactly Leoville's theorem. Okay, so I guess Sanjay, that answers yeah, that your question. Answers the question. Yeah. And uh, without, uh, without, I think, I think uh, um, we should uh, applaud Professor Stephen Gervin for this wonderful talk and, and for his insights. So thanks, Professor Gervin. And we can move now to the next speaker for this session. The last speaker uh, is Professor Apurva Pat Patel. So he's professor at the Center for High Energy Physics at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is notable for his work on quantum algorithms and the application of information theory concepts to understand the structure of genetic languages. He's also known for his work on quantum chromodynamics, uh, where he has used lattice gauge theory techniques to investigate spectral properties, phase, transform phase transitions, and matrix elements. He obtained his PhD in physics from Caltech and uh, he was fortunate to have Professor Richard Finman uh, on his PhD thesis evaluation committee. Uh, so with that, we'll be, uh, I invite Professor Patel to present his talk on two uses of density matrix, understanding quantum chaos and quantum machine learning kernels. Uh, Professor Patel, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to give this uh, talk. Uh, I will try to share my slides now. Okay, are my slides visible? Yes. Okay, let me make it full screen also. Fine. Um, so I'm going to talk about some very simple things. Uh, these are ideas which have been around for a long time, and uh, I'm just going to put them in a new language or maybe just a new set of words, and hopefully it will provide some new insights which can be useful in uh, development of this uh, quantum technology. So the focus of uh, my presentation is the density matrix. It has been around since the beginning of quantum theory, but we still haven't understood the capability or uses of density matrix in great detail, new ideas still keep on coming up. And the reason behind this is uh, peculiarities of quantum correlations. And if you understand the density matrix better in more general terms, it really helps to understand the nature of quantum correlations and what we can do with them. So I'm going to address uh, two specific uh, topics. One is uh, quantum chaos, and another is quantum machine learning using the framework of the density matrix. 
So let me begin with quantum chaos. It's a feature which has been around and useful in understanding lots of phenomena, especially in open quantum systems. Some names which are present in all these discussions are irreversibility, approach to equilibrium, ergodic behavior, diffusion, randomness, so on. Even questions of uh, quantum information and black holes will go to understanding what is really happening in terms of chaotic behavior in there as well. And loosely speaking, we look at two features. One of them is that chaos makes future unpredictable and looking at it in the reverse direction. Uh, we cannot keep track of everything which is uh, in the past when the system is chaotic. We lose memory. This phenomena of quantum chaos has been studied for a long time and there are many known features, but these are all in some sense consequences or observables of uh, the chaotic behavior. I have listed some of them. One of them is the spectral properties of the systems. They show universal statistical behavior, which is described using various types of random matrix theory, which essentially is based on the fact that the elements of the evolution Hamiltonian are random. And uh, one of the very easy to observe consequences that when you have a regular behavior, the nearest neighbor distribution of energy levels is a Poisson distributed, but when you go to chaotic behavior, this distribution changes to the Wigner distribution. And this is easily seen in many experimental tests of quantum chaos. Another well-known feature is that you can perform recurrence analysis of a periodic or closed orbits, and from that uh, infer the density of states corresponding to the Hamiltonian. And this is the formulation using the Goodswiller trace formula. It has also been noticed that if you look at a particular type of quantum correlation known as quantum discord, then you will see the transition from regular to chaotic behavior as a particular signature in the variation of this quantum discord. And so quantum discord can be looked upon as an indicator or an order parameter of something happening when the system crosses over from regular to chaotic behavior. So those are the kind of consequences. But if you try to formulate a definition of chaos, we run into certain problems. And uh, to illustrate that, I will just give a standard definition of classical chaos first. And that is, you start with two trajectories which are very close by at the initial stage and then evolve them and they rapidly diverge. So this is a signature which says that in a chaotic system, you cannot make long time predictions reliably. And the typical example quoted is the weather. 
slight disturbance over some parameters in one place can lead to large changes somewhere else. And uh, given the fact that initial data will always have limited precision, you lose all predictability if you evolve for a long enough time. And the rate of divergence which happens in the system is uh, labeled by the so-called Lyapunov exponents. Typically, the separation uh, changes exponentially as a function of evolution time. Now, this definition doesn't carry over nicely to the quantum situation, and that is the problem. The reason being that in a quantum system, you want to define how close two states are. Typically, you will use a measure like the overlap of two states, which is equivalent to measuring the geodesic separation of the two states on the unitary sphere. The overlap is of some parameterization of the angle between the two states. And uh, you ask the question, now what is going to overlap? happen to this overlap when you evolve the system for a certain time. And you realize that the evolution unitary uh, imposes a constraint that if psi changes to u times psi, then psi prime will also change to u times psi prime. And the overlap, which is a inner product of psi prime and psi, does not change as a function of time. The u dagger and u just cancel out. So this single-minded measure of how close two trajectories are doesn't work. It uh, cannot be used to identify divergent evolution trajectories. So what should be done? And can we find some other interpretation? And the answer is that yes, another interpretation is possible. And that is uh, just a change of viewpoint. I don't look at the quantum state as a unit ray in the Hilbert space, just a vector pointing from the origin to the point on the unitary sphere, but look at the quantum state as the phase space distribution analog of classical system. This viewpoint actually does solve the problem of how to define chaos in the language very similar to classical physics. Because in the classical physics, in the phase space, there is an analogous theorem that the density of states um, remains invariant under canonical evolution. This is a well-known uh, Lewis theorem. So the fact that the overlap remains invariant in classical, uh, sorry, in quantum physics is going to be looked upon as uh, the density of states remaining invariant in uh, classical physics. So what does this change of uh, language offer? And uh, to do that, there is a important property of density matrix turns out to be useful. Density matrix, by the way, is a complete specification of the quantum state. It's a Hermitian and positive semi-definite by construction and uh, trace is one. And what it is, is really a generalization of the concept of probability distribution in classical physics to uh, corresponding distribution in quantum physics. The diagonal part of the density matrix is indeed probability distribution, but it has off-diagonal components, which are in general complex. And these off-diagonal components carry all the peculiarities of quantum correlations. And if you understand the role of these off-diagonal elements, we understand all the mysteries of various kinds of quantum paradoxes. Now, the structure of this matrix is such that, that 
for any quantum system, the density matrix always specifies a symplectic manifold. And this is a really important property because it imposes constraints on the dynamics. And on the other hand, the symplectic structure makes connection with the classical phase space also very obvious. And this is the viewpoint in which I'm going to now look at quantum chaos. Um, the symplectic structure is uh, very easily written down for simple system for just a one dimensional uh, motion of a particle. The structure is the dx wage dp. And if you want to look at a qubit, the symplectic structure is just d cos, d cosine theta wedge of d phi on the blocks here. So what does the symplectic structure buy us? And to do that, let us look at now again the contribution of what happens um, to the evolution trajectory. I have written psi prime as a sum operator v of t times psi, and v of t starts out being a infinitesimal transformation and uh, it changes according to this equation v of t is equal to e raised to minus i h t v of zero e raised to i h t and this can be written as a differential equation as well so if you write v as exponential of o then d by dt of o t is just minus i times commutator of h times o this evolution of this perturbation actually has the same form as the evolution of the density matrix in the Schrodinger picture. And this is a very important uh, connection which allows you to take all the properties of density matrix and convert it into what happens to perturbations. And for a pure state in n-dimensional Hilbert space, you can write down various uh, types of perturbation which you can introduce. The density matrix has 2n minus 2 real parameters. And uh, they describe uh, various directions of perturbations for any your state. On the other hand, the maximum number of simultaneously measurable parameters is n minus one. The minus one is the result of the fact that the trace of density matrix is equal to one, and the other n minus one are the diagonal components, uh, which can be specified by the generators of the commuting Cartan algebra of SUN. And they can be measured in any experiment. Now the fact that this structure is a symplectic structure is buried in these numbers that the major parameters n minus one are exactly half of the 2n minus 2 parameters which are available. You measure one set and the other set uh, you lose all the information uh, about and uh, you can trade off what you want to measure and what you want to lose. So now the quantum chaos can be described as an interplay between the measurement basis the information which you extract and the complete evolution Hamiltonian. The intrinsic uh, metric of the density matrix is completely sufficient to describe this interplay and uh, 
the fact that you sometimes lose information is buried in the fact that the measurement operators may or may not commute with the Hamiltonian. When they don't commute, you lose some information, and that is really the condition of interest if you are want to look at a chaotic system, if you are going to measure in the diagonal basis of the Hamiltonian, you will always get the eigenvalues and there is not going to be any chaos at all. Incidentally, all this uh, structure has also been described in quite a detail using the Wigner function language, which is again, density matrix only, but one of the index Fourier transform, just a different basis. So the off-diagonal elements in the measurement basis, what they provide are transitions. And if the Hamiltonian has these off-diagonal elements, then those elements will become the raising and lowering operators. They are the conjugate variables to the diagonalized one. They are the generators of uh, translation among the diagonalized elements in the language of phase space language, phase space structure. And uh, this is the fundamental uh, feature of density matrix. One can also use many other uh, facts which are well known in case of density matrix when you express the structure in the coherent state basis. The coherent state basis is actually useful if you want to connect quantum dynamics to classically measured states because coherent states smoothly interpolate from the quantum region to the classical region in terms of the amplitude strength. So now one can look at really the separation of trajectories in this uh, density matrix evolution, you can choose some off-diagonal generator and work out the linear response analysis as a function of evolution time and see what happens. And uh, nothing unexpected there. You indeed find that there are exponentially diverging trajectories that can appear and you can pick the Lapuno exponents. The overall constraint of the phase space remains. That if one direction is expanding, the other direction orthogonal to it simultaneously shrinks. So the total evolution remains unitary and the density of states is preserved. The extra feature which appears, which is not there in classical physics, is that the quantum states are always going to be smeared over an area 2 pi h cross in quantum theory for every conjugate pair of directions. And this smearing wipes out any small scale uh, fluctuations, which may be there in the classical description of the trajectories, but which are not going to appear in the quantum theory. And if the chaotic behavior uh, has a contribution from these high frequency fluctuations, those things are going to get wiped out and uh, consequences of that are present in a uh, quantum theory unlike that in the classical physics. So now let me give a very simple example. There is a essentially a trivial algebra. And this is an example of a inverted harmonic oscillator. It's not really a chaotic system, but it has exponentially diverging trajectories resulting from the fact that the potential is local maximum and you roll down from it in opposite direction and diverge um, in the trajectories. This is not a 
random behavior, but it's a exactly solvable model. And the facts are very simple. The Hamiltonian, you just flip the sign of the x square term, and then it uh, becomes a squeezing operator. So that removes all the mystery about what is going to happen when you apply this uh, evaluation under the squeezing Hamiltonian, one direction is going to expand, the other one is going to shrink. The solutions are all hyperbolic functions as are well known, and you can associate the Lapino exponents with the rate of the exponential uh, divergence. You can write down the evaluation matrix in the two dimensional phase space. It is a off diagonal with entries of minus one and diagonal zero. And the determinant is one, which gives the phase space density invariant. And you can find identify the eigenvectors, which give the expanding and contracting directions. So this is all very straightforward, it's just uh, the purpose of illustration. And uh, one can ask whether these things really occur uh, in a physical situation, and the answer is yes. This inverted oscillator is actually a particular region of uh, any amplifier. And whenever you talk about quantum limited quadrilateral measurements in amplifier, you actually do take advantage of this kind of squeezing operations and you measure one thing with high precision. And we typically look at the direction in which we want high precision. And uh, the chaotic behavior is in the orthogonal direction, which is expanding exponentially. Okay, so this was a very simple example. I'm going to skip this uh, kicked rotor example, which is again well known, but I don't have extra thing to say. And I will go to a more uh, elaborate example, which is that of a kicked top. And uh, this is an system which actually can be used to interpolate smoothly between a classical region and a quantum region by varying the magnitude of the spin. So the smallest magnitude is uh, spin half, and you can represent the state on the sphere, actually the symmetric uh, combination of multiple spin half uh, states, which will generate any arbitrary value of spin. And uh, look at the behavior as S varies from one half all the way to infinity. Now, in this particular case, S equal to half has a very peculiar status. I mean, it is the common qubit, but it has many properties which are not present in a general quantum system. And one of them is that the generic Hamiltonian for a single qubit is just n dot sigma. There is nothing more you can write down because of the simple fact that all the poly matrices uh, either square to identity or multiplied, they give a third poly, poly matrices. So you try writing arbitrary function and they all collapse to the linear term. And uh, a well-known consequence of this fact is that this system does not exhibit chaos at all. Chaos requires higher order nonlinear terms in the Hamiltonian, which are not available in this particular case. But you can go to a larger value of the spin state. And again, a coherent state description is useful to pictureize this on a block sphere. So the spin S state with a large maximum projection is nothing but this half half spin raised to a power 2s. It's unique. And then you can ask uh, what is the evolution of this state under some particular type of 
Hamiltonian and see whether that behaves in any peculiar fashion under certain circumstances. The quantization of quantum mechanics is uh, buried inside this uh, unit sphere that there is a solid angle 4 pi of the block sphere. But for spin value s, that solid angle is covered by 2s plus 1 eigenstates. In the particular case of s equal to half, there are only two eigenstates, uh, two hemispheres, so to speak, and nothing uh, more than that. But you increase the value of spin and you make the discretization area smaller and smaller. And in this particular system, now you can write a tick top Hamiltonian, which can interpolate from the quantum region all the way to classical region as a function of the value of s. And uh, the simplest one is something which is called a kick uh, top Hamiltonian. It has only two operators. One of them is Sz square. It's a nonlinear term. And another is a Sx term, which appears only periodically as a function of time with a delta function uh, structure. It is called a kick top because at every interval of tau, there is a rotation specified by the value of beta about the x-axis. And uh, the quadratic term as z square represents actually a chaotic parameter which twists the spin direction around the z-axis between the two kicks. So one hemisphere rotates one way or the other one rotates the other way. And uh, because this is just a instantaneous kick, one can describe the complete evolution in terms of a Floquet map where the two operators just alternate. So this is a system which can be easily simulated and it has been studied in a great detail to figure out what is the requirement on the various parameters and how the chaos uh, arises. One can write down the evolution equations as I mentioned earlier, but they don't give you any nice uh, predictions. The predictions actually come when you go instead of from the spin basis to this coherent spin basis, which uh, characterizes uh, all these states in terms of a complex number z. And uh, it is just a representation of the block sphere on the tangent space in some particular uh, extrapolation. But the nice properties of this uh, coherent state um, description is that all the SU2 eigenstates become a monomial. So the state S with SZ uh, third component is just proportional to Z raised to S plus SZ. And one can do many things easily uh, in this language. A generic uh, spin S state can be written as a polynomial from whatever highest degree plus as z going to lowest degree minus as z. And there is also a related language of what are called Meyer and stars, which are nothing but zeros of these polynomials. And since the polynomial is finite, listing all the zeros completely gives the polynomial. And so the Meyer and star configuration describes the state very well. So the spin evolution now can be converted into evolution equation for the Hamiltonian. It's just a commutator in this new variables, and it can be worked out uh, explicitly. And I have given the result. There are two terms which appears. There is a term which is linear in Z, which appears with a coefficient 2s minus 1. This was the twisting operator. And then there is a term which is proportional to z square minus one and the periodic kick. And uh, this is the rotation operator, uh, which was there in the original Hamiltonian. So now what happens in this equation can be seen very easily. The term which is proportional to alpha 
it's just a linear equation dz by dt proportional to z and uh, it has a because of this i in front simple solution that it is just a rotation in this uh, space for z on the other hand the term which is proportional to beta is uh, nonlinear and it produces radial jumps for the value of z so there is one operator which is just a rotation in the complex plane other one which changes the radius and you mix up the two and you produce a chaotic uh, structure and which can be analyzed in a uh, great detail and uh, one can study the behavior as a function of this parameter on alpha beta i'm not going to show you any pictures but one feature which automatically appears over here is this coefficient 2s minus 1 which says there is no chaos uh, available for spin equal to half and uh, this now can be understood in terms of the smearing of the state which happens in quantum theory in this particular case the block sphere and for s equal to half the smearing is basically over a whole hemisphere area of 2 pi and that is so large that any zigzagging which may have occurred once you smear it it is wiped out and you don't see any chaos at all and uh, this is a well simple enough uh, interpretation but uh, it is fine there are many other peculiarities of a spin half system one of them is uh, interesting enough that uh, the total value of s square which is just uh, s times s plus one is three fourth for a spin half but the fact that all the polymetrices square to identity also implies that in this three fourth, Sx square is one fourth, Sy square is one fourth, and Sz square is one fourth. Completely isotropic. And nothing you can do, even putting in a magnetic field, is going to change that. And uh, only thing which changes is the sign. The magnitude of all these three components are identical. The sign gets parameterized in various ways and you can see that I can measure this sign and I cannot measure that sign at the same time, etc. But these are the properties which uh, makes a spin half state in some sense rather peculiar when dealing with chaos. So I will summarize this uh, part uh, quickly that the density matrix can indeed be looked upon as a phase space structure in which chaos does take place. It's uh, some analog of uh, squeezing. One direction expands, the other direction contracts. And if you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, then the smearing wipes out chaos. This is a phenomena in some sense analogous to what is known as Anderson localization. If you put uh, too much smearing, which basically cancels all the phases of interference and removes certain amplitudes, and uh, the states don't uh, evolve at all. And this is the kind of feature which is seen in case of a single qubit. So now let me go to a completely different topic, but I will come back to the picture of chaos, which appears in there and this is a subject of machine learning it is a kind of popular subject these days because you can do lots of unusual things with it even though you don't really have any proofs so the question is again how well we can understand it and i'm going to address one particular problem which is uh, called classification it is a basic ingredient of supervised learning. And uh, what it does is just separates the data using binary labels. So given some particular data, you train various parameters of the algorithm 
so that the property becomes obvious either it is absent or it is present and this is the binary classification system once you have a good algorithm which can tell these two things apart then you can use it to predict the class of a new unknown state so this is a scenario very much like a dictionary somebody who prepares a dictionary does a lot of work but we don't really worry about it all the parameters are nicely tuned in this particular process and then anybody else can use that dictionary to make uh, new predictions about something which is unknown and this can be used in a very wide situation provided you have a nicely tuned algorithm the question is how do you construct this nicely tuned algorithm and that is a process of machine learning so the methods which uh, have some amount of rigor is uh, based on quantities which are called kernels and so in some sense kernel are nothing but some measure of overlap between different uh, types of data points in terms of whatever labels you may have given and uh, since this kernels are used very highly and very heavily in processing large amount of data we want them to be really very simple and very easy to execute and the applications which are there in uh, computer science uh, algorithms these days they are mostly based on linear algebra where you can do very fast process and uh, linear algebra means that the kernel uh, or the classifier is basically just a separation line you have a sets of data with some values and uh, you draw a line everything on one side in one class everything on the other side is on the other class and when you are given a new point you just uh, uh, figure out on what side of the separation line that is and uh, that is given by this kind of a function which i have written y of x it is just a sign plus or minus 1 depending on which side of the line you are and there is an overlap with the normal which is uh, denoted by w and the state which is denoted by phi and there is an offset which physically specifies what is the location of the line so this is a very simple structure which is used in linear algebra to separate the lines uh, separate the data but it will work only if the data is um, separable by just drawing a particular line what happens when it is not and that is where the power of this kernel comes in that what is done is construction of a map which takes the original data from x to some complicated function phi of x this is a highly nonlinear map and the x is the original space and phi of x is called a feature space and the point of this kernel the design is such that even though the original data may be distributed in a very complicated manner in the feature space you want a structure which is separable by just drawing a line or if it is a multi dimensional space by drawing a hyperplane and so this uh, complicated map converts a non linear problem into a linear problem and once you have that then the whole machinery of linear algebra just follows through why is this possible and there is a great uh, theorem which is called a representation theorem connects x and phi x it says that under very general conditions this is always possible and then one can construct an optimal boundary um, which is a uh, connected to the label called a support vector and the uh, margin which uh, is the gap on either side of the boundary between the two classes and uh, 
this all quantities can be really derived in terms of various uh, specification and the nice result of the whole theorem is this vector w which acts as the boundary can be written as linear combination with real coefficient of all the mapped data nothing uh, more complicated than, than that and once you have reached this situation the linear algebra all works so here is a picture of what is the kind of thing that can be achieved with a nice map i have taken it from this particular uh, reference so here is a bunch of data blue points are in one class the orange ones are in the another class and they seem to be scattered all over the place if you generally draw some uh, curves uh, to separate them to it doesn't really work and this is a poor classification example but then you figure out by staring at the structure in a specific manner and you figure out that yeah there is a kind of separation which i can do so that all the blue ones are nicely aligned and all this uh, orange ones are also nicely aligned and i can draw all straight lines to um, separate them and actually this uh, data point is if you look at it more closely it's a checkerboard pattern the blue and the orange one kind of alternate and this is not the only way to draw the lines you can for example easily draw the diagonal which is a orthogonal to the lines over here but the point is that you want to go from this kind of structure where things look random to some other structure where things look nice and how do you do that and uh, this is another picture that if you are able to do that and it is not a, known as a kernel trick here is a separation which is actually a circular boundary but if you construct a, a nice map you can uh, put them on opposite side of a hyperplane and the kernel which uh, i introduced is now more explicitly defined it is nothing but the overlap of the states but in the feature space not in the original space and you want to make this function very clear and one property which is obvious by definition that such a overlap matrix is always going to be positive semi definite so this is the standard computer science language once you go to quantum theory then you will make this a uh, feature map based on a uh, some kind of unitary transformation and uh, you can also write down the corresponding density matrix uh, for that particular map now what happens uh, in this particular case how do you tune various things so in the linear regime you have to identify this uh, plane and uh, that plane is uniquely defined by the direction of its normal and that is optimized uh, so that the gap between these two uh, data sets on either side of the boundary is large that gap is called the margin and this is uh, done with standard techniques uh, in computer algorithms it is called quadratic programming and it is a very fast method what you should do once you have gone to a quantum map is you need an overlap of the same type and it is easily defined in terms of the overlap of the two density matrices that is a uh, what you measure as a distinguishable criterion it is also known as the hilbert schmidt inner product between two states and it can be used as a measure to discriminate the two states the state state come to zero when on top of each other then the k is one and you can go all the way to state becoming orthogonal where the value will come zero and how do you 
measure this kind of overlap in a quantum system and there is actually a very simple uh, circuit which uh, does the job and uh, that is illustrated here it is called a controlled swap test there is an ancilla bit on which uh, a hadamard gate is applied and uh, then there are the two states which are created by the feature map and you swap these uh, two states depending on the control in the ancilla and afterwards you again apply a hadamard gate on the ancilla to get it back to its original uh, state and then the measure the value of the ancilla and the probability of measuring zero or one uh, just gives you this uh, overlap between the two states. If you have probability one, there is a minus sign uh, inside here. Probability of zero is of course the same uh, relation with a plus sign. And from that, you can extract this overlap of our states. So this is something which can be done very easily. And it's important to note that it will also work with weak states. Uh, even if the initial states, this row and uh, row of x and row x prime are not cross states, it will still give you the overlap. And so it is quite suitable to work with in the so-called intermediate uh, noisy systems. There are not too many operations and uh, not too many uh, qubits involved if you want to perform this particular state and determine the Hilbert-Schmidt in our product. So now comes the question, how do you design this uh, map, which is a nice uh, feature uh, classifier. And what you need is a kind of structure which has enough variational parameters so that you can cover a variety of shapes in the original space. So the, you have no idea what the data distribution in the original space is, but you want the data distribution in the final space to be quite regular. And uh, the parameters are for you to choose. You can treat them as just a variational objects and do some trial and error about some grid of values and you find some values which are good, some are bad, and then you can fine tune it further by using some optimization uh, methods as it says as a gradient descent. Now, so what is happening is actually here, you want a flexibility which is opposite of what is happening in chaos of chaos. Chaotic behavior takes you from a initial distribution which is regular to final one which looks quite haphazard. Here you want a cover of all kind of haphazard distributions which you want to make regular. And this inversion is completely allowed in a quantum theory, everything is uh, reversible. So now you can ask the question about what kind of mapping will produce this kind of a versatile behavior in uh, covering the various kind of data structures with a few variational parameters. And there seems to be a very simple answer. If you have a bunch of uh, labels, you can make them binary labels. And here I can represent it by qubits. This set of labels uh, are going to sit in a register and I can treat them as just a quantum chain. And I want to manipulate this chain so that it can show both regular and chaotic behavior as a function of variational parameters. And there is a very simple uh, model, basically the Heisenberg spin chain. You have to make it aperiodic, that is important, which is not a uh, periodic, uh, coupling situation. And once you do that, by varying the various parameters, you can go over from all kind of uh, regular behavior 
to any arbitrary shaped uh, behavior of the feature map phi of x. And uh, one of the standard structure which is used is uh, illustrated as a quantum circuit here. The first step is a row of a uh, Hadamard gate, which creates equal superposition of all combination. Then the second step is uh, just encoding of the initial labels, uh, various values which I call X. And then there is a cyclic or repetitive process. It has two components here. One of them is a rotation about Y axis by some angles. And the other one is a nearest neighbor coupling along the Z component. And uh, all these uh, Z transformations actually com commute, so the order of this thing doesn't really matter. They are all diagonal operators. And what this dashed box represents is actually a trotter formula for what is known as transverse field uh, Ising, quantum Ising chain. This rotation about Y is a transverse field and uh, this Ising chain, the ZZ nearest neighbor coupling. And this is a well-studied problem in condensed matter physics where this uh, transition from regular to chaotic behavior as a function of these parameter values is well known. And this uh, structure seems to work in uh, dealing with this quantum machine learning structure. You can apply this uh, trotter uh, box in the dashed line several number of times to generate various kind of evolution. And it produces this feature map. And once you have a feature map, you take the output of this and uh, convert it into the kernel uh, which you are going to measure to design or decide on the discrimination of the states. So this is a structure. Of course, we have not yet done any real detailed test of this kind of thing, but this can be tested on simulators. So systems are simple enough. You can write classical code and work out all the details, and they seem to be working quite well. So this is a useful uh, connection between machine learning and how chaos will find a use inside it. And afterwards, it's a question of optimization. How do you align the two uh, states or how do you measure alignment? And that is, again, nothing complicated. All you have to measure is a dot product. And you figure out the orientation where this alignment um, is uh, maximized. And this can be actually done using the so-called ideal kernel, which is just defined as the values of plus or minus one. So there are two classes, and ideal kernel is, of course, when you are able to uniquely label one class with values plus one and another one is minus one. There is no error at all. And you can use that uh, ideal kernel, which is mathematically known, but in practice uh, unreachable, and measure its uh, overlap with the approximate uh, kernel which you got from the training data. And uh, that, in the case of quantum case, is just going to give you the Hilbert-Schmidt Hilbert distance, and you optimize it to decide or to figure out what is this orthogonal vector W? So again, it's a standard procedure and I'm not going to detail any of it. I am only uh, going to uh, say a simple fact. So the preparing a kernel is like preparing a dictionary. It requires a lot of works. If you want to train using a data size of N, then you have to determine order and square and matrix. It's an N by N structure. If you want to tune R variational parameters, uh, then the grid over which you have to scan this is a basically exponential of R points, number of points along a direction raised to the power R. And uh, the third thing, which is a quantum 
contribution is estimated probabilistically and this gives a certain uh, limitation if you don't have a large enough ensemble of quantum measurements you will have an error because the overlaps which you measured they were all going to give probabilistic answers they were not going to give exact answers and so the accuracy of this method will depend on the ensemble size and you should have an algorithm which scales uh, well in terms of the ensemble size this is indeed uh, possible and uh, how am i doing with time the time is nearly up okay so let me finish it uh, quickly one feature which i found useful is to write the density matrix in a poly basis where it is just a poly matrices including identity written in a tensor product with some real coefficient and this is a nice orthogonal uh, basis in which uh, various things are very easily evaluated the nice constraints are all there the hilbert smith distance is nothing but the euclidean distance of these uh, parameters and all the expectation values of any arbitrary operator if you expand is in the same poly basis is just a simple dot product so all the features of the classical labels just carry through nicely and uh, then one can list uh, various kind of imperfections what if the training data points are not balanced will you rescale them what if there is a noise if you know the magnitude of the noise it can be used for renormalization at least when the noise is the depolarization type if the matrix is not positive semi definite then you do a prescription which is similar to the singular value decomposition find all the eigen values and throw out all the eigen values which are close to zero and uh, once you do that these all classical uh, post processing stuff then there is this uh, quadratic program which starts from the kernel and gives you this uh, support vector alpha and these are the methods which are heavily uh, used in uh, conventional computer science and once you have this vector alpha you have a nice prediction algorithm in terms of this uh, svm which is a support vector machine linear combination with this coefficient alpha it can be looked upon as a mixed state and you have the overlap of the unknown state with the mixed state if you find its sign you will know its class so that is the completion of the machine learning process in the supervised learning case and uh, the last thing i will point out is there is the advantage in this and uh, advantage really comes in if you avoid as much of the classical stuff as possible and one thing which you can easily imagine is the data comes as an output of some quantum process but you do all kind of measurements and reduce the data to classical value and then you are again going to feed it inside a quantum machine so suppose you avoid all the measurement in the middle which uh, puts the classical stuff and connect the output of a quantum physical process directly to this machine learning uh, system if you do that then you will preserve many quantum correlations uh, which are getting lost when you do a classical measurement and that definitely gives you an advantage about uh, what you can uh, get out of the system and it can be a quite a substantial advantage the other very simple fact is that if you use this poly basis vectors they either commute or anti commute and so if you have two copies of this density matrix and you perform a bell measurement on these two copies all the magnitudes can be simultaneously determined because the corresponding operators are all commuting with each other and this you can exploit that ultimately you are going to do all kind of projections you truncate the system so that you keep only the large magnitudes and throw out all the small ones and this can be a 
huge simplification when you are dealing with large number of uh, data and a high dimensional system, because in practice, most of the time the system has only a small number of uh, important components, uh, so called principal components, you keep them throughout all the rest. And this can be surprisingly done by just two copies of row and uh, does not require large overhead. And then you can now ask the question, how are you going to compare the effort? You can put in various parameters, the training data set, number of evaluation, number of operations, et cetera. And uh, they can be counted. And uh, there is a powerful result here that uh, you can talk about two kinds of scenario. One is the worst case scenario, and the other case is average case scenario. So if you are going to protect against the worst case scenario, uh, a proof can be given, it's available in this paper, that the quantum advantage can be exponential. But if you uh, are looking at average case, there may not be such an advantage. And I will again give a simple example, which is a, nothing but the density matrix, that if you want to determine the entries of the density matrix to a, some constant error, there are four raised to n uh, coefficients, the quantum algorithm needs only order n copies. But any classical algorithm must use two raised to capital omega and copies of row for the same task. So there can be a huge advantage uh, possible depending on the kind of questions you want to ask. It is going to be a problem dependent statement, but yes, there is a lot of uh, things possible uh, in case of machine learning. Also, if you use the density matrix in the correct uh, uh, manner, thank you very much. And the list of references which I used are put on this particular slide. Sorry for running a little bit over time. No problem, Professor Patel. Uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. Um, so, uh, like we have run a bit uh, out of time, so maybe there's time for a few quick questions. Uh, so, can you please raise your hand, whoever wants to ask a question? I have a question, Narati. Yes, yes, Professor Jain, yes. please go ahead. Uh, very interesting and uh, thought provoking talk, Abu. Uh, very nice. Uh, for the, there is just one question that about the <clears throat> inverted oscillator, which you discussed. Uh, for the inverted oscillator, for the classical case, there are uh, eigen distributions which were calculated long ago by Nico van Kampen in a very rigorous paper. Uh, for the, the density matrix that you, uh, uh, the quantum mechanical solutions, if we try to see a semi-classical limit, can we find those eigen distributions which were found by Van Kampen? Yeah, certainly yeah. it is an exactly solvable problem and it will be just given by the squeeze states. Okay. I've not done any comparison, but probably you can do that. There were difficult problems with respect to incorporating boundary conditions at plus minus infinity uh, when we come at the level of Wigner function. But uh, I, I, I will take a look at your solution and see if the Van Kampen modes are uh, restored in the limit. Yeah, the unbounded yeah. modes actually create a problem. But if you want to regularize it, you can uh, look at this inverted oscillator as a part of a double well potential. And uh, that kind of uh, gives some control, though of course your exact solvability is lost, but uh, the initial behavior uh, can be uh, made almost the same. Okay, all right. Okay, so are there any more questions? Okay, so uh, 
If not, uh, I would uh, thank uh, Professor Patel for his uh, nice insights into quantum chaos and uh, uh, and for uh, his insights into machine learning for the quantum cases. So uh, with that, uh, yeah, I. And uh, I think the session uh, can be closed right now. So there are uh, there are no more speakers as of now. So um, we uh, so we at this point we take a break for an hour and we reconvene at eleven o'clock. Uh, there are many more fantastic talks that are supposed to happen throughout the day. So please stay tuned into uh, this uh, meeting. Yeah. So handing it over back to so uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Professor Abdeep, and uh, thanks mm. all the speakers of this session. And so it's time for break, as you already said. Uh, mm. So we'll uh, restart the session at eleven. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.
Hi, Stacey. How are you? Ah, hi. Hi. So, how are you? Fine. How are your things going on? I, I sorry, could not hear you. Huh? Could not hear you. What, how, what are the things going on in VCC? Oh, uh, at the moment, work from home. Work from home. Yas chala gaya, yas? Yas chala gaya. Calcutta wala ko thoda relief diya hai. Baki digha aur coastal area mainly affected hai. Achcha. Barish bohat hua, but fortunately wo utna jada wind nahi tha to nuksan kam hai. Achcha. Aur aap log to matlab ek ke baad ek pehle corona se taute taute ka koi effect tha? हाँ ताऊते का इफेक्ट था अच्छा ताऊता डैमेज नहीं था लेकिन इट वाज विंड और वो सब था एक्चुअली इस बार खतरनाक खालत है एक के बाद एक हम्म वो है और बताइए बाकी ओ अच्छा वी आर लाइव राइट यस वी आर लाइव there are some more people in the this thing. So uh, we have uh, uh, we have another five six minutes. Then okay. we can okay. really start because people have gone for uh, you know breaks and breakfast. Ah, sure. <laughs> start from I, seven o'clock. Huh? Yes. Yeah. I think Santanam and Sai both have joined. Uh, hello, Santanam. Hi. Uh, Sai. Oh, hello. Uh, hi, Sashi. How are you? Hi, hi, hi. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Good. Okay. Uh, do you want to kind of check uh, because you are the first one, so yeah, yeah, I can share my can, screen uh, and. Uh, yeah. you can. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can share uh, your screen. Yeah. I'll just Do you see it now? Full screen mode? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we can see okay, that. great. Works. Ah. Hi, Nishal. Ah, Nishal is here. Hi. Sai, uh, has Sai also joined? I, I think I saw him. Ah, hi. Hello, Sai. Uh, uh, can you please unmute Sai as well? Chat screen is open. Ah, one minute. Hey, by the way, um, our internet connection in the campus is down since morning because of some cable cut. Ah, okay. So I am on phone connection. Slightly can be unstable. Hey, That's hey, Shashi. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it if it Hi. gets cut, I'll reconnect. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our, our, we can always uh, bring in Sai in that. Sai, you can take over. Yeah. <laughs> Tag team. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be a super position of two talks. Oh, yes. Going back yes. and forth. <laughs> I mean, we are in quantum information domain anyway, so. It'll be a maximal mixed state <laughs> for the audience. Uh, 
you know, I mean, so you know the whole "dur se dekha pass aaya" jokes from our childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So "dur se dekha" to maximally entangled tha, pass aaya to maximally mixed tha. <laughs> Shashi, you you are doing chaos, na? Quantum yes. chaos. Nowadays. Yeah, yes. yeah, and entanglement and things here and there. Uh, sorry, not in. And random matrix theory. Hmm. So yes, uh, Sai, would you also like to check or? Uh... Yeah, I actually tried uh, in the end of the previous session. See, oh, the okay, okay. HB and I lectures the host. I just want to request them to pay attention to the chat because I actually pinged several times trying to get their attention so that I can check. Uh, Santa, oh, can okay. I check very quickly? Yeah, yeah I have should to I share should privilege. I just unshare? Yeah, yeah, please. ये is it just showing slide by slide or uh i think we are not able to see yeah, at the yeah, moment we're just seeing a empty screen yeah empty it's just an empty screen. slide okay so let and actually share the whole screen too oh in this uh, yeah i can see one page i think you are in the different desktop Yeah. Now, yeah, now, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you can see outline. this transition. Okay. Perfect. I know what not to share. Okay. So thanks a lot. Yeah. So, so all we you can, Santana. We can give back to Santana. Yeah. so participants are still joining we can wait for another 2 3 minutes yeah okay okay, yeah. okay i'll share after yeah ah, you you can you can share uh, santu okay. you can share okay yeah. Uday, so how is Uday? Uh, Sometimes Uday, yeah, yeah, Uday is fine. Uh, he's fine. He is in Nagpur. Yeah, he is in Nagpur, right? Okay. So coordinate wise, how far he is from you? I think it's about six hundred to eight hundred kilometers oh, from okay. Pune. Yeah. It's okay. really fag end of Maharashtra. Ah. It's more than an overnight journey by train. Oh, okay. But there are uh, like good connectivity. Trains are uh, on regular interval, so. Yeah, I think there are yes. In normal times, now I don't know. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I think. so i think you can uh, welcome back uh, welcome back all the uh, all the participants uh, after the the tea tea and breakfast uh, now the uh, this before lunch uh, session will be chaired by dr shashi cl shrivastav and uh, shashi uh, was our npd colleague uh, few years back 
and he has worked with uh, Dr. Sudhir Jain, uh, and uh, he's a naturally grown, uh, you know, a natural uh, theorist. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to invite Shashi to chair the session, and uh, uh, you can uh, now uh, conduct the session. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Shukla. Uh, so uh, I welcome you all in this uh, session of the second day of the conference. And uh, we have two talks, one by uh, Professor Santanam uh, from Aisa Pune, and uh, the other one is by Professor uh, Sai Vijanampati uh, from IIT Bombay. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, we are kind of, already behind the schedule by three minutes. So let us start directly. Professor Santhanam is a, uh, I mean, he's professor in uh, IIT, uh, ISER Pune. His research interest uh, broadly covers the quantum chaos, nonlinear dynamics, quantum information theory, complex network, extreme value problems, etc. And uh, specifically, he uh, he does a lot of work in driven quantum systems and uh, random matrix theory, random walks, etc. Uh, so today we are uh, going to hear from Professor Santhanam about uh, chaos and quantum correlations in the Kick talk. Uh, Professor Santhanam, please. Yeah, thanks, Sushil, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I must start with a small note of apology that. Uh, uh, the regular internet connection at our campus is down since morning, so I am on a phone network which can be uh, unstable at times. Uh, but in, in a rare case, it gets cut, I'll reconnect within a minute or uh, two. And I must also thank uh, Sudhir Jain and uh, the organizers for giving this opportunity to present our work. And in fact, it's a pity that uh, we couldn't really have this meeting in. BRC in uh, Bombay. I mean, I've been to BRC many times, especially for the meetings that Sudhi had organized. It was always a pressure, a pressure to be there. And hopefully, uh, look forward to being there maybe next year or so for uh, similar meetings. The work I'm going to present is something that I've been uh, sort of intermittently doing in the last eight to 10 years. Uh, with specific reference to Kicktop, it's the work that we had done in the last uh, three or uh, four years. So the overarching topic is about the relation between classical chaos and uh, quantum uh, correlations. I'm going to, by and large, stick to uh, the specific uh, question of this relation between these in the context of uh, Kicktop. And pretty much most of the results that I'm going to present are the work uh, done with uh, Uday Bosle, uh, who was a postdoc with me two years back, currently an assistant professor at uh, NIT uh, Nagpur. And uh, again, the results that I'm going to present are there in these two uh, papers. And I will start uh, first by describing uh, the kick top model. Um, I think many people have heard about it and are familiar with, uh, familiar with it various uh, degrees. In any case, I'll uh, make a systematic uh, introduction and then go to chaos and uh, quantum correlations. Okay. You can think of uh, kick top as a point moving on a unit's sphere or say the angular momentum vector whose dynamics is uh, restricted to being on a uh, unit uh, sphere so that you can think of it as physical intuition of a kicked top and uh, this is the hamiltonian which is uh, dimensionless uh, so you can see there are two parts to it uh, essentially the dynamics is as i said the dynamics of the angular momentum vector which undergoes regular rotation and every periodically it gets a kick or a twist so you have regular rotation followed by an instantaneous uh, twist and then regular rotation followed by a uh, twist and so on. So it continues uh, like this. So the first part here, P, uh, J, Y, is simply a rotation by an angle P. There should have been a tau, the uh, denominator, which is the periodicity of the kick. 
And the second term that you see, if you can follow my cursor, uh, is essentially again a rotation uh, dependent uh, rotation. The twist or a torsion about that. This is only up for instance here, only a teenager times when n goes like two, three, and uh, so on. Um, so that that basically the model that uh, we'll be looking at. It is one of the popular models of uh, uh, chaos. And of course, J Y and J Z are simply the components of the angular momentum vector. And the only conserved quantity here is the uh, total angular momentum itself. So to work with the quantum dynamics of this system, uh, you can actually reduce it to a Floquet operator, which, which is basically a product of two exponential operators. And this is possible simply because of this uh, presence of this um, series of uh, delta functions. Otherwise, you won't be able to uh, do this particular uh, reduction. And here, J is the angular momentum quantum number. And K is, of course, the strength of the twist. And uh, you can call it uh, uh, call it the kick strength, uh, if you like. And P is, a, of course, a parameter. Uh, and most of the cases that I'm going to uh, present here, P will be set at uh, pi by 2. And now, why is this of uh, interest? Because you can think of TikTok as a mini body problem, as a collection of uh, many uh, qubits, uh, if you like, because you can write this J um, as a collection of uh, spin half particles. So, effectively, what you have is you can think of TikTok as a collection of 2J spin half particles. Of and if you go back and uh, write this JX, JY, JZ in terms of uh, poly matrices, which is the standard uh, uh, textbook stuff, if you do that, you will notice that um, uh, the second term, the, the J square term that you have here, this exponential operator will basically be a summation that looks like this. So you have um, uh, sigma I said M, sigma I said N. So this is the one that puts in the uh, interactions. So effectively, what we are looking at is kicktop represented as a large number of uh, qubits in which each qubit interacts with every other uh, qubit. So in this, think of this as an icing model, if you like, with some uh, transverse uh, field. Now I'll come back to this picture in a second. And uh, the nice thing about it is that you can actually take the classical limit. So in the limit of large number of um, uh, spin half particles or qubits, essentially you're going to the classical limit. You need to do a, a rescaling like this. And if you do that, you can actually reduce it to what is called a classical map. Uh, in other words, typically when you're working with uh, classical uh, systems, you will have to ultimately solve the Hamilton's equations of motion or Lagrange's equation of motion, whichever uh, is your favorite. But here, I mean, those are ordinary differential equations, but here you reduce it to a, a difference equation uh, called the map. And in that sense, it's really easy to simulate. And the dynamics, the classical dynamics, again, takes place on a unit uh, sphere simply because of the constraint that uh, this uh, rescaled jx, jy, jz, which appears as x square plus y square plus z square is simply equal to one, which is due to the parameterization that we implement, that uh, you, have, you take this x, y, z and write it in terms of r, theta, and phi, but uh, you have these two variables theta and phi. Now, when you look at the uh, phase space of this uh, kick top, all we need is only theta and phi. So you have theta, I mean, phi along the x-axis and theta along the uh, y-axis. Now, the parameter of interest for us is uh, this quantity k. So that's going to be the parameter that we are going to vary in this, uh, at least in this talk throughout. I'm going to say that we'll uh, vary this parameter k. Uh, which is the strength of the twist. And when k is 
uh, zero of course it's uh, really a trivial or an integrable uh, problem um, because you don't have the twist part of it and when k is equal to one uh, your phase space is filled with uh, what are called elliptic islands this is a signature of uh, integrability in the sense that the system does not show any anything like an unusual uh, chaotic uh, dynamics and similarly here you have for k equal to two on the right side but you see that as soon as you reach k equal to two or even little before that uh, you notice that large parts of the phase space is now filled with random looking points and that's of course uh, the sign that chaos is already uh, setting in and by the time uh, you reach a large value for k something like six or even larger than that most of your phase space is nearly chaotic. Occasionally, you will see some small regularity, but by and large, you can assume that for large value of uh, this kick strength K, essentially, you are looking at a chaotic uh, system. So in other words, on one hand, we have this classical problem. Uh, uh, starting from the kick top, you take the limit of large number of qubits, you reduce it to a classical problem, which has all these uh, chaotic dynamics. For small kick strengths, you have something close to regular uh, dynamics quantum chaos which is the kick rotor uh, kick rotor is simply a pendulum which is periodically uh, kicked and together between kick top and kick rotor they are sort of in some sense standard models of uh, quantum uh, chaos uh, here again uh, we can take a kick top and nearly reduce it to a kick rotor uh, provided of course we um, restrict the space of uh, kick top to something like a waistband in this uh, in this unit uh, sphere in that case uh, so i try to pictureize this uh, here on the right side cartoon of that and in that case your angular momentum vector is going to be uh, restricted to this waistband that is shown in this blue color effectively the dynamics is on a cylinder and of course uh, if your original um, Hilbert space of the problem is 2j plus 1. Um, now you are going to have far more restrictions. The particle cannot access most of that uh, space. So you can actually uh, do an uh, exact reduction and show that uh, you can uh, take your kick top and uh, write it in the form of this set of uh, difference equation, which is shown here, which is exactly the difference equation for a uh, kick rotor. Uh, the important difference being that when you do the quantum mechanics of uh, kick rotor, you will see things like uh, dynamical localization, which is an analog of uh, Anderson localization in uh, condensed matter physics. On the other hand, uh, the kick top does not show any any such uh, localization effects. So it, it's really uh, two different kinds of uh, uh, phenomenology that we'll be seeing in kick rotor and kick top. Now, uh, at least uh, from a physics point of view, the interesting thing is that uh, kick top has been uh, experimentally realized. At least I know of three different experiments over the last uh, 10, 12 years. Uh, the first one uh, being uh, this paper in 2009. So they used electronic and nuclear spins. And um, um, basically the problem studied was uh, how does chaos manifest itself in the quantum regime? And at least it pointed out to the fact that if you have chaotic regions in phase space and you start off an initial uh, wave packet starting from a chaotic region, you are able to generate more entanglement in the quantum region. More recently, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Professor Mahesh, uh, he also uh, did realize uh, kick top with just two qubits using his uh, NMR uh, setup. So it was a pair of two spin half uh, 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 nuclear particles. And they use quantum tomography to reconstruct the entire uh, density matrix itself from which you can derive the reduced density matrices. So here they studied in more detail uh, the relation between uh, entanglement and uh, the classical uh, phase space. I'm going to show you some figures much later on in the talk. And in 2016, uh, there was this uh, interesting uh, paper uh, 
in which kicktop was realized using uh, as uh, transmons or superconducting qubits i guess transmons were discussed quite a bit in this meeting yesterday and even uh, and this was Uh, Thermalization happens later in the quantum system. Uh, typically, the person of interest that uh, thermalization happens when you connect an isolated system to a bath, but here you have an isolated system which uh, thermalizes. So, again, this is a figure that I'll come back to uh, a little later. So, I'll probably not uh, discuss uh, at the moment. Okay, yeah. Now, what is the question of interest as far as we are concerned from the point of view of quantum computing and uh, quantum uh, information? Of course, there is a general, in, general and inherent interest in the connections between classical chaos and entanglement. We are always told that uh, entanglement is an inherently quantum uh, measure and really doesn't bother about what happens in the uh, classical domain. So I want to show in much of the talk that, uh, strictly speaking, that's not true. In fact, all the evidence point to the fact that uh, entanglement and not just entanglement, pretty much any quantum correlation measure that you take is indeed affected by uh, what happens in the uh, classical uh, domain. And uh, so effectively, that's uh, one uh, question that uh, we'll be uh, interested in. And in fact, there is a uh, sort of catch to it in the sense that, as I said, uh, when you take J tending to infinity limit, large number of qubits, anyway, you are reaching a sort of classical regime. And it should not come as a surprise that your entanglement measures when you are in this large J limit have something to do with what happens in the classic. But what really is surprising is that as we've been seeing, you need to really go to the large J limit. It's enough if you even look at uh, just say two qubits. Two qubits are sufficient quantum classical correspondence. So what is of interest now is you go to this so-called deep quantum regime where you are working with only uh, you know two to maybe five or uh, some such number of qubits, and even then there are very clear signatures of classical dynamics in the quantum correlations. So again, that is a, a question of uh, interest here. And in general, when you look at it as a computing uh, problem, so you are really putting in many qubits together and hoping to uh, hoping that it will work as a, a meaningful quantum computer. And suppose if it were going to mimic a nonlinear system like this, then would it really do what we want it to do? That is a question from you can get insights uh, from such uh, model systems. Okay, so I'm going to uh, basically go through a series of uh, quantum correlation measures, which I'm going to use later, uh, even though I guess uh, many people are probably already familiar with most of these things. I'll just go through quickly uh, some of them. I'm not going to do a, a lecture in great detail on these things. So entanglement is one of the simplest measures uh, that we use. And you would say that a uh, system is not entangled if you can't write it as a direct product of uh, the part, uh, direct product of uh, the states uh, it uh, represents. A simple example, for instance, is one of these uh, well states um, that is an entangled uh, state. So if I have, let's say, so if I have a, a pure state, uh, something like this, and it has two parts, one and two. And um, so the way I would compute, let's say, entanglement is you calculate the reduced density matrix. In other words, straight of the degree or one of the parts of the system. So you will get a reduced density matrix. And the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this reduced density matrix essentially form 
sort of component uh, which will give you a unique decomposition which you as the Schmidt uh, decomposition. Here, this lab are the eigenvalues of this uh, used matrices and uh, phi one and phi two are the eigenvectors of the used density matrices row one and uh, row two. So this is a unique uh, decomposition and anything that you want to do all the information that you want is actually contained in these eigenvalues and uh, eigenvectors. So the von Neumann entropy uh, is uh, simply minus trace of log uh, row one uh, which can be written in terms of these uh, eigenvalues. So clearly, if a pure state is uh, not entangled, uh, S is equal to zero. And if it's entangled, it's greater than zero. And let's say, going back to that example uh, of uh, one of these Bell states, um, uh, entanglement, actually, in this case, you can do it uh, analytically. It will turn out to be log two, and it's actually maximally entangled. And another quantity that I'll refer to is the linear entropy. Basically, go back to this von Neumann entropy here. You have this log rho one term. Linearize it and uh, one or two steps of algebra, and you can uh, get this expression for uh, linear entropy. And uh, since uh, trace of rho square is a measure of purity of states, essentially linear entropy is related to purity of states. But the thing is that it's easier to compute, but gives you similar information as the von Neumann entropy. And other uh, quantity which I'll use is this quantum uh, discord. It is a measure of, in some sense, that is uh, all the quantum correlations which are present in the system beyond uh, entanglement. So in other words, you're removing all the classical correlation. So whatever correlation that's left there could be attributed to quantumness of the uh, system. And uh, the origin of uh, the definition actually arises from this uh, two different definitions of um, classical mutual information that I have. So I have again two parts of the system, A and B. Uh, A and B make up the system. I and J are basically mutual information, uh, classical mutual information. And I have two equivalent uh, formulas, let's say, for classical mutual information. Both will, both are identical. Will give you the same result as far as uh, classical mutual information is concerned. But now, if we sort of uh, uh, calculate the quantum version of mutual, what I'm going to uh, get. And if you look at the previous formula, so here is condition. Uh, drop it will also be replaced by a, a conditional um, online. And this will require uh, sorry, this will require uh, measurement. So what you're looking at is the difference between these two, I of rho and uh, J of rho. But in principle, uh, this is actually a basis uh, dependent uh, quantity. So what you do is you would uh, maximize this, or in other words, when you write the definition of uh, discord, uh, essentially you minimize uh, over all uh, possible objective uh, measurements. And uh, then so we, uh, uh, for, for pure state, Two bits. I'll, uh, essentially, this is the definition, and in this case, uh, remarks in a simple uh, formula like this, where the lambda i's are the square roots of the eigenvalues of this row and row tilde, where row tilde is simply a, a state. Then there's this uh, rectangle we get to use once. It's another uh, multi-partite entanglement measure, which depends on uh, these concurrence uh, values. And uh, in fact, one more that I'll use, which is called the Q measure, uh, which is actually a multi-Q uh, entanglement. And um, uh, so this is, you can think of it like an average over uh, entanglement of uh, each qubit with the rest of the system. So with this uh, introduction, now let me uh, 
uh, start uh, posting some of the results. Okay, the first message I would like to convey that classical chaos actually enhances uh, entanglement. Okay, so this is really a, a old result, as you can see, almost 20 years uh, old. And this is for a coupled kick top. And I actually showed you one kick top. So you take two identical kick tops and couple them uh, together. What this uh, tries to actually show is that, so I have this face of uh, coupled kick top. You will see this yellow and blue uh, circles here. So what you would do is you place an initial coherent states at these positions and evolve them under the action of this coupled kick top. And look at how you are able to generate entanglement in the system. And that is what is shown here in this uh, figure uh, down below. And if you are starting it from a region where it is typically uh, chaotic, as you can see, this uh, red dot is in a region where it is uh, chaotic. You generate a large uh, more entanglement. So the rate of entanglement generation is much higher than the case where your initial condition was started in a region uh, which is which has this uh, regular structures in the classical phase space. So you could see that the slope here is much smaller. And in this case, um, uh, in this case, they were able to show that um, uh, the entanglement rate here is actually proportional to the sum of the uh, Lyapunov exponents. And these Lyapunov exponents effectively characterizes the, uh, let's say the, um, it, it's like a local instability exponent. It tells you how much in some sense is the instability locally in the phase space. You can do similar thing by coupling uh, kicked rotors as well, and you more or less get a similar uh, result and in some sense this is the experimental uh, version from the transmon uh, kick top experiment with three qubits you get similar kind of results so you see what is plotted here is the overlap of the average uh, density uh, matrix and the micro canonical uh, density matrix uh, the overlap between the two and if you had uh, started your initial state uh, from this blue region, uh, which actually uh, closely corresponds to the chaos that exists there in the classical phase space, you will see that you much closer to this ergodic limit. Then if you had started uh, from a region which is largely dominated by these so-called elliptic islands or regularity, in which case you don't really quite get to this uh, ergodic limit. So this comes from the uh, from the experiment that was uh, recently done in 2019. Okay, so that is one uh, part of the uh, story. So again, uh, recapping all this, you can actually model this in terms of um, uh, random matrix theory. Uh, again, um, so th I won't be able to introduce um, uh, the ideas of random matrix theory in this talk, but um, the average entanglement that you reach the value that you see here in some sense um, has a neat uh, random matrix formula, which is um, dependent only on the dimensionality of your uh, Hilbert space. Now, so effectively, I've tried to convey the message that uh, classical chaos uh, enhances entanglement. Uh, it would be boring if uh, that is what uh, one actually sees, but there is more to it. Uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, on the other hand, in a sort of reverse mapping, entanglement itself is an excellent probe, probe of uh, classical chaos. I'll try and convince you with some uh, results. Uh, here, uh, so what you're seeing is again uh, the classical phase space of the kick top, the, uh, in the top panel there. And the K is, of course, the kick or the twist strength. So we have chosen two different values, 0.5 and uh, 2.5. And 0.5, you see that you have this uh, whole lot of regular regions, but uh, 2.5 has a lot more of chaotic layers. But now, when you look at the 
time averaged entanglement in other words you evolve your initial coherent state placed in one of these chaotic layers or in the regular region and time evolution and then at each time step you will calculate the entanglement and then finally do a average over that uh, quantity quite remarkably you see that it actually mimics the classical uh, phase space here this color picture down uh, below and the interesting thing is this happens uh, with just two qubits so you, it's a kick top with j equal to one so basically you made a kick top with two qubits it is as quantum as it can get and yet it still does not forget the classical the underlying uh, classical dynamics uh, below it and here is uh, some more of this uh, for instance here uh, so in the in the previous case what we saw was the entanglement but here you have linear entropy and discard again a different set of measures so the top panel is for the discard and here now this time uh, j is 20 so it's it's a large number of uh, qubits and it's averaged over 100 kicks so once again you see that uh, if you compare these two figures here and compare it with the classical phase space you see an interesting uh, resemblance they more or less mimic uh, each other and of course at this point it should not surprise because after all j equal to 20 in some sense is uh, taking you much closer to the closer to the uh, infinite uh, qubit limit in some sense and uh, so it is able to mimic classical dynamics but but then uh, you can see down below when you calculate the linear entropy even with three qubits it again reproduces uh, the classical dynamics and again here it's averaged over 100 uh, kicks and here is the experimental um, uh, evidence of this so again you see the same uh, classical picture but on the left side what you have is the uh, experimental uh, entanglement entropy again averaged over time so you see that this red blob here uh, reflects this region and again this elliptic ellipse like region effectively looks something like this and here you don't see it symmetric apparently because of uh, some experimental imperfections uh, about which uh, i think if you need to know more you need to read this uh, uh, paper and i am um, i can't comment much about that um, so again this is with three qubit and it comes from an experiment okay so the lesson at this point is that even for small j very few qubits quantum correlations actually mimic the classical phase space uh, structure. Again, uh, the thing is that it doesn't stop here. There is much more to it. So entanglement and correlations aren't just affected by these uh, coarser classical phase space structure. They are even sensitive to what is happening in the phase space. In other words, classical phase space has things like bifurcations and so on. And these entanglement and other correlation measures are very sensitive to those bifurcations as well. So let me explain what's happening. So again, by now, this is the familiar uh, classical uh, phase space uh, picture for the kick top. Now, if you uh, look at this red dot, which is uh, placed uh, here. So, I mean, that was placed mainly to indicate that that is where the initial coherent state was placed and you start evolving your um, uh, the initial coherent state under the uh, under the action of this uh, kick top. Uh, you can see that so that is basically a, a periodic uh, or or, a, or on this map it's a fixed point. And at k equal to two the fixed point is uh, still there, but you see that at k equal to three it doesn't exist, but it seems to have produced these two smaller. Uh, regular regions and they have actually moved apart and of course there is no trace of any of these by the time you reach k equal to six here now uh, this is what uh, would be called a bifurcation because if you are just tracing this point here uh, uh, which is denoted by this theta star and uh, so that is a stable fixed point 
and as you vary k so here is a my cartoon of that so i have plotted this point as theta star as a function of this k and this continuous line here basically tells me that um, uh, the fixed point continues to exist there and continuous line tells me that it's actually stable and at a critical value actually it happens in the case of uh, kick top it happens at k equal to 2 at this critical value precisely when k is equal to 2 it bifurcates and uh, that particular fixed point actually becomes unstable which is why i have drawn the rest of it uh, in a dotted line here but when it bifurcates it also gives rise to two uh, stable orbits which are these structures that you see here and that is shown in this black continuous uh, line so this is a uh, bifurcation and uh, it's a particular kind of bifurcation called a, a pitchfork uh, bifurcation now let's see if our quantum correlation measure are uh, sensitive to this so <laughs> Uh, so here I have a tick top with uh, j equal to uh, 50 or in other words 25 qubits and in this case uh, j equal to 120 which is the case of uh, 6 uh, qubits. Uh, now uh, what I have plotted is three different uh, measures. One is at the top is the discard and uh, the middle one is what is called the geometric uh, discard and you can ignore uh, what it is now um, and the q is as i said what is called the q measure or mayer and voila uh, q measure all are measures of uh, quantum correlations now look at how they evolve as a function of uh, kick strength k and we expect that at k equal to 2 there is a bifurcation happening in the classical phase space so maybe something happens here as well so what is plotted here are these uh, measures so you can see that at k equal to 2 i have drawn these vertical black lines everywhere so around k equal to 2 there is really a jump that begins there and finally as k uh, settles down to larger value every one of these measure basically reaches uh, 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 a value that is determined by the uh, size of the Hilbert space of the system. And this uh, green color uh, line here uh, is for j equal to 10. So you can see that larger your uh, Hilbert space dimension, if j is larger, of course, your Hilbert space dimension is large. So you would essentially reach uh, larger uh, values as well. And uh, so that is, as you scan, uh, scan as a function of uh, kick strength k. Now you can ask the question: What happens? What happens to life after bifurcation? So you you take the value of uh, k. Mm, uh, you take some value of bifurcation. Uh, here I am looking, uh, let's say, k equal to 10, which is roughly here. Okay. Bifurcation was over at k equal to 2, and I am focusing on k equal to 10. And what happens is, uh, so I am looking at the time evolution of these. Uh, um, so this is what you see, these uh, blue dots and red dots and black dots, and uh, these black uh, horizontal lines that you see are the averages that you will get from uh, random matrix theory. Again, these are simply dependent on the on the uh, dimension of the uh, Hilbert space. So you can, at least in the case of Q measure, have an analytical uh, result for the uh, uh, for the random uh, matrix uh, expected random matrix value uh, in the situation when the system is completely chaotic. And there is an excellent agreement between this numerical results, which is shown in dots, and this uh, horizontal line there. And now this is nothing peculiar to kicked top. Uh, in fact, it happens in kicked rotor and pretty much in any uh, chaotic system. So this one is a very different uh, chaotic system called the coupled quartic oscillator. Uh, it's like you have your harmonic oscillator, but instead of harmonic, you can have x power four term in which you will you have you will have a single quartic oscillator, but you can actually couple two such 
uh, quartic oscillator together and it's actually a chaotic uh, system and alpha is your uh, parameter which you can vary as a um, as a function of which uh, many bifurcations take place in this uh, system there is one particular bifurcation which can be easily uh, tracked and if you look at the relevant um, state and also the density matrix and calculate the entanglement it beautifully um, it has a very beautiful correspondence with the pitchfork and anti-pitchfork bifurcation points. So you see these AAP uh, that's written there, this uh, black and red lines. These are points at which different bifurcations happen and you have a, a extreme mine uh, entanglement. And uh, so this is, uh, again, I'm not going to show you how this was derived. This is there in our uh, paper, but you can actually derive a random matrix uh, average for uh, the Q measure and it has an excellent agreement with the calculated uh, results which we also saw in the uh, in this uh, figure here okay now what so bifurcation happens at k equal to 2 now i want to know um, uh, so I want to pursue uh, the parameter k equal to 2. And how do the uh, correlation measures behave as a function of, uh, function of uh, j, in other words, as a function of number of qubits uh, in the system? And uh, interestingly, uh, it's very systematic, as you can see. So here it's shown for three of those, uh, discard, geometric discard, and the uh, q measure. Yeah, and they all have uh, power law uh, decay. In fact, the decay is really, really, really slow. And you can trace it back to the fact that um, the, the initial coherent state that you are uh, placing has a width which is proportional to one by uh, root j. And if you're going to place such a, a initial in a, in a uh, in like, let's say at k equal to two, the classical region is surrounded by a regular uh, region and uh, as j uh, increases uh, really you are going to have a narrow and narrow and narrow uh, initial coherent state which is going to take very long time to break out of that um, uh, regular region so you see really a slow decay as a function of j in all the cases it's quite uh, systematic this happens precisely at the position of bifurcation. But what if you are not at the position of bifurcation? So you take some other value of k, let's say a large value of k where it's typically uh, chaotic, uh, then uh, you actually, uh, you can start from your initial coherent state, uh, irrespective of where you put it, sooner or later, finally you will reach a saturated value that is very, very well described by these uh, uh, random Ranges. So, in fact, we have several more of these uh, case scenarios uh, in the uh, paper, but maybe um, uh, the point I uh, want to mention is that, uh, once again, that quantum correlations are, uh, are quite sensitive uh, to what is happening in the classical phase space. So, they see actually the details um, that are taking place in the classical phase space, things like bifurcation. Now, even this is not the end of the story, there's even more to it. The interesting thing is that entanglement and uh, correlations actually um, uh, display uh, periodicity. So let me actually take you through a series of uh, uh, nice looking pictures. Uh, what is uh, shown here is again, kicked up um, with uh, just two qubits. And uh, E is again uh, pi by two. And in this plot, uh, I'm actually looking at the average, um, sorry, the you're looking at the von Neumann entropy along uh, von Neumann entropy in the third dimension. Uh, the x axis, uh, the kick strength k, y axis is time. And of course, the third dimension is this von Neumann entropy. So what you can see is that, interestingly, um, 
you can see periodicities in this picture. So there is clearly a periodicity of 2 pi, uh, or certainly at least quasi periodic, in kick strength k. And if you look at the vertical axis, uh, there is periodicity in time as well. For the case when j is equal to 1, which means it's a 2 qubit uh, kicked top. Now uh, you can actually look at different uh, versions of this, in the sense that now, for instance, I have here uh, von Neumann entropy with three, qu three qubit kick top. And uh, Excuse uh, me, again, uh, I have, hello? Uh, was there me. a question? Uh, so Santhanam, just uh, in the previous uh, figure, can you tell me what is the color coding meaning? Uh, the color coding is actually here. Uh, it's on the left side. See that color, wait a minute. Yeah, the maybe I'll yeah. yeah, the color bar basically tells you the color. Uh, bar. Yeah, yes, this one, yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, now uh, for Neumann entropy with three qubit kick top. You can calculate uh, quantum discord with three qubit kick top. So you can see these periodicities. Quantitatively, uh, you see a different periodicity, for instance, with three qubit kick top. Here you see something like a three pi periodicity, in a, but at least it's not very clear there's any period in uh, time. And uh, I mean, you can choose your favorite uh, quantum um, uh, correlation measure. There is concurrence, three tangle, uh, so pretty much um, same uh, scenario repeats. So again, you see a three pi uh, periodicity in. You can keep doing this with uh, four qubits. Uh, here is shown for von Neumann entropy and uh, quantum discord. Okay, uh, I, I, I guess I've made this uh, point that there is periodicity. So let's see if uh, we can actually derive it uh, exactly. So I, I'll show you, I'll show this only for uh, the simplest case. Uh, uh, the general J case is there in our paper and it's a little more uh, involved. Uh, so here, uh, so you can either start from the premise that uh, we do by periodicity in the case of uh, two qubit kick top and uh, basically ask the question, I'll have an initial state which is going to be uh, evolved under kick top with the given uh, value of K and another one with uh, k plus 2 pi. And then see if um, uh, the states uh, which are acted upon by these are related by a local unitary transformation. If they are indeed related by a local unitary transformation, then you could make the claim that any quantum uh, correlation measure is invariant and hence you are seeing these uh, periodicities, which is basically what I'm going to show in this uh, case. And uh, for the two qubit uh, kick top, so you have this uh, two different kinds of basis. One is the JM angular momentum basis, and other is this two qubit uh, basis uh, made up of zeros and uh, ones. And you have this relation between these uh, basis states. This, this is fairly uh, standard. Now you go back to your Flaquet operator with uh, j equal to 1, uh, which means that uh, this is my uh, Flaquet operator. And I'm going to now apply this transformation that k goes from uh, k to k plus uh, 2 pi. Uh, so which means that you replace this k by k plus 2 pi, in which case this operator u becomes operator o times u. And uh, where, sorry. Uh, where uh, this is our uh, wo operator. Now, um, so uh, you operate this wo u on an initial state written in uh, JM basis, in uh, which case uh, this u operating on this uh, initial uh, state j equal to one uh, will be uh, written in terms of this uh, some coefficients a, b, and c. It's a column vector with a, b, and c. Now, uh, this O operator is diagonal in the J, J being one. It's simply 
diagonal element being minus one, one, and minus one. And in fact, you can, uh, in the standard JM basis, this is what it is. Uh, uh, now you can reduce everything to the standard uh, JM basis, which is ABC will finally give you this minus A, B, and uh, sorry, minus A, B, and minus C. Now, if you reduce all this to the qubit basis, this will be our uh, this will be our uh, coefficients. Effectively, the statement is that uh, I have my initial state, which is this, and after doing this k going to k plus two pi transformation, this is the state, and this can actually be uh, explicitly written down in terms of this uh, qubit uh, basis. Now, if you stare at this, you can easily see that these two states are related by this local unitary. Uh, sigma is a direct product. Uh, sigma is a, with this negative sign, which implies that all quantum correlation measures are invariant under local trans, uh, local unitary transformation. Since we have shown that uh, these are related by a unitary transformation, uh, effectively uh, the correlations are indeed uh, periodic under this transformation, k going to k plus 2 pi. Uh, in principle, uh, you can repeat this for a general J. You will have to split it into J odd and J even. And the calculations are uh, somewhat more uh, longer. And, um, uh, but the result really does not uh, change. The summary is that uh, for any J, uh, uh, the periodicity uh, basically uh, is 2J pi, which implies that if you take K to K plus 2j pi quantum correlations remain invariant. In fact, uh, that is you see this uh, j pi uh, for the case of j equal to essentially you are looking at uh, periodicity of 2 pi. And you will also notice that the reflection uh, symmetry, in fact, the reflection symmetry about uh, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. So if you, let's say, look at one unit of this uh, lying between 0 and 2 pi in K, you also have a reflection symmetry about pi, uh, which means that uh, as you scan your tick top, uh, as you scan uh, your parameter space in K, you have only unique values appearing from, in this case, uh, for the case of J equal to one, you have unique values of uh, any quantum correlation measure, measure up to pi. After that, it is simply some uh, symmetric partner of what you already saw. So, which means that it has an important uh, implication that there is a largest value of K uh, for which you will see unique structure in your um, any correlation measure beyond that it's going to repeat itself and that largest value is simply given by uh, j pi and this is really useful as a guideline for experiment because if you're doing an experiment you don't need to go beyond this k max uh, assuming that you're using 2j if you're using 2j qubits to construct your kick top in the experiment you need not go beyond k max equal to uh, j pi or k should not be greater than this now let's compare with recent experiment. So if you go back to this uh, transmond based kick top, which was done with three qubits, uh, in that case, um, so the, our work basically uh, tells me that um, k max uh, is, which is three by two times pi, which is approximately equal to 4.71. No point in taking value of k large. But the experiment itself was done only at two values, at 0.5 and uh, 2.5. So there's no uh, necessity for this. Yeah, I'll finish in time session. Yeah. And uh, the NMR-based uh, uh, kick top experiment with the two, two qubits uh, done by Mahesh's group at ICER Pune here, uh, in that case, J is equal to one. So your theoretically predicted K max is simply pi. Uh, which means it's 3.14. So ideally, if you go beyond that, it's going to repeat. And the experiment itself was done at four different values. So you see that it was done at 0 0.5, 2.5, uh, pi minus 2.5, and 2 pi plus 
Now here they've gone beyond 3.14, which means that you should expect a repetition. So in fact, the candidate here is to look for this 2.5 and 2 pi plus 2.5. And in fact, if you go and look at uh, results uh, on Neumann entropy, you will see that for k equal to 2.5 and uh, k equal to 2 pi plus 2.5, Precisely, you get identical uh, copies. This is precisely this is an experimentally shown uh, result in this uh, paper. So you do see a nice uh, uh, periodicity in the uh, in the reported in the experiment. And uh, finally, I just want to make this one uh, really important point that, uh, in fact, it turns out that this three qubit kick top is an exactly solvable uh, model, in spite of the fact that it is chaotic. It is an exactly uh, solvable model. The result is there in Arul's uh, uh, paper of last last year. I don't want to uh, describe the results myself, but the interesting thing is that actually use their uh, exact solution to compute the averaged entropy for the three qubit case for a given initial state, which is the zero 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 state, starting with initial condition um, pi by two and minus pi by two, and this is the uh, result you can see that it's all in terms of k. This is the average uh, linear entropy. Uh, now, our result says that uh, you should see a periodicity uh, here. And uh, in fact, if you look at the inset of this uh, figure where the linear entropy is plotted as a function of uh, k in their paper, you see a nice uh, periodicity, uh, 3 pi periodicity corresponding to the fact that they are, they actually have calculated it for a three qubit uh, case. And in fact, you see this three pi periodicity for three different uh, colors, I mean, uh, three different initial uh, conditions. So that's another uh, proof coming from a very different and independent calculation. Yeah, so that's that uh, three pi periodicity in the incentive. In some more of these in the paper, but uh, I'm not. So there is also the periodicity in time. I think I'll skip this uh, part uh, for now and uh, summarize uh, the statement that uh, quantum correlations are excellent probes of the nature of uh, classical dynamics in the system. And it just doesn't stop at that. It even responds to the details of classical dynamics like bifurcations and other things that's happening in the uh, system. And it remarkably uh, it does all these things even in the so-called deep quantum regime where you put in only few qubits and in the kick top uh, system the correlations actually display periodicity which is very useful as a guide for uh, experimentalists and uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, these are the papers where you can look up details sorry if uh, i have exceeded time by or so uh, no no um, thanks, uh, thanks, Santana, for such an interesting talk and uh, kind of uh, made a point uh, the effect of classical uh, chaos in all the quantum measures. Um, we still have time for like a couple of questions. So uh, please, uh, if somebody has a question, this is the time. I have a question. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a very simple question, basically giving other people time to think of what to ask you. Um, um, there is a lovely talk, and the result that you showed of Arul is, of course, extremely beautiful. Um, uh, the uh, periodicity of phenomenon entropy with time. Uh, that is also known for other examples, like some years ago, uh, working on a quantum version of Katz ring, which is like coupled qubits, several qubits on a circle. All kinds of one of entropies become periodic as a some time, as, which is, depends on the number of qubits, number of balls you consider. Of course, classically also, the von Neumann entropy is periodic in time, and the periodicity is the exact result from Poincare recurrence time. Uh, that's anyway 10 years old result that we had used ergodicity of Rademacher functions yeah. to prove that. So, yeah, so it's it's, it's nice that it uh, comes up here, but of course I was um, um, not there for some part of your talk, so, but I okay. 
yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The beautiful Thanks. pictures. Yeah. So it, it is. So, yeah. The beautiful you're pictures. Asking something. Have, yeah. The beautiful pictures which are there, where the value is changing in a certain very uh, fashionable way. Uh, does that have a detailed yeah. interpretation? Um, I mean, as far as I know, I, I up, uh, uh, so I guess if you look at uh, entropy and compare with uh, maybe phase space at each time, you may be able to associate that. Uh, but I think that's a detailed semi classics that needs to be uh, done. We have not uh, looked okay. at it uh, that carefully. Yeah. No, I would love to uh, analyze at least the patterns and yes, try to classify right. yeah, them yeah. in some way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they look beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, if, if, if there is no other question, then let's uh, thank Professor Santanam once again uh, for a nice talk. And uh, uh, let me invite now our second speaker, Professor Sai uh, Vijanampati. Uh, he is a uh, Assistant Professor in Department of Physics, IIT Bombay, and his research area um, includes um, quantum information theory, quantum control theory, synchronization, and non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Uh, today, he is going to speak about uh, synchronizing quantum thermal machines, and uh, the floor is yours, uh, Shai. Hey, thanks a lot, Shashi. Uh, uh, great to be uh, in the company of all of you, um, though virtually, uh, let me just set up my screen just for one second. So, Shashi, is my screen, uh, is it on full screen and visible with the pointer moving? Yes, yes. You're okay, fine. perfect. Okay. So, yeah, thank you again, uh, the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, and it's great to see, uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and, uh, and uh, some folks who I'm uh, yet to make uh, um, acquaintance, acquaintance with. Um, so let me just begin by telling you that uh, um, this is actually quite in line with the previous talk. So I'm, uh, I'm quite excited about that as well. Uh, for, so this is basically the interplay between quantum mechanics and uh, and uh, nonlinear dynamics. And so today I'm I'm here to talk to you about synchronization and its relation to quantum thermal machinery. Um, and so um, you can see uh, the publications are here. So there is one which is under review, and then the others are published. Uh, and I'm happy to share them with you offline. Um, and uh, let me just begin by uh, by uh, by telling you what the outline of the talk is. So essentially, what I'm going to do, um, and the experts in the audience, many people who've taught me this stuff, uh, I apologize for this. The experts in the audience will uh, will uh, excuse me. I'll just begin by basically again saying this out loud: what is synchronization and why should we care? Because this is something that if you're not in nonlinear dynamics, then perhaps you don't know. I didn't know before I started working in this field. Um, and then I'll move on quickly to defining quantum synchronization, and there is a kind of subtlety of infinite versus finite dimensions. And uh, that will set us up nicely to actually start talking about synchronous engines, and uh, also about coherent power output of synchronous engines. And then basically I'll, I'll finish off talking a little bit about the role of degeneracy. So as you can see, this is quite a kind of uh, um, journey I have to take you through. So I essentially want to start somewhere here, uh, so, you know, this is the famous picture by Huygens, and I want to end somewhere there, which is, you know, a cartoon of two engines, which are basically correlated to each other, entangled to each other, um, however you want to think of it. So, um, so you'll bear with me on that. Okay, so let me begin again by doing something that everyone does. I think this is almost, um, you know, an act of faith, which is to show you actually what synchronization is um, before I tell you what it is mathematically. So, what you're seeing here are problems. Uh, so these are self-sustained oscillators in the back end. And, uh, right now. So they're oscillating, but their phases they're out of phase. And on a common platform, you can uh, you can see uh, uh, on these two kind of they basically tend to synchronize. So you can actually see it visually they tend to synchronize. So this is the whole uh, the whole point of synchronization. And uh, this was observed um, um, you know very early on, uh, and it's now very well understood and kind of work in these kinds of uh, these phenomenon uh, models such as this. So let me go with the description. Uh, so this is what's called the Kuromov model. These are all on a ring. And um, 
So the phase oscillators, so the phase thing that is that we're interested. In. And what you have is an equation of from theta i dot is basically has minus theta j. So what this means is that if I just choose the first oscillator theta one, uh, basically, so this difference uh, appears as theta one minus theta two. Whereas for the second, it appears as minus of theta one minus theta two, theta two minus theta one. And so what this basically uh, means is that by judiciously choosing the value of a, the coupling constant basically uh, may possible that is running ahead basically be pulled back. So the so the force can be it's pulling towards theta one, and theta one can be pushed up pushed up. And so that's the kind of dynamical mechanism for them to synchronize with each other, right? So the the metronomes that you saw that's the ex if you just follow this math, that's the explanation of why it happens. Okay, so now why should we care about synchronization? Of course, we care about synchronization because it's ubiquitous in classical mechanics uh, in the classical world. So, actually, one of the most famous and exciting of kind of uh, uh, little fireflies that have, uh, you know, that are not particularly talking to each other, that synchronize uh, the human synchronizes the sunlight. Uh, Essentially, a collection of cells that uh, beat synchronously. If they don't beat synchronously, then this is, you know, arrhythmia. Net synchronization is just a cartoon of the U.S. electrical grid. Um, and so, this uh, basically means a synchronization. The classical where it uh, goes from micro to macro. It appears in all length scales. It's uh, and it provides a certain stability uh, that is very exciting. Now, right here, I just want to introduce some nomenclature, and this will be uh, basically the penultimate slide where I do introductory nonlinear dynamics. And the nomenclature is basically the difference between entrainment versus synchronization. So, what you're seeing is basically uh, sunlight can basically control uh, the the human body's uh, release of, let's say, hormones, but uh, the release of uh, of uh, of human uh, hormones can't influence sunlight. Sunlight is what it is. Uh, um, a, a one-way, which means that this uh, system essentially serves as a periodic reference that this uh, system can but has no influence on the other one. You could uh, emulate this in classical mechanics by having a very, very heavy pendulum that provides a, a kind of a periodic source, and then sm and then small nonlinear uh, oscillators, basically, which are uh, which you take as a, as a reference. Uh, I want to kind of contrast this against uh, the word synchronization, which essentially the thing that I showed you, which is uh, many, many oscillators which are coupled to each other, all of which can influence each other. Uh, it's a technical distinction, but you know, this will become important if uh, certain questions come up. Okay, so with that, uh, let me tell you why anyone cares about uh, synchronization from a kind of technical point of view. And uh, the technical point of view is stability, and the stability is guaranteed by something called the Arnold Tongue. Right, so um, I again want to provide a motivation for you that is that goes beyond nonlinear dynamics. So imagine that you have this, this old high school experiment of uh, of ours that many of us have have gone through, uh, which is basically you have a cantilever and you can basically force the cantilever from outside. Now imagine now I make a couple of modifications. I add qubits of metrics to the uh, cantilever, and then I quantize the cantilever. So the cantilever is actually uh, quite close to the mechanical ground state, right? This is not an impossible experiment or a, or a completely crazy thing that I made up. Uh, nanomechanical resonators, optomechanical resonators, there's tons of kind of physical systems where this is actually a very relevant model uh, for us to think about. And uh, what you have is, uh, is basically um, a very nice uh, uh, coexistence of mechanical phenomenon, which comes from the uh, with quantum phenomenon, which comes both from the ground state cooling, but also from the fact that you have qubits. And if you apply an external magnetic field here, you could couple the qubits to basically an external, um, uh, an external magnetic field and, and drive them that way. So uh, this becomes important for us to actually talk about uh, uh, synchronization of the quantum regime, right? We could already move this discussion into synchronization to quantum regime. And uh, before I do that, let me go back to the classical regime. So just keep this in mind, but let's go back to the classical regime. And I just want to explain to you this diagram. So what this diagram on the on the f-axis, what it plots, is the difference between the observed frequency and the external drive frequency. So this is the example where I'm living with the frequency and asking the system to respond to that frequency, right? And uh, so, just for a while, this is what you can work out from uh, from uh, this theory. 
And but uh, what happens after a while? So let's say you have a you have a, a four gigahertz resonator. So if you drive it at four point one um, in a synchronous fashion, then uh, then what happens is that the uh, physical system stops oscillating at four and oscillates at four point one. 4.2, maybe 4.3, and then after a while, it basically just says, well, look, the detuning is too much, and it goes back to oscillating at its natural frequency. So what you're seeing on the y-axis is the difference between the observed frequency and the natural frequency. It goes back to the frequency, this becomes a straight line, right? And so this uh, region of synchronization, basically, you can imagine is influenced by the drive strength, and that's why this card goes over here. This external oscillator, I can pump it hard or I can pump it uh, gently. And uh, if I pump it harder and harder, I'd imagine that the synchronization region expands because I'm essentially forcing it harder and harder. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so this uh, region of you know, synchronization, which has these two uh, axes, one is detuning on one axis, the other is a force called the Arnold tongue. I'll show you several, several Arnold tongues, so I want to make sure that I have this uh, in our collective um, understanding. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move to synchronization um, uh, in infinite dimensional quantum systems. Um, so how do you go about it? So uh, initially what people did was they said, okay, look, let's take examples of uh, synchronization. So here is an example, it's just a Vanderpool oscillator. And what it does is it's a bit of, a, of uh, uh, the nonlinearity, which I'll show, uh, it's just the ratio of gamma to gamma one. Uh, what I've done is I've just plotted it the, to the, and the, and the Open them together. Um, and forms as well, just standard nonlinear dynamics. What um, uh, what Walter Bruden and Kemp did, they pointed out that uh, they said, look, at an expectation value, we can, re uh, we can basically make the same analysis. So uh, they proposed a master equation, uh, which basically is the form of road of this minus zero plus one and gamma two. And all I want you to pay attention to is that is a pump term, it's exactly like this pump, gamma is a dissipative term, it's exactly like this, and it's squared, it's exactly like this x squared. So you can, can make that formal analogy um, in a second. And then there's a detuning, the delta with the detuning between basically the natural harmonic oscillator frequency, the which is embedded here, and the drive frequency which you're driving it. And uh, there's a drive strength f, which basically is just the, uh, is just the uh, strength which it should drive. So if you uh, take all of this in, uh, into consideration, then uh, what you have at the expectation value uh, at the uh, uh, at the uh, at the value of expectations uh, beta dot uh, is basically the, uh, just a complexified version of the Arnold uh, of the Van der Poel. So this beta equation is essentially this equation. So all I've done is basically the second order differential equation converted to a first order by uh, basically complexifying. Um, uh, this x x x dot I've just basically made it complexified, and so this complexified equation basically is called the Stuart Landau oscillator, and this is the quasi harmonic version of this, right? So much. Uh, uh, so let me show you in pictures what what Brunon can. What they said, let's plot for some values of these parameters. So now I have these these little parameters that I can manipulate. I have uh, gamma two, gamma one, which are the uh, the two damping rates, and then the detuning, and then the drive strength. So the f is the same as this. Uh, what they what they basically uh, uh, well, they said, um, you can produce limits, classical limits that you're seeing in black, and you can see a phase which is over here. And uh, what they also show the corresponding uh, Wigner function. If you plot basically the corresponding Wigner function, the Wigner function essentially also looks tracks uh, the limits. The function has no phase. Um, Whereas the local phase preference, and this phase preference is understood as the quantum version of synchronization, right? Um, and so the what I want to do is basically talk about this phase synchronization. Um, so again, I show the diagram. So there's here and the phase preference here. And uh, now what I want to do is I want to ask, uh, what does this look like? Um, if I look at basically the emission of the, uh, the atom, uh, what Walter and Nolan can point it out is that, look, you can use actually define uh, a synchronization measure by just looking at the, the, um, uh, at the distribution of the phase angle. But 
you know, just to make contact with experiments or with potential, also plot the power spectrum. And what they believe is that the example of uh, the classical dynamics is plotted in uh, in solids. The dynamics is plotted in the quantum power spectrum is plotted in What you see is that for some value of the parameter chosen, there is very good agreement. So the classical uh, uh, synchronization basically uh, says that you should be over here. And then the quantum uh, synchronization basically, the peak of spectrum is sitting right next. So it's quite strong evidence. And then uh, this is well understood now, but I'll just keep for the great agreement of the regions basically. And so this difference of kind of uh, um, of uh, um, of uh, um, quantum versus classical correspondence, uh, it can be understood very much in the in the canonical. So I've gotten comments uh, saying that my voice is breaking. So can I just uh, request the host? Is my voice breaking? So uh, when you are seeing uh, like this, your voice is not breaking. When you look sideways and you speak, then it's breaking. Oh, I see. Is this a mic issue? Must be, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll just peg it to my shirt so that it's a little bit more localized and maybe that will help. Um, okay, so I'll also try and speak up a little bit. I can also cut my video if the if this persists, yes, just to kind of make sure that the bandwidth. Now, now it's perfect. Now it's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, so what we did, so this was one of our first entry points into the field. So what we did, we basically pointed out that by adding a squeezing uh, to their, um, uh, to this entire setup, you could actually basically uh, restore some observability problems that uh, what the uh, original paper had. Squeezing basically enhances the synchronization's measurability, basically. And, uh, and so you basically speak, uh, you think it should be, this, this is, uh, the zero here indicates that it's actually locked to the drive. And the peaks quite strongly, which means that you can actually observe the synchronization. So, uh, so this, uh, and that the, was not classical, so this was basically one of our first forays. Uh, for the purpose of this uh, conference, I just wanted to flash this slide, um, which is basically that you can actually see a bifurcation. Uh, Santan just spoke about it. Uh, you can actually see a bifurcation in the Wigner functions. So the Wigner function itself demonstrates a bifurcation. So it's pretty cool for us to kind of see this uh, in the quantum regime. And the cl corresponding classical dynamics actually is uh, has a bifurcation. So we proved this in the in the paper. Okay, so let me move on. Um, so that was uh, quantum synchronization for infinite dimensions. Uh, what's the takeaway lesson? The takeaway lesson um, is that you use phase space uh, quasi probability distributions to construct the underlying uh, argument, right? So, um, so this is the, the kind of the, the picture that I just showed you. What I'll do for finite dimensional systems, so now I want to talk about two level atoms, three level atoms, four level atoms, is basically I want to re reproduce the exact same uh, discussion. I want to extend this, right? So uh, Bruder um, and Roulet already did this. I'm just presenting uh, some of the results and then I'll show you my generalization. Um, so the argument is the following, which is uh, what do we need here? What do we need to basically construct this synchronization measure? In the notion of space, so basically uh, space, uh, can be discussed basically. So there is radial direction and phase direction, and then I can discuss the phase. So what we need is basically something like a Wigner function, uh, but just as easily you could construct the Husimi Q representation function, which is just the expectation value in a coherent state. So this thing is much more regular. So we'll move to this for the for the spin uh, for the spins that we're going to discuss. And uh, so what we need is to construct a, a phase space quasi probability distribution of finite dimensions. And the way that you do it is actually to construct coherent states for finite dimensions. So the moment we have coherent states for finite dimensions, we can basically go back and construct uh, the spin analogs here, right? Uh, is this, uh, I hope that this is clear to everyone. Let me repeat the argument. So the phase space dynamics to move to quasi probability distributions. Wigner function, and just accidentally in the case of uh, um, uh, Walter Bruder Nonenkem. So basically, uh, what we are to spins is that we want to basically produce that phase space based measures again. So we want to look at phase space. And so to look at phase, space, we need to construct a phase space based measure, like Husimi Q representation function, which can be constructed only if I have a coherent state looks like for spins. So this is what I'm just going to briefly tell you about. So um, 
the spin coherent states construction is very, very simple. So let me just give you the procedure. So there's a kind of literature around this, which I refer you to. Um, so the basic idea is the following. First, consider the algebra of the Hamiltonian. So let me just give you an example. Let me take a qubit. Something sigma and something sigma x. So the algebra is SQ2. Then what I do is I consider an extremal state, either the lowest energy state for SQ2. This is basically either a ground or a uh, uh, spin down or spin up. Spin up is typically preferred, so I stick to convention. This is just a convention. And then finally, apply the unitary representation of, uh, of algebra that you have. Uh, apply the group representation of it on to basically the spin up state, and you have a coherent state. So uh, the way that this is done here, you can just notice that what I've done is I've done sigma z, sigma y, sigma z. So it's Euler triangle representation of uh, SU2. And the sigma z on the up simply goes away. So what you do is basically just two angles that I'm trying. And so I could define an SU2 coherent state, a spin coherent state, uh, state I, which is also state theta and phi, which is just pi sigma z, theta sigma y acting on the spin up. So this is the way you would construct basically um, a coherent state, right? Uh, so I just want to basically say that this is the smallest uh, uh, quantum system that you, you can construct this for. You can't go any any lower, right? So you can go to three levels, four levels, five levels. The smallest that you can do is uh, is basically uh, just a two level atom. So you can stop here and you can ask, and this was naturally the question that was asked several years ago, was uh, can I make synchronization in this, right? This is a controversial uh, topic and, you know, ask me in the questions and I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, but uh, the answer um, is no, right? And so, uh, so there's one on the no. Let me just present the no. The no is basically, it's a very simple argument. Uh, let me present what the argument is. So synchronization requires what? It requires two things. It requires the existence of a limit cycle, right? And the second is it requires an angular component uh, that should then exhibit locking, right? What that basically means is that the existence of a of an observable limit cycle must uh, must be given to you, right? So what do we have here? We have basically a spin up or a spin down. Sorry, I already have it here. And what I want to do is I want to construct a limit cycle for it, right? And the limit cycle basically can have only two angles. It can have three variables in it. One defines the purity. Let's just uh, let's just ignore that for the moment because it's just a radial direction which is irrelevant to the discussion. Um, if you have a diagonal limit cycle state, then the only way that it can appear is some t time, something in t bar. And what that basically means is that there is a free angle here, which is this e to the i phi, but it's unobservable. It's a gauge degree of freedom with respect to this limit cycle. So you could never take a qubit limit cycle and actually tell me whether or not it's actually, it's in a free phase. Because every time you observe it and you find that the phi degree is pointed in some direction, you've just observed it in that direction. You couldn't, you, there's no way for you to tell whether or not it was actually genuinely sitting in that direction before. And that's the reason why uh, qubit uh, limit cycles are precluded, right? Um, okay, so the what that basically means is that the smallest quantum system that you indeed can make uh, such a, a discussion for is basically a three level. Atom. So what Rule and Bruder did in 2018 in exactly the same paper that precluded the qubit limit cycles is basically they considered the, uh, the exact same thing that I know. Just look at this. It's e to the i phi as sigma instead of sigma z, it's s z. And e to the i theta instead of sigma y, it's s y. And S Z and S Y are basically the S O three subgroup of S U two. So what it means physically is that it's an equal space level atom. And now what you have is basically an uh, an S Z which is one zero minus one, and the corresponding S X and S Y. This object basically um, uh, is uh, can produce a valid limit cycle because the valid limit cycle corresponds to basically being stuck on this equatorial uh, this middle level, and that's a perfectly measurable thing. You can just shell this to something and measure it. So, um, so this is perfectly okay, and this is perfectly reasonable. And for that, that reason, basically, now let me just show you the rest of the, dia the, rest of the calculus to basically uh, convincing ourselves that there is actually a limit cycle here and to construct the synchronization measure. So the, the way you do it is basically, uh, you first construct the Hussein representation function, right? And so uh, in, the, in, the, in the infinite dimensional case that I showed you, just using the coherent state construction, Case it's the spin coherent construction. So now I'm coherent based uh, CPQ representation function. And uh, CPQ representation function for what? It's for the state of the density matrix, right? So I take an open quantum system, I just let it evolve to a steady state, and now I'm trying to stare at whether or not the steady state is synchronized or not, right? And so 
uh, here what you have to do is that the construction state becomes actually quite important. So um, let me just make a quick argument about the availability of this phase degree of freedom. So uh, let's take this uh, cohesion state, uh, which is the, the, the state, the cohesion state, into just another representation of it from uh, Ken Nomoto's work. Um, this is basically defined in terms of theta phi. It's this, this cohesion state here. Now uh, I have a bare Hamiltonian, which is e to the minus i omega t, uh, omega naught sigma z, right? How does z to the minus i omega naught sigma z what do to this cohesion state? It actually just oscillates the phi term. You can just check this, is just adds multiply this with uh, this with an omega naught t, right? So you just add it here and that's it. What does this mean physically? What it means physically is that just as um, if I if I wanted to synchronize many metronomes, what's the first question I would ask? I would say, what's the free phase? And what you would do is you would just place the metronome in isolation and it would just vibrate back and forth. And you'd go, that is the natural, that's the unperturbed dynamics of this of this classical system. So now let's put it on a bench and let them talk to each other. And in perturbation, we expect the same dynamics to synchronize, right? In exactly the same way, now if you ask what is the unperturbed dynamics, which is basically under the omega naught sigma z, um, that basically involves the phase degree of freedom phi just going around in a circle. And so that's the object that you want to synchronize. So if you plot the corresponding Q representation function, you can see this degree of freedom along the equatorial plane, which is completely free. But as you go up and down, basically, uh, you are phase localized. And what the phase localization represents is a choice of the uh, populations, whereas this is basically the fact that the relative phases are completely left uh, for you to lock on to, right? So, um, so what uh, uh, Bruder and Roulet basically did was that they basically uh, considered this kind of a system with, with two dissipators. One is basically an S plus SZ. All that does is it only takes you from 0 to 1 minus 1 to 1, 0, and an S minus SZ, which only takes you from 1 to 0. Right, and uh, they basically uh, um, wrote down what the underlying quantum system looks like. So again, what you wrote down with the Hamilton factor, and then so this is exactly just this diagram in terms of the equation. Right? Now, what I want to just quickly mention to you is how do you convert the Q function, right? This object, uh, if epsilon zero, that you get, what happens when you have non-zero epsilon? This is the question of synchronization. So how do you answer this? The way you answer this is you simply integrate the Lucini uh, Q representation of the appropriate half and you subtract the from contribution. And to get the what's plotted is on one axis a certain value of d delta, so a fixed value of delta in this equation. On this axis, Epsilon, so I fix the value of epsilon in this equation, and then what I do is I uh, I simply ask the question. Uh, now I solve this row dot to the steady state, um, and then I question if I take that steady state, the CQ representation, integrate the, as phi produces some value which is a function of phi. What is the maximum of that? So this is what is success, right? As s phi is a function of dt sitting here. So this is basically the uh, the the one of the first examples of basically an Arnold tongue in a finite dimension. This is an example of an Arnold tongue in a finite dimensional system. The previous one was the one of the first examples of an Arnold tongue in an infinite dimensional system. So these two uh, already set us up for discussing basically quantum synchronization in a much broader context. Yeah. So with this, let me actually move on to our work. Um, um, so. What we want, we were interested in is basically uh, to ask, we first began by asking what's the full SU3? So we were asking essentially technical questions, like what is the full SU3 um, uh, synchronization measure? What does it look like? And then one of the realizations we came to is that thermodynamics is actually intimately related to this entire conversation. So let me just present that entire argument to you. So what we were interested in is basically finally uh, in, in its presentation, Interesting things. So I have a hot bath and I have a cold bath, and I have some atoms here. And what I do, I talk to the atoms. The atoms are already talking to the two baths. Now, um, if I drive it, but I drive it in the wrong frequency with the wrong detuning, essentially, then there is no coherent power output. Because when I drive the right frequency, there's actually a large coherent power output. Right? 
this entire kind of dynamics is actually well explained by the theory of quantum synchronization. And the reason why uh, we came to that conclusion was basically because we realized that essentially the workhorse of thermal lasers, which is what this thing is, um, is essentially a synchronous system. So let me explain that to you. You've already seen this kind of a diagram before. Um, you have you had seen this to be equally spaced. So this was halfway between uh, level three and level one. What we've done, we've just pushed it uh, uh, upstream, right? We've just pushed arbitrary, uh, detuning, uh, arbitrary level spacing. And now what you have is the full SU3 group. So what you have to do is first uh, to repeat this entire conversation, construct the full SU3 coherent states and then construct the synchronization measure around it. Now, why did we do this? The reason why we did this was basically, this is thermal, let me in the uh, physics uh, just for one second. Let, so assume that like one and three are coupled to a very hot bath, right? What that means is that if it's infinite temperature, then this thing is 50% and this thing is at 50%. Let's assume it's nearly infinity. So this thing is at 48% and this is at 50%, let's say. The other 2% is over here, right? And in fact, the way you do this is you uh, you basically, uh, you up these two levels, one and two, to a very cold bath. So uh, with respect to this one, two transition, this two has barely any occupancy. So two percent is 50%, right? With respect to one, three transition, one and three have almost equal occupancy. What that means is you have population inversion for, you know, for free, essentially. So if you couple these two levels, three and two, then it's coherent power output. So now again, we have a synchronous thermal machine here for two reasons. One is I have a dry strength salon between delta, so it looks like I can set up a thermal machine. I have to prove this to you. I can set up a synchronous machine. I can prove this. I have to prove this to you. The second reason is basically because thermal states are cycle states. They're diagonal uh, states, and so diagonal states are limit cycle states. This is something that uh, that follows from the arguments that I've quickly presented before. So because of this, what we realized was basically that if I have a quantum system that is just coupled to a thermal bath, one or many thermal baths, which are mutually diagonal, uh, which thermalize into the same basis, then with respect to that basis, basically this quantum system is naturally basically uh, uh, the equilibrium state, uh, the steady state of this kind of, of this coupled system is naturally in a limit cycle state. Now, what this basically means is that, um, is that this can be synchronized, right? Let me show you in phase space this exact same argument. Uh, have a kind of uh, state drawn a cartoon. Of. This is a different kind of trying to illustrate. Just ignore this inner circle for the moment. Imagine this white circle over here, which is basically just that with no distribution, just a thumb. And then what I do is basically I uh, when I fit lock, it locks to some. This is just a statement that thermal states don't have a phase difference in. Uh, then that's all I'm trying to say. So, uh, with this, basically, uh, what we were able to do was we were able to construct basically um, uh, um, a synchronization measure for SU3 coherent states and apply it to thermal engines. So let me show you what this is. It looks like so the SU3 coherent states are basically written this way. So previously you had two angles for SU2 theta and phi. Now you essentially have four angles theta. Uh, zeta phi one and phi two, and basically these four uh, angles cover all, all of the uh, all all quantum states. So whose representation is more messy, and then we integrate the uh, the uh, um, the population degrees of freedom. You have two phase degrees of freedom. So essentially, it's like synchronization on a donut, right? And then you have to remove the uniform contribution. So uh, this basically uh, we did, and let me just show you a picture of this. Uh, again, we plotted estimates as a function of D and as a function of drive strength, and what you see is a, uh, is a clear Arnold term. So what this proves is basically that uh, quantum thermal machines, especially uh, just the scoville schultz dubois um, three-level engine, is essentially a synchronous machine, right? And this is the first time uh, in our um, understanding, this is the first time that you can, people have actually connected the notion of an Arnold tongue to the to this uh, scoville schultz dubois thermal machine. And I think this will play a, a, a huge role going forward to basically discuss uh, thermal machine uh, from a certain stand, you know, nonlinear dynamics standpoint that we're very familiar with. Let me just go ahead and also show you a couple of more diagrams. So this is the power, the coherent power output of this machine. And the coherent power output also shows an Arnold tongue. So this is a power Arnold tongue, which is actually quite su surprising. Um, at least at first sight. So what we did was we wanted to understand why power is showing an Arnold tongue and why coherence, uh, why synchronization is showing an Arnold tongue. 
And what we realized was basically the synchronization is actually generating coherence, steady state coherence. And steady state coherence is the thing that is generating power, right? So here is the coherence. So it's just the uh, one norm of coherence is well known in the community. And um, what we then did was we basically pointed out that uh, synchronization actually bounds the optimal power output. Here, all I just want to use the PSS, the steady state power output of, uh, of this engine, is literally the uh, upper bounded to some factors. Not that, basically, only look at the synchronization measure, you can actually predict where the Carnot efficiency line is. Basically, so this is exactly it. So you recover Carnot efficiency from our calculation from basically a synchronization point of view. Okay, so I've thrown a lot of words at you. So let me just make an intermediate summary before I move on to the next part of the talk, uh, which is basically that uh, to measure synchronization, what we need to do is construct phase space based measures. This is one important key that I need you to take with uh, take uh, with you in the um, in the coming part of the talk. Uh, second is basically the thermal states are indeed limit cycle states. This is another conclusion that I want you to carry with you. And the third is the coherence is implicated in synchronization. Example, I'll show you that the story is a bit more complicated. Okay, um, so uh, let me just make a small interlude. This is not particularly relevant to the rest of the talk. I just wanted to flash one more piece of uh, uh, piece of result. Um, so what we were basically interested in is basically this coupled thermal machinery, um, as I've as I've just told you. But we are not just restricted to thermodynamics. We're interested in all kinds of things, which I think will be interesting for the community as well. We're interested in sensors and refrigerators and all kinds of these. So, for instance, I could basically just one pump driven by external drive. This is classic entrainment in the quantum. Uh, we're into basically it's a nonlinear uh, being driven by light. This is another example: infinite dimensional, finite dimensional. Maybe we're into finite dimensional systems which are being driven, but that to each other. Maybe we're interested in hybrid quantum systems, atom a uh, three four level. The, Sitting inside a cavity, light that is coming out of this cavity, non-linear, right? So we're interested in these kind of uh, uh, these kinds of synchronous systems, and what we realized was that there isn't actually a good measure that exists for all of this. And being that this is a quantum information conference, I'm happy to report that actually quantum information fixes the problem. Um, there's one more important problem here, which is that suppose I'm trying to drive a quantum system, right? So what I do is I apply a laser field, right? If you go talk to experimentalists, what they'll say is laser fields tend to heat up samples, right? So if you apply a, any any kind of uh, external drive, one of the things is that, uh, that happens is that the environment picks up the external drive as well and starts heating up the sample. So what happens uh, canonically speaking in, in uh, typically speaking in many of these experiments is that your limit here gets to a limit cycle that's over there in the uh, on the application of a drive. So the drive localizes you, of course, localizes you at a different point. And what we realized was that this is actually already not uh, uh, considered in the literature and not discussed. So we went ahead and fixed that. So uh, you recognize this as simply kind of, uh, you know, perhaps you'll think that I'm talking about entanglement measures. So this is we can basically uh, minimize and, uh, you know, produce an entanglement measure by minimizing over for states, you know, so on and so forth, you know, uh, for Discord on and so forth, and uh, what we showed was that you can construct a unified measure of quantum synchronization, which actually is capable of ha uh, handling hybrid quantum systems, and uh, the details are basically in the paper that I referenced. Um, an example of this, what I wanted to do was that uh, this is an Arnold tongue, but Arnold tongue for what? It's an Arnold tongue for a wonderful oscillator, which is a level atom, both of which are basically uh, um, are basically in their limit cycle. But you couple that with some uh, and you drag uh, epsilon. This is an Arnold tongue between them. So this is a completely bizarre and unique uh, example that we just constructed for academic purposes, just to show that it can be done. But now we can apply this to basically synchronous lasers and so on and so forth. So this is something that we're excited to do in the future. Okay, so let me just end. Maybe I want to take 10 more minutes and, and, uh, and finish my talk. Uh, what I want to point out is that uh, the story that I've told you so far is the following. If you took, uh, if you want to take away nothing except one sentence, it's that coherence is important for quantum synchronization and the discussion of quantum synchronization. What I want to do is I want to complicate the story a little bit further. So the question that we were asking in our group was, uh, what happens if you add degeneracies to the problem? 
right? Degeneracies are just things that exist in nature. So what about degeneracies? And uh, to do this, basically, I just want to I just want to point out to you. The formal theory of this uh, goes as follows. So I want to introduce to you uh, how to think about this, uh, how we think about this entire structure. So what you do is you take the uh, density uh, matrix evolution equation. So rho dot equal to rho, so this is where we all start. Uh, all the equations I've written those for Lindblad. So let's convert basically back density matrix equation. This is called the level equation, right? And so this label space uh, evolution equation is arrived at by uh, of a three bed symmetry. This is what basically is known as a uh, is known as the label mapping. Um, this will produce so I have nine elements here, so this L operator ends up being a nine by nine matrix, right? Um, and so uh, this basically um, uh, label operator will decide basically the fate of synchronization in quantum systems from an abstract point of view. So what we started. Uh, what we had done, um, so I want to basically just uh, um, uh, set up the scene here. So what we had done earlier on was worked on specific examples. Then we slowly started going towards trying to measure things from a very general quantum information theoretic perspective. And now what we are doing is essentially applying open quantum system theory to in fact even discuss what synchronization is from a very general uh, open systems theory perspective. Right. So we're trying to generalize all our understanding from uh, from all places. So from this perspective, let me just tell you that, uh, you know, so the moment I write down a linear equation with L rho, you can write a formal uh, solution for it for a time independent else. You can just say rho of t is e to the lt acting on rho zero, right? Now, um, this is basically exactly uh, uh, the solution, but uh, because L is not Hermitian, right? Remember that uh, this is already an open, so this has the blood terms in it, so L is not, uh, is not guaranteed to be Hermitian. Uh, so what happens is that complex values, and what I have drawn here is the real and imaginary part of the complex eigen spectrum, and I just want to take you through uh, level operator theory in a nutshell. So statement number one: this is the real lambda larger than zero is a disallowed region. So this is the real axis, and that's the imaginary axis. If real lambda is larger than zero, then e to the lt will just blow up, and this is just disallowed from CPTP, right? Um, now, on the imaginary axis, you can have uh, on on the left uh, half plane, you can basically have several uh, kinds of evolutions, and I want to show them off to you. So the first is something that is just a decay. So this is a real eigenvalue, but negative eigenvalue. So e to the minus alpha t acting on rho zero. So this just dies basically, right? So it's just a term where basically in the transient dynamics, you just see something that's decaying. Uh, spontaneous emission theory, blah blah blah. All of this basically, uh, you know, is, uh, sits inside examples like this. Another example is basically something uh, which uh, we understand very well as being spirals, basically. So this is something that is both has real value, which is non-zero, but also an imaginary value, which is non-zero. And notice written is created two points here, whereas on one point here. The, the reason for it is because uh, of hermeticity of density matrices, given eigenvalues, basically, uh, if they are complex, appear in complex conjugate pairs. So uh, when this appears as a plus beta that appears, and, uh, because the real values uh, is less than zero, it is decaying, but it is also spiraling as it's decaying because there's an oscillatory term here. Um, the third is basically the thing that we are really interested in is the steady state, right? So remember what I was discussing all this while. I basically said I take rho dot as L rho and then I find the steady state and then I do everything. So now we are in the abstract theory of what a steady state uh, is and how to characterize it. And so this steady state essentially something. Y axis, X axis is tight, Y axis is some arbitrary operator, and it settles down to some constant value because you've attained the steady state. And finally, you have something that's called an oscillating coherence. And oscillating coherences are basically zero real eigenvalues, but non zero imaginary values. And what it does is the spectrum oscillates up and down. And um, so with this, basically, I can point out to you what uh, um, Liable operator says about synchronization. And, um, this is a print that is under review right now. Uh, what it basically is telling that the way to think about quantum synchronization is that um, uh, is that off diagonals uh, are generated basically in the Hamiltonian eigenbase, which means the develop. So what you what you need is basically something limits diagonals in the eigen uh, in the Hamiltonian base, and this basically. Uh, 
three state with uh, zero real, real, zero imaginary, but with the uh, with the condition that the eigenvector becomes coherent, it becomes off diagonal. Right? Which is also very interesting and which basically is in the literature, uh, which is basically where the imaginary eigenvalues do something basically. And so uh, we differentiate basically phase space space or phase coherent space, uh, coherence, oscillating coherent synchronization, which basically is coherent synchronization. And I think these two are basically important parts of uh, the literature, which we will discuss as we go on. Okay. So with that, let me just highlight to you what we did in, in that paper with Parvinder. Um, and, uh, and I just uh, then can conclude the talk. Uh, so what we did was we considered a formal level uh, theory, basically, so rho dot is in level space, I'm now writing L0 plus epsilon LD. So this, this is like applying a perturbative drive on my quantum system. A Hamiltonian, but we we considered all cases, but in, you know, for just for brevity now, let's consider the Hamiltonian perturbation. So what we pointed out was by doing basically a uh, level operator perturbation theory, which is, you know, you have to do it uh, slightly carefully because these label operators are not invertible. So you have to use more Penrose pseudo inverses, which I indicate by this plus sign here. What we showed was basically that calculate first order function to the, uh, uh, to the bare eigenvalue. So remember that the zero state is when you don't drive, and this is just a limit cycle. Right? That's what I, we just discussed. So the first order connection basically uh, we calculated and we pointed out that uh, the real question that we're asking is, is this coherent? Because everything has to be perturbative in, uh, in uh, synchronization. And well, uh, what we pointed out was that it actually depends on degeneracies, and there is a lot that can be said about whether or not it is uh, it is coherent, um, and along with basically some energy conserving conditions and so on and so forth. Okay, so with that, let me just flash one more picture, and then I come. The picture is basically the example that I implied in the uh, in the outline section. Now, what is two so uh, zero one uh, one two three one two three. A and B, they are basically offset with respect, and they are both basically coupled uh, by some drive strength uh, epsilon. Now, if you want the detailed delta offset, uh, sorry, let me be let me show you what. So this is one and zero. Okay, this is epsilon uh, is omega capital omega. Energy cap between this and this, and this uh, is capital omega. The energy gap between this and this is one, it is zero. So what is delta zero? This is energy conserving. If manner this, it's energy conserving. Likewise, what the delta does is it spoils that energy conservation. It says transitions here which are okay so this is the story if you look at the synchronization measure what happens is that the synchronization measure again produces an arnold tongue no surprise there because we set the whole thing to be synchronous but what happens the period power output actually uh, has a kind of little reveal something more complicated and the thing that it reveals is basically the degeneracies are playing us so remember what i just said zero there is actually in the tensor product Hilbert space, there is actually a degeneracy. And this degeneracy, what it basically means is that there's an energy conservation that you can perform. And that conservation is very high amount here because there's a lot of coherence being exchanged. But coherence in a degenerate subspace doesn't cost any energy. So it doesn't show up in the thermodynamics. So this basically clarifies to us, and we're learning more as we go. This basically clarifies to us that synchronization does tell a lot of the story, but not all of the story. And in fact, you have to look at synchronization and thermodynamics um, with, you know, through the eyes of degeneracies of the eigen spectrum, and then you basically have a real good understanding of what is happening. Okay. Um, okay. With that, let me conclude this talk um, by first acknowledging the thing that all of us know, which is it's just not the same over Zoom. Um, and uh, I conclude by basically just pointing out uh, the takeaways, which is that synchronization in the quantum regime has been discussed over the last, you know, six, seven, eight years. And I think this is very interesting also because of the upcoming experiments in optomechanics and uh, nanomechanics that are already here, and there are many more that are coming up. Um, the phase space based measures versus coherent space based measures, I've, I've discussed them. 
Um, and, you know, and also I've introduced hopefully to you some flavor of the quantitative measures uh, to study synchronization. Um, you know, what we did was we basically tried to apply this to essentially applications because, see, the whole point about synchronization is that it's application oriented. And so, um, and so we applied this to thermal machines and, uh, and understood a lot about degeneracies and the relationship of synchronization degeneracies and thermal machinery. Um, this, of course, impacts, um, you know, uh, the future design of engines, of sensors and so on and so forth with vast stability regions where you can operate them kind of, you know, detuned from each other and so on and so forth. So for inhomogeneously broadened atoms, so on and so forth, I think this will be a great platform for us to kind of discuss future quantum technologies. So let me just uh, thank you and also thank my uh, collaborators um, uh, who work on this. So Samir uh, was an undergraduate with us who worked on the squeezing paper. Uh, now is uh, was with Anil's group and uh, and with us, and now he's in uh, ICER uh, Bhunishwar. He's worked on several of the papers that I pointed out. Uh, Parvinder is doing his PhD with us, and he's worked on several of the papers that are pointed uh, that are discussed today. And my long-term collaborator, um, who's uh, uh, in K now uh, in Japan, uh, Quek, who's in CKT, Mars, who's in CKT, Rako, who's in Oxford in CKT, and uh, Saro, who's in ICTP. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. I'll just go back to the conclusion slide. Uh, thanks, Sai, for uh, such a wonderful talk, which was in some sense really complete that you started with a very simple example, <laughs> show that what it is, and then you... Uh, completed the picture with all the quantum mechanical ideas. So now the uh, the talk is uh, open for the questions. Uh, is there? Uh, Shashi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is a question by <clears throat> by somebody, Govind Kumar, which is open in chat. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Ask that just, just. Yeah, Sai, I, um, there's a question from Govind Kumar. Uh, he's asking, what is the difference between classical and quantum synchronization? And if a system has both type of synchronization present, then which synchronization takes precedence in some sense? Yeah, so let's first answer the second question, which is basically, I would approach the problem by using the usual action over H bar um, criterion to decide whether I'm the quantum regime or classical regime. So if I have a you know potentially quantum system, but that's very high action, then it's irrelevant. I mean, the quantum mechanics of it is irrelevant, and so we can just ignore it. So that answers, I think, the question. You just have to look at action over H bar and decide what system you're in. So uh, let me say, I think the question is actually more relevant, uh, you know, very, very relevant. It's a great question. The point is that classical synchronization, we understand very intuitively. I mean, this all goes back to the same point about classical mechanics versus quantum, which is quantum. You have to measure to understand where the quantum system is, right? And so classical mechanics, because it doesn't, you know, it's uh, their degrees of freedom that are observed, they're not measured. Um, you know, we understand the adjustment of rhythms and, and you know, it's very complicated nonlinear dynamics, but we understand what it is. Uh, on. So the way quantum mechanics uh, kind of complicates the affair is basically by setting up this kind of limit cycle that has to be observable, which means that you get into this gauge degree of freedom business, you know, you immediately get into kind of some of the weeds of quantum mechanics. So the 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 discussion of uh, synchronization in this uh, work is basically that uh, you have to have uh, phase space based measures of synchronization. What it means is I take my quantum system, I first have to agree that the undriven unperturbed dynamics is actually limit cycle dynamics. I have to first agree on this. Uh, I have to first demonstrate this. Once I demonstrate it, then I have to, um, then I have to drive it and show that uh, the drive localizes uh, the phase that I have implied. And so, uh, and so this is the kind of path that you have to take to synchronization. So it's a little bit different. It's not completely straightforward one-to-one -one with uh, classical synchronization. And you can imagine why, because there are many kind of ways in which you can approach quantum, basically. So, um, is there any other question? Okay, uh, Sai, there is just a kind of information that I was um, uh, looking for that. Uh, is this Arnold tongue that you were kind of uh, mentioning? Uh, uh, is that, does it, does it have any connection with the, what we discuss in class uh, for uh, Hamiltonian systems? I mean, is it the same or not tongue that we talk about in higher dimensional systems? I, 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 pre I presume Sudhir is shaking his head. So, 
<laughs> I have a good. I have a. I I presume. Yeah. I've I've only ever studied okay. these dissipative systems, but okay. you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to continue with that, uh, so is uh, is like dissipation kind of a necessary thing? Can we ever see uh, like in part of the uh, closed system uh, the synchronization? Yeah. So the problem is that okay so this becomes a complicated it's uh, so if you look in our latest preprint there's actually a whole column where we basically talk about the stuff so the this becomes a complicated issue the the problem is the following which is you need an existing underlying limit cycle to basically make conversation right mm -hmm. typically hamiltonian systems will have centers right but you know, so you can take a harmonic yeah. oscillator and you can couple several harmonic oscillators and you can make a discussion of what happens when you couple them. So, you know, so depending on how strictly you want to interpret what synchronization is, right, you get basically a variety of either yeses or noes or conditional statements. So, um, even when we tried probing this in the literature, so we went back and looked at classical literature, just classical dynamics, classical NLD. What do people mean when they say synchronization, you know, and you can find, I can show you Shashi offline. Uh, you can find classical Hamiltonian uh, couple dynamics being described as synchronized with, within quotes. Right. I, I must say, I only partially understand what they even mean by it. You know, um, so the, so let me again, kind of restate the, my point about this and, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, experts can, we can discuss this. My point is basically you need to have, uh, you need to have stability in the radial direction. Right, which means that if you perturb off of the limit cycle, stable limit cycle, you have to fall back into it. Right, so this is the difference that I'm trying to point out between centers versus limit cycles. So a lot of physical systems that basically where we have seen both quantum and classical. So let me now add quantum back into the picture, both quantum and classical, where people make a comment about synchronization, but use the word loosely, you know, um, uh, you know, is basically where they actually have the underlying object is centers. They're not actually limit cycles. And the moment you're coupling centers, the discussion becomes a little bit more subtle and complicated. It's not that it's not interesting, but whether it is technical synchronization, I, you know, I don't, I haven't read all of Pikovsky, so I will, you know, I will revert my authority to you know. uh, Thanks, uh, Shai. Yeah. Uh, so I think sir. Sudhir had a question. He had, he, the hand was in an upward trajectory when you started asking something. Oh, yeah. Uh, so please go ahead. No, I uh, again not not very deep or something very uh, relevant, but just that in some of this work on synchronization, um, when you say that you want the system to fall back in the, in the radial direction, mm -hmm. and and it can then go along on the angular direction, it reminds me of of very uh, typical setting where you have a contracting direction, which is radial, and you have an expanding direction, which is angular. So if you can arrange that in whatever way you want, from an initial distribution function or a phase space representation way of a density operator, if you can arrange these two things, that there is a contracting direction along radial and, con and contracting direction is radial, and expanding direction is angular, then I think you can almost always uh, manage. Manage what? Sorry, if manage your contracting direction is radial, you'll always fall into the in, into the center of the. You'll go to the origin, right? No, no. If it is so, if it is contracting, if it is if your contracting direction is radial, uh, and your expanding direction is angular, then you are, it's possible that you uh, you increase the radial direction. And you're like R minus R naught to the power some positive. So you keep falling around R naught, but the expanding direction is angular. So you go around on the angle. So you make a thing like that, you go around. So is, is that is that possible? Because that happens we in can many discuss offline because, so deep, because my worry is that if you're if you're contracting, so let me just forget what the angular direction is doing for a moment. If R, R, if you're contracting towards R naught, then the asymptotics is R naught, which means you don't have any, you don't have anything interesting. There. I mean, you don't have a limit cycle there, right? 
the other way around is maybe even is is something that I, you know so this is so what i'm saying this is this is like a spiral right so your r is going inwards but your your theta is doing something has right. non zero dynamics right and spirals will just fall into the center, into the into the origin they won't do anything you know so transient dynamics is is there but there is no steady state dynamics right mm -hmm. yeah yes. okay uh, okay any other it, question uh, so i can't see any raised hand um so let's thank uh, sai once again for a uh, wonderful much. talk and uh, with this, we come to the uh, end of this session. And uh, thank you all for. And I think we are uh, <laughs> meeting back at two thirty. Uh, mm -hmm. So see you yes, then. Uh, yeah, so it, it's it's a it gives me great pleasure to thank uh, Dr. Shashi Srivastav to agree to chair this session and do a wonderful job. My great friends. Santanam for ages and ages, and Sai also, who is not so ages, but okay, still. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I thank all of you guys uh, doing great job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shashi. Thanks. So two thirty. We need two thirty.
Uh, so good afternoon. And uh, uh, we have this uh, afternoon session, the first session now, uh, where I have the great pleasure to invite Dr. Gopal Joshi to kindly chair the session. Uh, Dr. Joshi. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zain. Thank you, Professor Zain. Thank you. Uh, so shall, shall we start or wait for a few minutes, sir? I think we wait for if let's wait for five minutes. I think there are people still joining. Yeah, please. Okay. I think can I be coffee come low again? Hanji, Hanji, Hanji. I have this tendency yeah, of immediately. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> no, because, uh, yes. ah, we can ask Rakesh to uh, yeah. try kar sakte ho, presentation. Theek se dikh rahi hai yes, sir. I'll try. हाँ <laughs> Jen sir, could we start now? Uh, yes, sir. yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in this session, we have two talks. The first one is by Professor Rakesh Kumar Saini. He is with the Department of Physics at the Central University of Rajasthan. Professor Saini did his integrated MSc in Physics at University of Mumbai DAE Center of Excellence in Basic Sciences and PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, he is engaged in research in theoretical quantum condensed matter physics using analytical and numerical methods. He has recently worked on a project titled Protection of Qubits by Nonlinear Resonances, where he has worked with Professor Sudhir Jain. Uh, and he will be delivering the talk on the same topic. Yeah. So, floor is yours, Professor Saini. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, sorry, sir, you got the wrong Rakesh. I am not a professor, I'm just a student. I just passed yeah. my MS. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I got from that. Yeah, this okay. Uh, so you you are you are you are from UMDA CBS yeah CBS hmm. and uh, you have 
uh, work with Professor Jain on this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk on this platform. So today I'm going to talk about the protection of qubits by nonlinear resonances. And I've done this work with uh, in, in the collaboration of Raman Sagal and Professor Suryu Jain from BRC Mumbai. So in the overview of this talk, first I'm going to introduce what are the nonlinear resonances that we talk about and how they provide the protection. And then in the example of qubits, and for the example of qubits, we are going to take transforms, which are the workhorse of uh, superconducting quantum computation. And another example, we will take a zero pi qubit, which are supposed to be so-called uh, fault tolerant qubit. And then we are going to compare the results of transform and zero pi qubit. And comparing these results, we are going to provide the criteria for the protection of these qubits using our analysis. And then we are going to conclude the session and also uh, provide some future aspects of the these criteria or the application of these criteria. Now, so what do we mean by these nonlinear resonances? So, for example, if we take a transform qubit, so transform qubit has the same Hamiltonian uh, in classical sense as the pendulum for pendulum Hamiltonian. So, this is as we know, pendulum is a nonlinear system because it has cos phi or cos x. Uh, potential and it's a nonlinear uh, potential and also we it is an integrable system uh, on its own so a transform is an integrable system on its own but we are more interested in do the interaction of multiple qubits because that's where the computation takes place so we are going to see how two transform interacts or uh, what the coupling of these two separately integrable systems if we couple them using some perturbation or some coupling them how that is going to affect the dynamics or the phase space of the whole system, whole Hamiltonian. So these systems, which are uh, coupled uh, nonlinear um, integrable systems, so these systems are, if they are part of, these are described by the KM system. So Kolmogorov or no Moser system. And the theorem provides the basis for the, uh, that there exists invariant curves in the KM systems. So, and if these integrable systems are part of, then the, these invariant curves. So, for example, if there are two coupled systems, the invariant curve can be invariant or i in the phase space. So, if these integrable systems are part of, then it, these invariant curves are deformed. Now, what do we mean by nonlinear resonances? So, with these uh, coupled systems, if there are phase or there are angles, there are going to be frequencies which are the derivative, time derivative of those uh, angles. So d phi by dt will be the frequency. Now, if there are two systems, so there will be two two different frequencies. So if the ratios of those frequencies are uh, the ratios of these two frequencies are rational, then that is there is going to be a resonance. But if the frequency depends on the action variable, frequency is a function of the action variable, then these systems are called nonlinear systems. So when uh, these are nonlinear systems and when the resonance occurs when the frequency depends on the function uh, action variable and the ratios of these frequencies are uh, rational then the nonlinear resonances occurs so what happens in nonlinear resonances these invariant curves or invariant ori breaks near resonance so now overall if you look at the phase space in terms of when the perturbation occurs in these integrable systems so what happens is that these invariant curve uh, Torize or invariant KM curves breaks such that it rates in the, such a way that there appears a succession of stable points and the unstable points. So elliptic points or hyperbolic points, which we can see in this picture. So there are elliptic points. So this is kind of an enveloped region uh, around elliptic points, which is surrounded by the hyperbolic point and then elliptic point, then hyperbolic point. So these are the succession of points. So we get this kind of an enveloped region. So if our system resides near these elliptic points, then we are going to get uh, some protection against the external disturbances. Now, till now, we have been just talking in terms of uh, classical phase space, how we approach from the classical to semi-classical to quantum region. So for this classical phase space, we uh, to take the estimation of the tunneling probability using the semi-classical system. So for that, we calculate the adiabatic invariant of these Hamiltonians and then integrate over the adiabatic invariant, which gives us the tunneling probability 
of any of the disturbance uh, coming inside these regions. So this, whatever the perturbation has to come, come through these hyperbolic points. Now, uh, we estimate uh, using the semi-classical methods. And after that, because our system is going from integral, integrable to the non-integrable, there is bound to be some, some uh, amount of chaos in the system. So that quantum chaos can be analyzed using the looking at the spacing uh, level spacing distribution and the ratios of the ne neighbor uh, nearest neighbor and the next nearest neighbor level distribution so that also we are going to see in the further slide so here we are taking the transform qubit uh, hamiltonian which looks like this as we do so this is the same hamiltonian as in terms of the pendulum so these and these number operator and the phi operator has the same uh, Commuted, commutation relation as the action angle variable. So we are going to treat them like one. So for he, here, we are taking the inductive coupling between the two transform qubits. So there are uh, Hamiltonian for the two transform qubits and they are coupled using the this uh, uh, inductively coupled, uh, coupled term, which is M12 IC1, sine phi1 and sine phi2. Now, because there are two angle variables, phi1 and phi2, there is there are going to be two different frequencies, which is d phi1 by dt and d phi2 by dt. So now when does the resonance occur as we have said the so when does the resonance occur so resonance occurs uh, when the ratios of these two frequencies are rational so that will be m omega 1 minus n omega 2 where m and n are integers so omega 1 is d phi 1 by dt omega 2 is d phi 2 by dt to calculate these d phi 1 by dt we can use the Hamiltonian which is the uh, different uh, partial derivative of the conjugate variable, which is n1 for phi1 and n2 for phi2. So this should be equal to the zero. So we get this resonance condition. So after getting this resonance condition, we are going to make a canonical transformation. Now, why? So why are we making canonical transformation that I'm going to explain in the further slide, but we are making canonical transformation between two angle variables, n1 and n2, two action variables between n1 and n2 to r and j and phi1, phi2, into phi and psi. So the generating function to make this canonical transformation is this W and the transformation equation looks like this. Now this phi variable looks familiar because it has m phi one minus m phi two. So if we take derivative of this phi, it will be d phi by dt will be equal to d m d phi one by dt and then d phi two by dt, which is, if you remember, it is exactly equal to the this uh, equation. So near resonance, what will happen? This will go to equal to zero, which means phi will become almost constant near resonance. At resonance, it will be constant. Near resonance, it will become almost constant. Constant. So it is a slow variable, and psi will be a fast variable in this term. Now we write the resonance condition in these new variables r, j, phi, and psi term. Also write the new Hamiltonian in these new r, j, phi, psi variables. Now there are two variables, fast and slow. So near resonance, we will integrate over the fast variable. So if we integrate over psi, the Hamiltonian will be integrated over the psi. So the corresponding conjugate variable, which is j, will become the constant of motion. So what we essentially did uh, through all these canonical transformation, that we had four phase uh, uh, space for four variables, n1, n2, phi, and psi. We have reduced it to two variables only, r, r and phi. So for instead of four dimensional, we have went to the two dimensional space near resonance. And that's what matters because when there's a, according to KM theorem, when we part of the system, the system is going to reside near resonance only most of the time, which is the on, also primary, near primary resonance. Now we are going to make one more small but uh, canonical transformation between R and phi to P and phi, where P is nothing but R minus R resonance, because we are, we are looking at the perturbation from the resonance because we are looking near resonance. So P will be just R minus R resonance. So we are looking what how, how much amount of the perturbation there is in the action variable. So we get this resonance. So we get this Hamiltonian near resonance, where in terms of P, J, and Phi, where J is the constant of motion because we have integrated over psi already. Now we take the parameter given in this paper and we try to plot the one comma one primary resonance for different different values of the uh, coupling so beta 1 2 is the coupling here m 1 2 ic 1 and ic 2 so if we take the coupling very very small which means the system are almost integrable in that case 
we don't get any kind of envelope of region because the system are already integrable. So there is no uh, envelope region near resonance. So this is the phase space for beta 1 to 0 0.001. But if we increase the coupling significantly in between the two transform qubits, then we get the succession of these elliptic points and the hyperbolic points. So we get this kind of envelope region. And to see this, how our wave function resides inside this, I plotted the corresponding wave function for ground state and the first excited state on the network. Now, psi square, you might wonder why psi square is negative because it is plotted over the potential of this Hamiltonian. So the potential is negative. So here it is kind of an just uh, demonstration how the wave function looks over the potential. Now, from the classical point of view, if we are going to take the estimation of what is the probability of the disturbance to come inside, and what should be the intensity of the disturbance. So the external disturbance might, might have some intensity or the energy of the external disturbance. So that energy is plotted against the tunneling probability, which is calculated using this paper, Tennyson and Carey's paper. So we have taken the adiabatic invariant, which is P in this condition, and then integrated over different, different energies over this phi, over this slow variable. And then we calculated the probability for the different different cases, and this comes out to be like this. So, tunneling probability increases after a significantly increases after we increase the uh, noise, the intensity of the noise after a point of time. Now, from semi-classical to the quantum regime. So, because we are going from integrable to non-integrability, so there is going to be some amount of chaos. So that chaos can be seen through the spectral fluctuation analysis. So we have taken the energy levels, uh, calculated the eigen energies of uh, 10,000 levels for this inductively coupled case. And then we have plotted for beta 1 to equal for, this is almost an integrable system. So these, the spacing distribution and the ratio of nearest neighbor level spacing and the next nearest neighbor level spacing is looks like the Poissonian distribution, whereas there's some shift in terms of when we increase the coupling between the two transforms. So we are going to see some crossover distribution because this is not completely chaotic system, but this is not either completely integrable system. So we are going to see some quasi integrable system or the mid chaos in the system. So we have calculated the, uh, we have fitted the crossover distribution and the broadening distribution in terms of the spacing distribution which comes out the values parameter for which comes out to be nearly identical. For example, in crossover distribution, if gamma, some parameter is equal to zero, then that is Poissonian distribution. And if it is equal to one, then that means that it's GOE distribution, but it comes out to be the 0.2 or the 20% chaos can be estimated. So after that, we look at the, we, to compare it, uh, we look at the zero pi qubit. For that, we take two mode Hamiltonian, phi and theta Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian for the zero pi qubit for two mode Hamiltonian. Now, instead of, now we are going to follow the exact same procedure that we did. Instead of phi one and phi two, here we have theta and phi. So frequencies will be d theta by dt and d phi by dt. And then uh, instead of action variable n1 and n2, we have n theta and n phi. So we are going to follow the same procedure. We are going to do canonical transform. First, we are going to calculate the resonance condition, which will mean m omega one minus n omega two, m d theta by dt minus n d phi by dt. And then the resonance, uh, we are going to integrate over these. First, we are going to make canonical transformation between n theta, n phi, theta and phi to uh, r, j, capital phi and psi. Then we are going to integrate over the psi, which is a fast variable and only the slow variable will remain inside the Hamiltonian. So the resonant Hamiltonian we get in this uh, case is looks like this. And after that, we have taken the parameter from the experimental realization of zero pi qubit, and we have taken the experimental parameter itself and plotted the uh, primary resonance for m comma n equal to one comma one. For pi external equal to zero, we get an elliptic point at the center and then hyperbolic point and then the elliptic point. For phi external equal to pi, we get a hyperbolic point at phi equal to zero, then elliptic point, then hyperbolic point. Now this can be exactly seen if we plot the wave function of this Hamiltonian. Here we can see the uh, elliptic points, and then here we can see the hyperbolic point. Similarly, at phi equal to zero, we can see elliptic point, and phi equal to pi, we can see the hyperbolic point. And we I plotted the wave function over 
So this is the ground state wave function. This is the first excited state, then second, then third. So we here we can see how the wave function resides inside these uh, elliptic points. Now uh, we have to see what are the spectral fluctuations. What are what does the spectral fluctuation look like in the case of zero pi qubits? So so what does the spectral fluctuation looks in the case of zero pi qubit? So in the case of pi external equal to zero and pi external equal to pi, for both cases, the spacing level spacing distribution and the ratios of the level spacing distribution and the next nearest neighbor, the ratios of the next nearest neighbor level spacing distribution all comes out to be nearly Poissonian or so the criteria using these both examples, we are going to propose that the systems uh, we which we for Hamiltonian, the system that we have to take should be KM system because there should be some kind of non-linearity or non-integrability which provides these kind of islands, which provides the stability for the system to stay there. So if they are KM system or quasi-integrable system, so if they are integrable system and we put some perturbation in the system, so they are going to be KM system. So the perturbation should be classically, uh, should be smooth. And if in this KM system, uh, near resonance or primary resonances, there will exist the hierarchy of these islets of stability. So there will be elliptic points, which will be a kind of an envelope or kind of a separate island, which will be surrounded by the hyperbolic points, which are the unstable points. Now, if our system resides near these, uh, res these elliptic points, then whatever the external disturbance ha has to uh, tunnel through those hyperbolic points to come inside these envelopes. And that tunneling probability, as we have calculated, has to be the intensity of the noise has to be really higher to tunnel inside the point. So we can choose the parameters of our systems using uh, such that wherever we want to place our system, so we can look at the phase space and then we can tune our parameter accordingly wherever we want our system to reside and then calculate the tunneling probability and whatever what is the intensity of the noise that we want to avoid so we can tune the parameter accordingly that also and now this is like a, a give and take uh, situation so we are using the non integrability for the protection of our qubits but non integrability comes at the cost of the chaos so that chaos could be seen through the nearest neighbor level spacing distribution so what do we want from our system so we want to be in the balance of the uh, non-integrability. So we'll have this kind of an island, but also we want our system to reside near the uh, Poissonian distribution. Because if there's chaos, complete chaos in the system, then there's no meaning of getting the stability from any of the non-integrability. Because then if we measure the system, the uh, measurement results are going to be completely chaotic. So there should be, uh, there will be an level repression if there's a chaos in the system. So we have to minimize the chaos or as well as we have to get at the level of non-integrability where our system can get the protection. And in case of the difference between these phase spaces of zero pi qubit and the inductively coupled case, here the phase space is completely open. So if we increase the phi, the same pattern is going to repeat. So if we increase the noise, the noise is going to be all around in the phase space and everywhere. So the noise can tunnel through from any of these trajectories. But the crucial thing in the phase space of this uh, zero pi qubit is that it is completely compact. So if we increase the phi, there's not going to be the open uh, phase space. So the no amount of noise can tunnel through outside of these region. So these are, these are the criteria that we propose based on these results, different results for the inductively coupled case and the phase space and the phase space of the zero pi qubit. Now, what we conclude is that the circuits or the more in more general sense, the Hamiltonian should be designed, keeping in the mind that the phase space dynamics, because uh, yesterday, as we have seen, if we want to look at the dynamics of the zero pi qubit, we usually take the potential and then infer from the potential, but potential cannot give the complete idea or the complete dynamics of the how the phase space is going to evolve so that only we are going to get if we look at the phase space only so this approach will be advantageous in terms of 
describing the dynamics of the system over other approaches like inferring from the putting looking at just the potential now the central philosophy of this paper was to attain the balance as i said between the intensity of the perturbation because that is going to decide what amount of non integrability will be in the system so this intensity of the perturbation should be strong enough to create the island of stability or the create the island of these non linear resonances while keeping our system at the edge of chaos so chaos should not if the our system to become a, uh, the level spacing distribution becomes equal to geo then the, the the stability of these islands is gone thank you given for your attention any question uh, thank you thank you akesh for a very nice uh, and clear presentation uh, if we have, we have time for questions let uh, please uh, the floor is open for uh, questions Hello, Rakesh. This is Garima. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, hmm. How can we protect these qubits from non by nonlinear resonances? How these nonlinear resonances protect the qubit? Okay. So what we are essentially saying is that if there are nonlinear resonances in the system, so as we see here, if there are nonlinear resonances in the system, then Poincaré-Barkov theorem states that when there's a when integrable systems are part up with uh, some perturbation or some coupling in the system there are going to be succession of these elliptic and hyperbolic ones so if there's some external disturbance in the system like in the phase space it has to go through or tunnel through these hyperbolic points so we get these kind of an island surrounded by the sea of this chaos so these are the islands of stability so if our system or the wave function will reside here then it is protected against uh, that external disturbance because those has to tunnel through these hyperbolic points to get to perturb our system or to affect our system and for that to tunnel we have to calculate the tunneling probability uh, using the adiabatic invariant so that tunneling probability for that uh, the intensity of the noise should be really high so we can tune these coupling parameters in terms of how much of noise how much of the intensity of noise we want to prevent from getting inside the couple couple inside these non uh, what what kind of noise it will you know provide protection against so currently uh, we are talking in general terms we have not looked uh, at the specific noises like dephasing noise or the deco uh, like a uh, like different kind of noises so that evaluation we have to do that what kind of protection they are going to provide so as we have seen in uh, last talk of jensko that he said that uh, these uh, in the coupled uh, transforms only provide noise against the dephasing noise and not the other kind of noise depolarizing noise and the uh, zero pi qubit provides the protection against both so we have to check that in terms of our phase space classical phase space okay uh, are there any more questions please yes uh, hi rakesh uh, am audible yeah yeah, yeah 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 how do you how do you uh, calculate these tunneling probabilities i can so to calculate so to calculate these tunnel probabilities we have this hamiltonian so here this action variable acts as an adiabatic invariant so we can you please go to the screen because uh, the processing the interfering we okay. can't see it so near these uh, resonant hamiltonian if you have to calculate the tunnel probability we take this adiabatic invariant which is p in this case 
and take the exponential of this p and integrate it over the slow variable slow variable but this limit of phi 1 and phi 2 is decided by these elliptical hyperbolic ones for that for every energy for every hamiltonian we will get a integer value uh, sorry for every hamiltonian we get a real value and that real value is plotted for every value of this energy can you can you uh, please go to the face face diagram which you were showing the uh, yeah. this one so so here i i actually am not able to understand this uh, diagram better can you uh, the one below this one so so yeah. on the positive for positive y axis and the negative y axis the sign changes right oh that is because uh, this if we plot the phase space this p is the under root of h minus all this beta 1 2 and phi so the under root will be plus minus so the trajectories will be one over above and one will be minus p trajectory and one will be plus p trajectory. so there will be different trajectories correct no the they one are, above or below yeah. or they are the same trajectories just with a different they are the what, same what trajectories but the color is got different because in mathematica when i plotted the plus p and minus p separately they had different colors but they are the so, same so trajectory this... This negative sign does not have a physics implication. No, it has because that's that's how we make the limit cycles, right? Yeah. Otherwise, this phase space will be just in above. So it is like P is like a uh, momentum. So if you think in terms of momentum, right. this is like the, in the plus x direction and minus P is in the minus x direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, 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 okay. How close are these to the experiment? How so, have you made sure that these are uh, close to experiments? So for every calculation and for every plot, we have taken data from the experimental papers only. Now we have proposed the criteria, but we have not checked for like or any proposed any new Hamiltonian. So that we have to see in the future aspect. So we have checked for the uh, different different couplings of transmute with, and it provides the similar data, which is shown in the like for example of inductively coupled transmute as we know it provides protection against some qubit some noise but not all the noises here we can see because the whole phase space is open so it will provide because there are islands so it will provide the stability against some kind of noises but not all kind of noises whereas in the zero pi qubit the phase space is completely compact so it will provide the stability against all kind of noises so which we can intuitively see from here also Mm, I see, I see. So, if there are no more questions, then uh, you may. Uh, thank the speaker and uh, a round of applause. And uh, sorry, Rakit, for being over jealous in my search, but the striking, the similarity is striking, though, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very good. Uh, okay, our next uh, speaker is uh, eminent scholar, uh, Professor Anur Kumar Pati. Presently, Professor Pati is with Harish Chandra uh, Research Center, uh, Research Institute, uh, Allahabad. Prior to that, he was with the Theoretical Physics Division, BARC. Um, Dr. Joshi, yes, uh, please. I have to just say one thing that uh, due to uh, certain personal reasons, uh, Arun Pati will join only at 3.15. Oh, oh, achha, achha, achha. oh I'm sorry. Uh, so, Gap in 15 minutes. Ka. Ha, ha, ha. Achha, achha, achha. Oh, so we have a break now. Okay, no we problem. A, we'll just wait for because he has some. Uh, some oh, no problem. Right, sorry, sorry. I thought there will be a continuation with the thing. No, no problem. No, I, we are there. We are there. Yes. I think I'm going to ask you a 
पिछली बार आपने बुलाया था हाँ लेकिन मैं शायद समय अवेलेबल नहीं था कहीं गया था बहुत डिसअपॉइंटिंग था ओके जिस को लेकिन हाँ ये प्रिपेयर नहीं बाकी जो उन्हें बाकी लोग बहुत अनफेयर क्यों नहीं हाँ सी इफ एट द सेम लेवल अ फॉरेनर कम्स ना हाँ उनके जूते चाट रहे हमने हाँ ये सारे हाँ हाँ ये हमारे लोगों के मेंटेन हाँ नहीं हाँ थर्ड क्लास लोग हैं क्या मतलब क्या होगा तो ना दे वर ट्रीटिंग हम लाइक स्टूडेंट ये आपने कहा है कि ये आपको आता है हेलो हाँ
Hi, Arun. Great to see you. Hi. Uh, ah. Nice, Professor Patil. Nice, Sudhir. <laughs> ah, Joshi, now we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, ah, so, yeah, great to, to see Professor Pati. I, uh, our, he's our next speaker. He's an eminent scholar uh, and uh, he's presently with the Harish Chandra Research Institute, Allahabad. Uh, prior to that, he was with the Theoretical Physics Division, BARC, from, right from 1989 to 2010. Uh, Professor Pati's research in area, areas include all aspects of quantum information and quantum computation, the theory of uh, geometrical phases and its applications, and the foundations of quantum mechanics. Professor Pati is credited with a number of discoveries, including no deletion theorem, no hiding theorem, stronger uncertainty relation in quantum mechanics to name a few. Today he will be delivering his talk on non-commutivity, coherence and disturbance. Uh, Sir Pati, the floor is all yours, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Joshi. So, <clears throat> so first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers, especially uh, Professor Sudhir Jain for organizing this uh, conference and inviting me. Uh, so it is a pleasure to be speaking on this occasion. Are you able to hear me? Uh -huh, yes, yes, so yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah, so let me start sharing my screen. Uh, Okay, so uh, I don't see option to make full screen. So is it okay? This uh, this is okay. Abhi dikh nahi raha hai. Abhi aaya nahi hai. Ha, we we can't see anything so far, Professor. Abhi screen uh, dark hai. Uh -huh. uh, I already shared my screen. Why it is showing dark? Uh,
So let me stop and start again. Can you see now? Are you able to see? Nay, a bee, nay, could be due to very, some network issue. Ah, is it a very big file? Uh, not very big, PDF file. Uh, nay, but see, it should be, it should be fine. It will come perhaps. Your PDF file, eh? PDF file. Uh, uh, Who well, Sai is saying that you should share one, the whole one point one point four MB? No, no, this is nothing. This is fine. Uh, Sai has a suggestion. Sai is uh, saying, Sai is saying that. Let me read it. Uh, where is Sai? It shows Sai you are sharing the screen. You should share the. You should share the whole screen. And not the PDF application. Uh huh. Niche share hoga na? Niche? Ah, share to kya hai? I, I did that. It is showing that you are sharing the screen. So. Now, can you see? Now. Uh -huh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Now. Okay, very good. Now we can see. Uh, Side okay, so I'm going. Control L कर सकते हो. Control L. No, not working. Okay. Uh, Fine. You can close the side panel. Huh? This is the presentation के right yes. hand is to क्या उसको minimize कर दो उस वाले को. I minimize क्या है? Okay, fine. So can you see now? Yes, we can. So, so I'm going to talk today uh, non competitivity coherence and disturbance, and uh, myself uh, from Quantum Information Competition Group at HRI Allahabad. So, what I will try to do today is I will tell uh, some recent results and uh, uh, and uh, some results that we have. Uh, been working over the last couple of years. Uh, they're not going down. Okay, like this. So, not page by page. Okay, so, so we know, all of we know that in quantum mechanics, one of the key features that demarcates it from a uh, classical world is your famous uh, quantum superposition principle, which is essentially telling you the following, that if you have two or more possible states, which is allowed by, by your physical system, then it is also possible for you to have a scenario where you can have a linear combination of all those possible states. Okay, So this is, uh, this is essentially the meaning of quantum superposition. So that means if psi 1, psi 2 are two allowed states for a physical system, then you can have a combination of psi 1 plus psi 2 with this amplitude alpha 1, alpha 2. And how do you create this superposition? I will come to that in a minute. And essentially, uh, this came because People thought that okay, like uh, the Broglie's hypothesis suggested that particles should behave both like wave and particle, and that led to quantum interference. And quantum interference led to the idea that when a particle goes through both the slit, it should somehow create this quantum superposition. So, so this is a cartoon where a photon doesn't know its own identity, and as some of you know, this quantum superposition it contains all the mystery in quantum mechanics. So this is very famous quotation by Richard Feynman, which tells you that this is a phenomenon which is impossible, absolutely impossible to explain in any classical way and which has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. In reality, it contain, contains the only mystery. And what I will try to convey 
uh, during an end of my talk today is that this mystery still continues and uh, the remote to it what we know till now so this is your famous young cover sheet setup where you have a source and you two slit and you send particles one by one and you put a screen behind this double street and you wait long enough and at the end of the day or maybe you wait several days then you will see that there is a pattern will look like this and how do you explain this you say that okay there is an amplitude for the particle going through both the slit and at any point on the screen the amplitude should be linear combination of the amplitude coming from both the slit which is essentially psi is i1 plus i2 and and this is your quantum interference um term essentially which contains this real part of psi1 star psi2 and this quantum interference continues to be you know um, one of the one of the biggest mystery in quantum mechanics and uh, and uh in 2010 this group professor sinha and uh, laplum group they did this experiment to test the accuracy of this uh, quantum interference coming from bond rule and uh, and this you know this uh, interest is really uh, very you know demanding i mean people still worry about what is really going on in this setup okay so i just said this mystery is still not solved why i am saying this because we don't yet know in reality what a quantum entity is is it a particle is it a wave or is it both like particle and wave or is it that it is neither particle nor wave it is something else and what we have till now is only a partial description of the quantum entity so to me it may be highly possible that quantum entity is something else and we don't completely at the grasp our understanding about what this entity actually is to uh, uh, add a little more uh, twist to this uh, this in this uh, 2019 there was a group uh, from germany that did actual experiment and they found some evidence that quantum entities are actually neither wave nor particle but i'm not i'm not going to uh, tell uh, too much about that okay so so if you ask the question to any student what is the origin of quantum superposition so it is very simple essentially it is the non commutative nature of physical observable which plays a major role that plays a very crucial role in creating quantum superposition and to create that we need at least two non commutative observable and that will be clear in a moment why do you need to because you have to prepare your quantum state initially in one of the eigen state of some observable of your choice it could be a and then you choose another observable b which will be kind of generator of the transformation generator of the unitary transformation and you apply this unitary exponential mind in some time okay and if you do that you will realize that if initially the system was in one of the eigen state of the observable a this will evolve to a linear combination of all the possible eigen state and and as you see from this uh, this expression simple expression if b and a they are going to commute you will not create a superposition you will end up with a state state the state will not evolve in time okay so this is very simple observation and here is a very simple example so prepare your qubit initially state zero which is eigen state of this of zero which is sigma z and you apply unitary which is essentially exponential minus i x theta or x is your sigma x and then if you do that you will create essentially a superposition of zero and one which is this alpha zero plus beta one okay this is this will be clear to all uh, all the students okay so non commuting nature of a and b creates a state which is a superposition of different eigen state of the observable a and quantum coherence essentially arises from the fact that the wave function or the quantum state or the state vector 
actually remains in a coherent superposition of different amplitudes and quantum coherence that you assign to a quantum state has to be a basis dependent notion. Uh, but if you ask the question, how much coherence is there in a quantum state? Surprisingly, the answer was not known until 2014-15, okay? Even though, I mean, people have been using coherence, people have been using uh, quantum state, they, they have been using density matrix and so on. And in fact, if you look at the cohen tonoji test group, there is a very nice discussion about uh, uh, this notion that uh, diagonal elements of the density matrix they represent in population and off diagonal element represent coherence. But how much coherence is there? This answer is not there in the test group. Okay. So this was recently quantified by Martin Plenio group in 2014. And after that, a lot of activity, a lot of uh, group actually working on quantum coherence and one of the one of the hot topic uh, in recent times. So, so what is the quantum coherence? So we have to quantify how much superposition is there in a quantum state with respect to a given basis, okay? So as you know, you can expand your quantum state using infinite number of possible choice of the orthonormal basis in a given Hilbert space. And that means the quantum coherence that you're going to define will depend on the choice of basis. That means if you choose a particular basis, you may see some coherence. If you choose a different basis, you may not see any coherence, okay? So to fix that, I mean, to quantify that notion, so first you have to identify what is the so-called free state and what is free operation. And states which are not free, you will call as useful or you will call as resourceful, and they will contain some finite amount of coherence, okay? So free, what are free states? They are essentially state diagonal in some given basis. And free operation are essentially uh, incoherent operation, which will not create any coherence starting from free state. Okay. So so do you like this? I mean, you say that your currency, your money is a resource. Why? Because you can do something with your money. If you just have a blank paper in your wallet, you will not be able to do anything with that blank paper. Okay. So so before quantifying resource, before quantifying currency, you have to start from some some reference frame, reference uh, object, and from that you say, okay, this is my resource. Okay, so so this coherent, uh, sorry, incoherent operation, they will make incoherent state incoherent state because by by definition they should not be able to create any coherence. And not only that, if you are familiar with this quantum uh, channel quantum operation language, then every cross element individually should map incoherent state to incoherent state. And over the last couple of years, many variety of incoherent operations people have defined, but I'm not going to tell you again all of this. So I will tell briefly what are the conditions people need. I mean, we need to define this coherence measure. So you say, okay, if you have some incoherent state, this measure should be zero. And for all other state, there should be positive real number. And then second condition is youth monotonicity under incoherent operation. That means if you apply this channel lambda on the quantum state, the coherence should not increase compared to what it was before. And strong monotonicity is the following, that if you have the incoherent channel with elements like Krauss element like AI, selective transformation of the quantum state, and after that you've obtained sigma i, then on, on an average, the coherence will not increase. And the last condition is convexity, that is given a convex combination of the density matrix like this. The C of rho should be less than or equal to this. So these set of conditions, they identified some suitable measure of coherence, which is very, very useful, very interesting. So as I said, coherence measure begin with identification of set of uh, orthonormal uh, basis. And any probabilistic mixture of orthogonal basis state will be called as incoherent state. And any state that do not belong to this class will have non-zero coherence, and that will quantify how much is getting accumulated in the octagonal density element of the density matrix? Okay, so in, the, in this literature, you will find uh, several measures over the last couple of years, but uh, most uh, famous measures are this so called L1 norm of coherence and relative entropy of coherence, where L1 norm is essentially the sum of modulus of the octagonal elements of the density matrix in some basis I. 
and relative entropy is essentially the entropy of the diagonal density matrix minus the original density matrix. And we have been trying to give uh, uh, physical meaning to these uh, quantities. So first quantity was uh, this L1 naught, and we try to give a meaning to that. So we thought, okay, so if this quantity is going to measure this coherence, and coherence is coming from the wave particle duality, so is it true that this coherence measure also satisfies some kind of duality with the path information in quantum interference? And the answer is yes. We did figure out that uh, the, the the famous Englert duality uh, is actually a special case of this uh, duality between coherence and path information, and that was uh, that was the result you can see in this paper. And we tried to give also operational meaning to this uh, relative entropy. Essentially, this is the minimum entropy that you can inject to a quantum state to make it incoherent. Okay. So quantum coherence, as I, as I have been telling, depends on the choice of basis. And for any quantum system, there are infinite number of bases linked to infinite number of different coherence. So if coherence captures wave aspect, then for every, sorry, for, for a quantum entity, there is not just one wave. There are actually infinite variety of waves. So I call it myriad of waves for a quantum entity. And if you extend this wave particle duality, then you will say, okay, for each wave, there is a particle. And then there should be myriad of particles as well for a given quantum entity. So if that is so, then how to quantify particle? It is, so when you go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, we have in back of our mind that quantum entities also, you know, in some sense, I mean, they, they, they have a different dynamics, but they may be something similar to the part particle that we see in day to day life, but it's not so. So you can, you can quantify the particle aspect of one entity following the resource theoretic framework of this quantum coherence. And that was done recently in this paper. Uh, okay, so. So next I will tell you about uh, this uncertain relation for coherence. Since coherence depends on the basis, and, uh, and which means if I choose a basis I and if I choose a basis A, amount of coherence will be different. But the question is, can there be some kind of trade-off between this coherence? The answer is yes. And, and the answer is given this. So coherence in this basis I and basis A is essentially given by this. And quite interestingly, this, is actually equivalent to the famous uh, entropic uncertainty. So, which means that the uncertainty relation for coherence gives a different way of looking at the standard entropic uncertainty relation that people know already. So, so we have also tried to figure out uh, quantum coherence in quantum computation. So, for example, quantum computation the crucial thing that you need is quantum superposition and essentially that will lead to quantum coherence. So then it is natural to ask, is there any connection between coherence and uh, quantum algorithm? The answer is yes. So what we found is that uh, the simplest quantum search algorithm, we found that quantum coherence and the success probability of getting the right answer is actually they are connected. Okay, so very recently, uh, we try to connect quantum coherence to non commutative So you see, in the beginning, I told that quantum coherence comes from quantum superposition, and quantum superposition comes from non commutativity But can there be any connection between non commutativity and coherence? The answer is yes. So look at the following scenario. So you choose a basis I, and choose observable A, system which is described by some density matrix rho and in that basis you express your density matrix like this okay and then you split into diagonal and off diagonal element okay similarly given the variable a you can express that also in, in the basis i and then you split that into a diagonal plus off diagonal and then what you can check yourself is Trace of row A diagonal is same as trace of row diagonal and the original observable. So, with this simple uh, observation, we found that you can actually estimate coherence 
from the commutator. And what we found is that the commutator of A and A diagonal, okay, because you see A has a different eigenbasis, and A diagonal is essentially the diagonal part of the observable A in the basis I. So obviously they will not commute. So essentially the non-commutativity of A and its diagonal co component and its average is actually gives a lower bound to the L1 norm of coherence, which means given a quantum state, if you want to estimate how much coherence is there, you don't have to do full quantum state tomography and identify density matrix, identify the diagonal element, off diagonal element, and find the complete the uh, L1 norm. By simply looking at this, this quantity, you can uh, give at least a lower bound to that. Okay. Uh, so this bound connects quantum core to quantum state be pure or mixed, and it could be arbitrary dimension, and you can give this estimate. Along with being potentially of fundamental use, it also provides a ready estimate. Precisely, it gives a lower bound on the quantum coherence of an arbitrary quantum state, as I said, without resource to or recourse to quantum state tomography. And as a byproduct, it provides a direct method of creating witness for quantum coherence, which is unrelated to existing witness operator. Okay, so the next part of my talk, I will try to spend some time in trying to tell you about quantum coherence and and the disturbance that is uh, caused by some quantum measurement or quantum operation that we you know perform on a quantum system. Okay, so so let me try to motivate this a little bit. So suppose you have a quantum system and you are not doing anything to quantum system. Okay, so system is left isolated. So what will happen is quantum the coherence of the quantum system will be essentially remain as it is. Okay, but suppose you are doing a measurement or you are applying some noise channel or you are applying some quantum operation, then what will happen? Then obviously the quantum state will change. And once it changes, the system will undergo some disturbance. Okay, so that is the whole starting uh, philosophy. So the measurement process not only disturb the quantum state, but also will lead to loss of coherence. And what will happen then is the density matrix will slowly start losing its off-diagonal elements, which is essentially your the process of decoherence or your loss of superposition. Okay. And if there is no disturbance, then it is obvious for you that system should remain in the original state. That means it will maintain some non zero coherence. Okay. Now, the question we ask is is there any trade off between disturbance that you are causing the quantum system and the amount of coherence that is present in the quantum state? Okay. So before we discuss about this trade off, let me tell you something about disturbance. So, again, talking about quantum disturbance, I mean, there are many, uh, many different routes people have taken, many different kind of you know, uh, definitions, various authors have proposed, but I found this. Uh, this uh, proposal by Lorenzo Mekone, one of my collaborators, is very, very useful. So, and that definition uh, is based on few, uh, few, you know, gems. Uh, let me try to tell that. So, disturbance to a quantum system is essentially an irreversible change that you cause to a quantum system. Okay, and and any thing that we will do on a quantum system has to be physical map, and any physical map has to be essentially a completely positive trust preserving map, or in short, it has to be CP2P map. So those who are familiar with CP2P map, uh, it is fine, but those who are not familiar, you imagine that any CP2P map is nothing but, essentially, it is a unitary evolution on a larger Hilbert space. 
which means in simplest term that suppose you, you have a quantum system of your interest and you want to do some cptp map on the quantum system so what you will do you bring an additional system which you call ancilla and on the system and ancilla you apply some global unitary and then you trace out the ancilla once you do that the resulting dynamics on the system will be essentially your cptp map okay and this disturbance should satisfy the following condition that it should be function of the initial state and cptp map only and second condition should that it should be null if and only if the cptp map is invertible on the initial state why because in that case you can change the quantum state in a reverse manner and hence system will not be disturbed and third condition is the following that this disturbance measure should be monotonically non decreasing under successive application of noise map and it should be continuous for map and initial state we do not differ too much so with these four reasonable axioms uh, mekon have proposed very very useful uh, definition so so as i told you before so there are several definitions of disturbance uh, In the literature, and they have been proposed using fidelity measure like Burst distance between initial state and final state. But what happens is, if you take the definition, they fail to satisfy the irreversibility condition. And fidelity-based definition is non-zero for unitary transformation, which is reversible, so, which is a desirable feature. And also, the definitions can be null for non-invertible map, and they are not monotonically non-decreasing under successive application of the CPT map. And therefore, they fail to satisfy the condition two and three. Okay, but uh, quite interestingly, this measure of disturbance, which is essentially the entropy of the state S of rho minus the I C of rho, I mean I C of the channel acting on rho, is going to satisfy all the conditions that I listed above. And what is this I C of E of rho? it is essentially negative conditional entropy why it is so because look at the density matrix row and then imagine that dust density matrix is a part of a pure entangled state psi in some larger hilbert space that means if i trace out this part one part of this entangled state psi i will get the density matrix row and and i am applying channel on the e sorry i am applying the channel e on this state row that means on the larger hilbert space i will apply channel on this system 1 and nothing on the system 2 and this is the total entropy entropy of the system 1 and 2 system 1 is essentially your conditional entropy but this is coming with a negative sign so this is essentially the negative conditional entropy and this is called coherent information and this is very beautiful very very you know um, intuitive physical meaning in the context of quantum communication because this tells you that when you send a quantum state to the noisy channel this coherent information tells you how much distant quantum quantum information you can transform from a list to bob to the noisy channel and this is also connected to uh, privacy you know of quantum uh, key rate that you can generate in quantum key distribution so there is a very very uh, many many application this uh, this notion has okay. and what is beautiful about this is that satisfies all the properties and is non infringing under successive application of cptp map and hence this is a suitable measure of this disturbance and this obeys the condition that uh, this is bounded by twice log d but the dimension of the uh, hilbert space of the system and if you are interested more you can look at this paper uh, so what we are going to prove is the following that we can prove that indeed there is a trade off between amount of coherence and disturbance that is called to quantum system by a noisy map so to prove that consider a quantum system uh, with the density matrix rho dimension d and imagine that this is a part of a pure entangled state psi of s and r okay where r is your additional quantum system and what you can show is that if you apply the channel on the system side then twice coherence plus disturbance is satisfied bounded by twice log d and this is 
this is actually very tight because D of rho is already itself bounded by twice log D. We have additional quantum coherence sitting here. So this is actually tight trade-off relation that we proved. And not only that, we also proved that if you have a quantum channel, which is actually a quantum measurement channel, then you can even prove relation which looks like coherence per disturbance is bounded by log D. Uh, so following similar spirit, you can ask the following question that given a single system, you had found the relation between coherence and disturbance, or suppose you have a bipartite state and you are applying channel to this quantum system. Now, as a result of quantum disturbance, sorry, I mean, as a result of disturbance to the quantum system, the system will tend to lose coherence, it may tend to lose entanglement, it may tend, tend to lose uh, quantum correlation. So then the natural question comes to mind is, can you still find some kind of trade-off between coherence, entanglement, and disturbance? Okay, the answer is yes. Uh, okay, so before I tell the result I, that we found, let me tell you what we already knew before. So already it was known that for pure bipartite state, already we have a complementarity between so-called this uh, relative entropy of coherence and entanglement, that is C of rho A, that is coherence of one side, and the entanglement of the whole is bounded by log D. This simply follows from the definition of the uh, definition of the uh, quantum coherence. Okay. But what we prove is that there is a complementarity between coherence, entanglement, and disturbance when we apply a CP to be made on a bipartite state. Okay. So, so suppose you have a bipartite state O A B, then again you can th think of think of that as a part of a pure entangled state of psi A B R, where this is a tripartite state. And then the relative entropy of entanglement essentially given by this. This is the minimum of sigma AB, relative entropy of rho AB in sigma AB. And you can define disturbance like you did for single system. So you can define S of rho AB minus IC of rho AB as a whole, and which is essentially this. And then you can show that, uh, that indeed there is a connection or there is a complementarity. So, but to prove that, you have to also define quantum coherence for bipartite quantum state. So you can define, like you do for a single system, so you can define a joint orthonormal basis for the H A tensor HB with basis I and mu. And similarly, you can define coherence of the whole state to diagonal minus S of rho AB. And then using the definition that I just uh, told, you can prove that there is a connection between coherence and diagonal disturbance. So the Connection looks like exactly like this. So coherence plus entanglement to plus disturbance is bounded by twice log D A B. Okay. It's a very, very cute uh, relation that you can prove. Okay. So our results capture the intuition that coherence entanglement at the quantum uh, discard. Okay, so quantum discard didn't tell or didn't tell that. Okay, so let me tell here itself. So so here what I have uh, displayed is that uh, coherence and entanglement and disturbance they satisfy this, but what you can do, you can also prove a similar relation for quantum disco. Okay. So if you take a quantum system, which is bipartite rho AB, but it has no entanglement, but it can still have quantum discord. And discord uh, is a notion which goes, uh, you know, which try to capture some quantumness beyond entanglement. Essentially, what you do is you take a bipartite quantum state and you do measurement on one side, <clears throat> okay, on one side of the quantum system, and look at the mutual information of the post state, and look at the mutual information of the original state. So what you will find is the difference between these two things is essentially so-called the quantum correlation of quantum discord, which is not captured by quantum entanglement. Okay. So 
I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to tell too much about one of this code, but if you are interested, you can look at our paper, and uh, you will find that coherence plus this code plus disturbance they also satisfy twice log the okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so our result. What, I, what I've said till now, so they try to capture the intuition that coherence, entanglement, and quantum discord for a quantum system, they respect the trade of between disturbance. And these results will, will have interesting applications where you send a single system or complete system on the knowledge channel. And, and you can ask the question that how much coherence you can maintain, how much entanglement you can maintain, then you can look at our relation and say, okay, if this much a disturbance, you should be able to capture this much coherence. That means if you wish to maintain coherence or entanglement or both, then you need to send quantum state to a channel that does not disturb too much to the quantum system. And it will be interesting to see if other measure of coherence and entanglement will respect this kind of complementarity to the disturbance. So this we still don't know, but maybe they will satisfy this. Okay, so let me try to summarize what I said. So I started with the simple notion that non-competitivity of two or more observables they play a very important role in creating quantum superposition and essentially that leads to non-zero coherence. And we try to also show that average of commutator between any arbitrary observable and its diagonal part that actually provides a lower bound for the quantum coherence for pure as well as Fermi state. And when you have a quantum system, and if it is not disturbed by measurement, the system will maintain coherence. But once you start disturbing the quantum system, then there is a trade-off between how much you can maintain, how much you can lose. So disturbance and coherence trade-off will tell you this. Okay. And not only that, you can also prove that for bipartite quantum state, you can prove trade-off between coherence, entanglement, uh, and disturbance, as well as you can prove also. Uh, some trade off between coherence and entanglement, sorry, between quantum discord and disturbance. Okay. So, so I think I'm almost at end. So, thank you for your time. And if you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Professor Pati, for an excellent uh, talk. I think covering the basic foundations, sharing your original results. I, the talk is now open for questions. Please. Can I ask a question? Please, sir. Yeah. Please, Sudhir, sir. Yes. He's my old dear friend, so I can ask him any question whatsoever. So he won't mind that. Uh, so our association like goes back to minus infinity. So <laughs> uh, see, Arun, the point is that uh, there are there is a great interest uh, when we are trying to uh, build any systems or devices to see what mm. is the coherence time and how to increase coherence time and this and that. So people talk in terms of coherence time. And of course, when we try to have devices where qubits are coupled to resonators or ancilla qubits, etc., there is also entanglement because of which things happen. So mm -hmm. by using some of your uh, identities, the connections mm -hmm. of coherence and disturbance, mm -hmm. do you think that it is, uh, they would, be another way to optimize entanglement and the degree of decoherence rather than you know worrying about coherence time this and that you do you do yeah, you yeah. Your thought in that direction yeah so so this is a very good very good point very good question so uh, so you see when you have to maintain coherence at the same time you have to uh, design uh, you know uh, two qubit logic gate or entangling gate so you will also create an entanglement. So once you create entanglement, the coherence will tend to lose. You see, so it is a, so it is kind of competition. You have to worry about trade-offs. So I think uh, our relation will uh, throw some light. So it will tell essentially, okay, if you want to create this much entanglement, 
you will try to maintain only this much coherence. So I think it will play some some interesting role. So I mean, you know, we had uh, we heard some very interesting talks by Steve Jervin and yesterday by Akshay and Michelle Devore, etc. And they, mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, this possibility to have uh, Alice and Bob type of cavities mm -hmm. to which a few qubits can be entangled. And then yeah, yeah. One, makes, uh, one makes all kinds of gates. So mm -hmm. your result is valid for bipartite or we can also have more than uh, two. Yeah, so, 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 uh, so the relation grew. Uh, we prove for single system, we prove for bipartite, so you can do for multipartite also, and this will go through. So there is no, no difficulty about that. So, yeah. Okay. So, that's yeah. very, very interesting. And the non commutativity, uh, your question with non commutativity um, and the early discussion with time reminded me of the great work of Alan Cohn's, that he defines time in terms of non commutation of operators. Mm -hmm. Very nice talk, huh? thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Jensen, there are two more raised hands. I see Arul uh, uh, yeah. he wants to ask uh, some question. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Hi, Arun. Yeah. Hi, nice to see you. Thanks for the talk, very interesting. I, I, I wanted to just go to the uh, basis, uh, basis dependence of coherence, and what's your thought on, you know. Uh, is there always an appropriate basis uh, which is, uh, you know, in, in, in which it is natural to consider coherence? No, no, no. Uh, I mean, there's no preferred basis to define coherence. You can, you can, uh, you can choose any observable and there are infinite, infinite number of choices that you can make. So, there is no unique choice that you can make to define your coherence. No, that's what I mean, but, but then what uh, it, it will, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to the fact that coherence is a basis dependent thing. So, uh, so then a state will be uh, coherent or in, incoherent and so on, depending on what observable or basis that, uh, that you're yeah, having. Yeah. So, but, but in some, some, you know, physical situations, it will be clear what is the basis. For example, localization in spatial localization, mm -hmm. space is a natural mm -hmm. basis, They're not, you know, momentum mm -hmm. or something. Or when you're coupling systems, uh, maybe in a weak, uh, weak interaction, the eigenstates of the uncoupled system may form a natural mm -hmm. basis in which actually mm -hmm. coherence is can. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what is the status in, in general of the basis dependence? Is that something which is, I mean, so once you fix a basis, all of these, uh, uh, all of these things uh, follow, uh, uh, yeah, but in the yeah, yeah. But when you are changing bases, how these things are themselves changed? Is there some sort of general understanding? And of course, if you start making things bases independent or average over bases, then it will probably go into some things like entanglement or some uh, unitary invariance or some some other such quantities, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the relation that we have proved, they, I mean, they are, I mean, whatever basis you choose, so you will be able to satisfy this uh, trade-off. So there is no, uh, there is no, so, okay, nothing that you have to, you have to fix only so, but, basis, and then, I mean, okay. for the sake of the proof, we choose a particular basis, but the relation is true for any basis. So, but for example, example, this particular trade-off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry, I, I just wanted to just make a quick comment. Uh, uh, so I think there are two places where the, I mean, there are two kind of motivations, which basically I think define a basis, uh, you know, in my understanding, I just wanted to say it out loud in case Arun wanted to add to it or wanted to um, uh, modify what I was saying. One is basically uh, the one that you were mentioning Arun, just a second ago, which is that the environment picks a basis out for you. So when it's, you know, when it uh, when it's decoering the pointer basis basically becomes kind of the obvious choice with respect to which you you discuss the physics. The second is uh, in closed systems basically, the eigen basis uh, of the Hamiltonian that you're doing work extraction with. So you know, or closed or open systems where basically you have a Hamiltonian which defines the basis uh, with respect to which you're going to basically make uh, energetic transitions. So there, mm -hmm. what happens is that there is no um, intrinsic energy cost. 
uh, if you have a non-degenerate quantum system, uh, then there is a co energy cost to coherence, and that's where coherence basically really starts making a, you know, it becomes actually an energetic resource in th in the thermodynamic I, setting. I, I just wanted to uh, just say these two things out loud and just uh, um, you know to add to your comment and just ask Arun's uh, uh, comment yeah. on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, having a preferred basis depends, as you say. I mean, uh, depends on your uh, context or depends on the experiment that you're doing. So, if you want to do work system, the energy eigen basis of the Hamiltonian will be preferred basis. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the decoherence uh, position, will be preferred basis. But uh, there is, I mean, quantum theory does not tell you that what will be preferred basis. So it depends on your, you know, depends on your context in which you are looking at, uh, you know, your experiment. So yeah, there's an operational justification for a, for a good basis mm -hmm. that comes from outside. Yeah. Yeah. This is the yeah. point you're making. Yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, to All me, right. I don't think there is a fundamental fundamental reason that uh, some particular basis should be preferred basis. Uh, this is my view. I don't know either, but yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sandeep Joshi, I think, wants okay. to ask a question. Yeah. Sandeep, yeah. please. So, so, so very nice talk, sir. So you showed that the coherence has a lower bound, which is given by like a commutator between two observables. Commutator of an observable with its diagonal part. Yeah, yeah right, yes. So can you like give an example, like what kind of observables are these? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Any, any damn observable you can choose, you know? So this is the duty of this relation. You can choose any damn uh, observable and uh, look at its diagonal part and that will be the lower bound to the, you know. So, so in case that of, will hold for any system? Yeah, yeah. So suppose, so, okay, think of a qubit, simpler system, and suppose you want to measure coherence of qubit in say, you know, in sigma z basis, okay? Then you can okay. choose your a to be sigma x, as simple as that, okay? Okay, so that will give us a lower bound yeah, yeah. on the coherence yeah, yeah. Yeah, without yeah. evaluating the density matrix, etc. Exactly, exactly. So this is one of the, I mean, very simple, <laughs> very cute thing that we found, so. But uh, is there any proof of this relation? Can I find? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can look at our paper and read it too. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there more questions for Professor Pati? Oh, so okay. Ra Rakesh uh, would like to ask a question. Please, thank you, sir, for, thank you, sir, for a really nice talk. So, uh, as you were saying that non-commutation has a relation with decoherence and the decoherence and entanglement is the trade-off between the uh, entropy. So, is there a direct correlation between non-commutation and the entropy? Like, uh, some amount of the entropy is conserved in the whole system, which we are choosing, and the, this entropy is distributed among the decoherence and entanglement and the disturbance. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that uh, that we uh, uh, explored a little bit, but we could not figure out. So, so essentially what you're trying to ask is uh, whether we can have some kind of trade of relation between, say, entropy version of the coherence with uh, entanglement and uh, disturbance kind of thing. So, I mean, I, I would, my answer should be, I mean, it should be yes, but uh, we could not figure out yet. So, so is there some kind of universal measure which has the trade-off between all these three quantities? No, uh, yeah, we tried, uh, yes, I did. Uh, we could not find, but uh, I think there is hope. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, are there any more questions? Okay, so now, I sir, I, uh, don't see any more questions then let us thank professor pati for his talk uh, with a nice round of applause i request everybody to join me okay thank you very much for your time and yeah. Take care thank you sir thank stress. you very much yeah excellent yes, talk, sir. thanks Sudhir. so so, thank you. so everything is going fine yes let me first thank the uh, dr joshi who kindly chaired this session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Sudhir, sir, for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.
Tek yer ya işte sen. So the next session will start at 4.30.
Hi, Ryan. Hello. Hi. Um, you want to test what? if your sharing of slides working well? Sure, sure. I can test. Just one second. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, something seems to be missing. Mm -hmm. What we see is Sorry. starting with off matter with programmable. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I and think that was a problem with Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Yes. This. Yeah. How do I turn on my video here? Never used WebEx before, so. Looks good. Okay. Mm, nice. We can hear you also, so no problem. Okay, can you see me or no? Animation? No, can you see me, like my face? No, we can't still see you. Okay, let's see. Let's go. Let me I stop for a few seconds. Yeah, now I can see. Now, now you can see me? Okay, great. Yeah. Good to see How you. How nice. <laughs> yeah. How nice to wake you up early. Not too early. It's <laughs> oh, hi, Nisha. How are you doing? So cool. Uh, hey, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. How are you? Good. Yeah. Are things better there? Sorry? Are things better there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> things are getting better here. Hopefully, it gets better in India too. Richard, so. where are you? Sir, you are bus. Not here. Okay. I am not far. 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 I am तो वाली एकदम ठंडी हो गई
we could have kept a short tutorial by Ryan in this time, in this break. Short tutorials on? On and a, a pre, a tutorial on what, on your talk, so that we are better <laughs> prepared. Very simple, you don't need a tutorial. <laughs> we will see. It's much harder, definitely much harder than the simpler things that we used to do. <laughs> okay. Hello, how are you? Okay. Ah, and you are here. Good, Nishal. Good to see you after a long time. How are you doing? Fine. Uh, sure. I need to go. Oh, sorry. I'm good, sir. How are you doing? I'm not not too bad. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, how is it going? You're, you're at IT, right? I'm at IT. Yes. Yes. With Sai. Yes. Yes, with Sai. Yeah. Is CBS open these days? Or is uh, it, did it go in the uh, open, close, open? It's, it's quasi closed. Quasi closed. Okay. Because uh, people go there from time to time, hmm. but uh, no activity on campus. Mm, I see, I can understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you safe? Ah, uh, yes. Indeed. So, so how, how many participants do we have today? Right now, very less. Hmm. Yeah, there, yeah, I think six, six. including Ryan. Hi, Ryan. I haven't Hi. met you, but I've heard a lot about you. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Even if yeah, to nice to meet you too. So you're done with your PhD, right? Or you're postdoc? What what you're doing now? Oh, I'm still doing my PhD. Yeah, I'm still okay. PhD. Very nice. Let me try pulling out the uh, bibliographic information that has been shared. I don't know where it is now. No, I think I have lost it, but it, uh, it doesn't matter. Ah, got it. Okay, got it. Okay. Fine. Yeah. It is live YouTube streaming. So the only hope is that maybe some people are there also, but. Ah. It's always difficult to get people to show up to virtual events. Huh? It's always difficult to get people to show up for virtual events. <laughs> they are virtually present.
श्रद्धा मिले Okay, uh, with my uh, words of welcome in our final session, uh, I feel absolutely uh, wonderful. And I feel like I'm very old. I also feel uh, many things. And here I have a chairperson who I wish to invite to chair, who I know for 20 years when he was a student. And the other speakers have been my very dear, very, very dear friends. And uh, it's amazing to be organizing a conference. It's a dream uh, to have a session like this. So uh, I, I request uh, Professor Amya Bhagwat to take over and chair this session. Thank you, Amya. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar Bhai. Thank you very much. So I sh and I can't call you Professor Jain or anything because it's too formal and that is a bit too much. So I can't do that. So I continue to call you Sundar Bhai. So <laughs> thank you very much indeed. And it's a pleasure to be here in this very nice conference. And uh, so we have two two speakers today. One is Ryan, where he is very much here. And the second is Shraddha. I don't think she's around. I think she'll join in rather soon. OK, so I think uh, I'll just give a brief, very brief introduction. I will uh, just sort of a bibliographic data that I have received. So I think I'll just read it out because uh, it's OK. So Ryan, I, well, I have never met him, but I have heard a lot about him. And uh, he's a very bright fellow, a PhD student at the Department of Harvard University. And his research is primarily on theoretical properties of exotic quantum materials. Uh, and uh, he has worked with uh, Professor Sudhir Jain and his, and I, I know a lot about that work. It's a brilliant piece of work that they have done together. And what he'll be presenting today is a talk on quantum simulation or a simulation of phases of matter with programmable Rydberg atom arrays. Over to you, Ryan. Okay. Thank you, Professor Bhagwat, for a very nice, uh, very kind introduction, and thank you, Dr. Jen, for inviting me. So I'm very happy to be here virtually, and uh, today I'll be telling you a little bit about quantum simulation of phases of matter or many body systems with with brigadier arrays. So, so before we get started, I just want to point out the people with whom this work was done. So Sabir Sachdev is my advisor, uh, and much of this work was done in collaboration with the group of Misha Lukin. Uh, Wen Wei Ho, he's a postdoc at Stanford. Hannes Pickler is a professor at uh, Innsbruck now. Uh, on the experimental side, I'm going to show you many beautiful pictures, and that was all that data is taken by this fantastic Adam Array team. Uh, Harry, Tao, Sepper, Julia, Alex, Dolev, and Ahmed. Okay, 
So this talk is probably a little different from what you've heard in this conference so far, which is about quantum computing. And I just wanted to briefly start with some of the more conventional platforms for quantum computing. So we've definitely heard about superconducting qubits, uh, and we know that companies like Google and IBM have invested a lot of effort and money into superconducting qubits. Um, other promising platforms, so for instance, Microsoft is uh, working with topological qubits in the hope of realizing Majorana fermions. Chris Monroe's group uh, at Maryland, uh, they've been working with trapped ions. And as you can see that although like the logical success rate of all these platforms is pretty good, it's, it's close to 99%, the number of actual qubits that we can entangle has, remains in like single digits or small double digits. And each of these systems have their own pros and cons. Uh, and I'll show you what the advantages or relative disadvantages of the Rydberg system are as well. So this data is from 2016, uh, which is, so it's a little outdated, but 2016 was right around when there was a new kid on the block, which was the Rydberg atom arrays. So the platform behind this entire talk is really simple. So you have a bunch of atoms, uh, and these are some alkali atoms or alkaline earth atoms like rubidium, cesium, or strontium. And this atom can be in one of two states. It can either be in a brown state or it can be an excited state with a very large principal quantum number like n equals 70 or something. Okay. And these atoms are trapped with optical tweezers. And so that's the setup. So this was really the, the idea has been around for a long time but i think large-scale efforts really stepped up in over the last five years or so and while the success rate is comparable uh, to what we've seen for the other platforms i do want to point out this number uh, which is the largest number of qubits ever entangled when in preparing a ghz state with these redberg atoms uh, the advantages of this platform are it's very scalable, so you can, you know, atoms by themselves are identical, so you don't have to worry about different qubits being different from each other. Uh, it's a very tunable system, as I'll show you. Uh, on the flip side, the, I, the areas that still need some more work is about individual control and how you actually read out the state of the system. But as I'll show you, hopefully, that this is still a very promising area. All right. So given this uh, setup of neutral atoms, uh, in the system, the qubit is encoded between the ground state and the highly excited state of each atom. So the internal electronic structure looks something like this. So you have a ground state and a Rydberg state, and they're coupled via a two-photon transition via some intermediate state. Uh, but you know, as theorists, we can forget about this internal structure and think of it as an effective qubit. Uh, which is the ground state and the Rydberg state, they're coupled by this laser drive with a Rabi frequency, which is omega. And there's some effective detuning, which is delta. So in terms of the Hamiltonian, what does this look like? So a single particle Hamiltonian is really simple. You have a, a Rabi oscillation term, which couples the ground and Rydberg state, so that's a sigma x. And this detuning delta, it couples to the density of Rydberg excitations. So Ni, you can think of, in terms of a spin language, you could think of it as sigma z plus a half, okay? Uh, and if you, if you look at the real experimental data for an isolated atom with a Rabi frequency of about five megahertz, you measure the Rydberg population as a function of pulse time, you can see these beautiful Rabi oscillations, which just perfect like theory would predict, okay? Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that this is because it's a two level system you can think of it in terms of like a spin in degree of freedom so you can think of it as like a spin up or a spin down or you can also think of it as a bosonic mode like you either have a boson or you don't have a boson that's like and i'll be going back and forth between these languages uh, throughout this talk okay so this was about uh, the single particle but we have to consider the interactions between them and in, in, Doing so, what really becomes important is to take into account the separation of scales in the problem. And so, for instance, here, if, to just give you an idea of the scales here, suppose this, this blue little dot, which you can barely see, suppose this is this is the Earth, okay, and that's, that's the size of the ground state of an atom. Uh, this yellow disk over here in the corner, 
uh, that would be the sun. And just to put things into perspective, if I had to plot the size of the Rydberg state on the same scale, you can see that that would be this huge blue sphere. So when you're talking about the interaction between these, these huge Rydberg atoms, they really interact on length scales much larger than the individual atoms. So it's like picometers versus micrometers. That's the difference we're talking about. And so what is the interaction between these Rydberg atoms? They interact uh, in this van der Waals form via dipole dipole interactions. And so it scales as C6 over R to the sixth. And this interaction can, in principle, be very strong, which leads to this phenomenon known as the Rydberg blockade. And the Rydberg blockade mechanism is actually central and underpins everything that I'm going to show you today. So the basic idea behind the Rydberg blockade is really simple. So suppose we have just one atom. So there's a ground state and a Rydberg state, and that's coupled with this Rabi drive, and I can switch back and forth between them. Now, what happens when I consider two atoms together? So I have my ground ground state, okay, and that's coupled to the state, which is either ground Rydberg or Rydberg ground. Uh, but when I consider the state Rydberg Rydberg, what you can see is because of this interaction, this level is shifted by an amount, which is the interaction strength. And so when this interaction, this U van der Waals, becomes much, much larger than the drive, then that level is no longer coupled. And so you cannot have a transition into a state which is Rydberg Rydberg. So in other words, the occupation of one Rydberg state of uh, the, the occupation of one Rydberg state, either here or here, blockades the occupation of a neighboring Rydberg state. And that's the idea behind the Rydberg blockade. So when V is greater than omega, uh, it is energetically unfavorable to have multiple Rydberg excitations near each other. And we can formally parameterize this in terms of, of what's called the Rydberg blockade radius. So pictorially, you can think of it as, say, this red atom here is in a Rydberg state. Uh, in a blockade radius, which is a region of radius RB, there can be no other Rydberg excitation. And this blockade physics actually leads to very strong correlation effects and introduces some very non-trivial physics. So that's the setup. Any questions so far? Okay, at any point, please feel free to just unmute and ask questions. So, so far I've told you what happens with uh, the single particle picture. So now let's consider like the full many body Hamiltonian, which I've written down here and see what happens. Uh, so before we get to that, I just want to point out why would we even want to do that? And the purpose why we're looking into this is quantum simulation. So the idea behind quantum simulation is as follows. You can tr you have a quantum many body problem which you can try to simulate on a quantum computer. Uh, you can try to do that on a classical computer, but beyond a certain number of sites, if you're using conventional numerical methods, it becomes really hard to do so. So the idea is to take a quantum system, which is you know, has all the interactions and quantum effects built in and use that to study a system which would be difficult to study otherwise. So that's a quantum simulator. And in some sense, you can think of it as a subset of quantum computation. So it's a simpler uh, step. And so this Rydberg system can actually be used to simulate the quantum Ising model, as well as XXZ Hamiltonians and lots of other complicated Hamiltonians. But for today, I'm going to be focusing on Ising. Uh, it's a highly tunable platform, which is interesting because you can see that all of these terms over here, these coefficients, I can tune them by varying the parameters of my laser. And finally, it can host states of matter that are hard to realize in typical condensed matter systems. And that's useful because when you're given a same material, given a high temperature Cooper superconductor or some graphene or something, it's a chemical compound and its properties are inbuilt and that's it. You have like no control. You take what nature gives you. Whereas here, you can actually engineer different phases of matter depending on what you're looking for. And that's really yeah, a key feature of the system. All right, so let's look at this many body Hamiltonian now. And I'm gonna plot its simple phase diagram as a function of two parameters. One is this interaction range or the blockade radius. And the other is this detuning, which you can think of as sort of 
a chemical potential for the Rydberg excitations. The one very important thing to note is that because of the sigma x term, the number of Rydberg excitations is not conserved. So you can create Rydberg's uh, excitations out of the vacuum or destroy them. So let's first focus on this delta term. What happens when delta is large and negative? Well, then the system just wants to have all the atoms in the ground state, and that's what I represent here by these empty circles. When delta is large and positive, on the other hand, uh, the system just wants to maximize the number of Rydberg excitations and can do so willy nilly, so it just gives you a fully packed chain. Okay. Um, what, now, let's consider what happens when you add on the interactions. When you add on the interactions, what you get is many beautiful spatial phases that break distinct crystal symmetries. For instance, when the interaction is so strong that it locates nearest neighbors, what you can find is a Z2 ordered state where you have a Rydberg state followed by a ground and then a Rydberg and a ground and so on and so forth. Sim similarly, uh, you can have other ordered phases, but before we get into that, let me just show you a picture from this pioneering work in 2017, which really started off uh, this whole field in some sense. And here you can see as a function of this detuning parameter, uh, you, you get chains with alternating Rydberg and ground states. So, all right. And so these are known as what Rydberg crystals. So now if we increase the interaction range even further, uh, not only is it unfavorable to have nearest neighbor excitations, it's also unfavorable to have next nearest neighbor excitations. So the system optimizes the energy by having a Rydberg atom every third site. So that leads to like a Z3 ordered phase, and similarly, you can have a Z4 ordered state. So in other words, uh, so I see there's a question. So, so there's a question which says that the interaction... Hi, hi, hi Ryan. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I, I did not completely understand the Rydberg crystal, that figure, the red figure. This figure? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what experimentally you can do is you can start somewhere on the left hand side, okay, and you can sweep your detuning, okay, and you end up somewhere on the right hand side. And depending on where you end up, you take a snapshot of the system. Like for instance, this is if this was your chain, you would just take a snapshot of the system at that point, which you can do with like fluorescence imaging, and then depending on whether it's Rydberg or ground, you color code it. So like if it's a Rydberg, depending on the probability, it's either white or yellow, or it's you know black if it's in the ground state. So for instance, here, when the detuning is at minus four, which would be somewhere here, you can see that site 13 is black, site 12 is black, site one is black. So everything here is in the ground state. Whereas when the detuning is large and positive, so like say plus 10, what you see here is yellow, which means that site 13 is in the Rydberg state. Then there's a very sharp black, which means that the next site is in the ground state. And then the next site is in the Rydberg state. So it alternates as you go across the chain. So that's the Rydberg crystal, yeah. And I, I see a question in the chat about uh, the nature of the long range interactions. So the long range interactions will actually be very crucial to some of the physics that I'll show you. In fact, the long range interactions are partially responsible for this Z3, Z4 order phases, and I'll show you some more consequences of the interaction range in a bit. Okay, great. So, so we've seen this, so we've seen these different Rydberg crystals, and in some sense, this system is solving a quantum computation problem of finding uh, an optimal packing uh, for the ground state. So the first thing that we wanted to understand is you know, there are these different phases so there must be some interesting phase transitions into those systems. And that's the first thing we were interested in looking at, uh, motivated by this experiment. So let me just say a few words about quantum phase transitions in general. So very broadly, we can define the quantum phase transitions as some sort of non-analyticity in the ground state energy of an infinite uh, lattice system. Um, unlike thermal phase transitions, they're driven by quantum fluctuations. Now, thermal phase transitions 
is because you know they're driven by temperature at t equals zero in a classical system you just freeze into a, a ground state that there are no fluctuations whereas for a quantum system you can still have fluctuations in zero temperature with this with the heisenberg uncertainty principle and that's what makes quantum phase transitions interesting and in general uh, the key notion that helps simplify life for us is that of universality which is that if I'm interested in the properties of the system in the critical region, that really does not depend on the microscopic details. Okay? It depends on a few things like dimension and the symmetries of the system, but the microscopics get washed out. Um, by and large, the, we can classify these phase transitions into two broad baskets. So the first one uh, is a first order phase transition. A first order phase transition is just a level crossing. So as we tune some parameter in the Hamiltonian, what happens is that there's one energy level, and after a certain point, another energy level actually becomes in the ground state, and that's just a first order phase transition. And that's boring in some sense. Uh, the more interesting case is what we call continuous or second order phase transitions, where there's no actual crossing, but an avoided crossing. And this avoided crossing becomes sharper and sharper as you take the infinite system size. So in other words, this gap between these two levels, this actually closes as you go to the infinite system limit. And there are certain properties of continuous phase transitions which are really important in that they're characterized by uh, universal critical exponents. So continuous phase transitions are characterized by a, a vanishing energy scale. So if I'm looking at the energy scale of the gap above the ground state, as we approach the phase transition, this, this gap vanishes. And it does so with uh, so if fc is my critical point and f is my tuning parameter, this gap vanishes as a power law with this combination of critical exponents, uh, where z is what's called the dynamical critical exponent. Uh, continuous transitions are also characterized by a diverging length scale, which is called the psi. So if I look at the correlation length, uh, that diverges near the critical point and does so with this exponent, which is called nu. Uh, that's the correlation length exponent. So we've seen a Z2 symmetry breaking transition in the Rydberg system. And so this Drosophila mass matter where we can actually see such a transition is the transverse field Ising model. So the, the Hamiltonian for the transverse field Ising model is really simple. There's a, a, a J, which is a paramagnetic change interaction, which couples sigma Z sigma Z. And there's also a spin flip term, which is this G sigma X. And depending on which regime you're in, you can either be in a ferromagnet or a paramagnet. But what's important to note is that the system has an exact Z2 symmetry, uh, which is implemented by the sigma x operator. In other words, I can take sigma z to minus sigma z and similarly sigma y to minus sigma y, and the Hamiltonian remains invariant. So it's easy to analyze the properties independently in the two different limits. So if g is much greater than 1, we're in this so-called paramagnetic or disordered phase. And the nature of the ground state is very different from that on the left-hand side. So for G much greater than one, the individual excitations that we can consider are spin flips. And there's a unique ground state. And if I were to measure the expectation value of say sigma Z, that's at zero as G tends to infinity. On the other hand, if I had to look on the left-hand side of this picture in the ordered phase, uh, this phase is qualitatively very different because my excitations now are no longer just a single spin flip, but the excitations are domain walls. And instead of a unique ground state, I also have a different ground state degeneracy. And I can see that my sigma z acquires a finite expectation value as well. So these two phases are very different and they're separated by a phase transition. And the phase transition actually happens in this case to be a g equals what? which you can show from a duality. And this phase transition is the same as, in, in the sense of universality, this is the same phase transition as what you see with the Z2 symmetry break in, in the, in the red break case. Right? So the more interesting case is what happens for Z3. So to understand the Z3 transition, what we going to consider is what's known as the Z3 chiral clock model. And this is a, just a simple extension of the transverse realizing model that I showed you. But now instead of like two uh, states per site, we have three states per site. 
these tau matrices, okay, let's start with the sigma matrices. The sigma matrices are the generalization of the sigma Z that we had for the Menzies field Ising model. And here, for instance, you can see that this is diagonal. So it's one omega omega squared, where omega is the uh, cube root of unity. And similarly, this tau, it's off diagonal, which means it's like a spin flip, but it's like a spin flip in this, uh, this is three by three space. Okay. And these tau and sigma operators, they satisfy this algebra. Um, <clears throat> now, when, so if these, on top there are these phases which are called, labeled as phi and theta over here. And if these phases were zero, this just reduces to the quantum version of the three state Pox model. But the introduction of these phases actually results in some chirality in the system. And this chirality is a consequence of the structure of the domain walls uh, between different Z and ordered phases. So what you can see is that the energy cost to have a domain wall as the clock rotates clockwise is different from the energy that it costs for a domain wall when the clock is rotating counterclockwise. So, and this results in a, in a handedness in the system. And what's interesting is that even though this, this model has been around since the 1980s, uh, till very recently, there was really no field theoretic description uh, of, to, to describe the phase transitions. And this Hamiltonian, just for the transverse field Ising model, instead of a Z2 symmetry, it has a Z3 symmetry. Okay. So let's look at the phase diagram. Uh, of this model, and it turns out that it's sufficient to focus on just one of the phases at a time. And the phase diagram shows really three phases. So there is a gap phase with long range Z3 order, which is like the Redbird crystal that I showed you. Uh, there is a gap phase with no broken symmetry, which would be a disordered phase, okay, a trivial disordered phase. And there's also an, a small incommensurate region in between where there are incommensurate Z3 correlations with uh, algebra, which decay algebraically. So the question we were asking theoretically is what, what is the nature of the phase transition between the Z3 ordered phase and this gapped disordered phase? Okay. Or in other words, so at this point, which is when the phases are zero, we know that it's a three state plot transition. But the question we were asking and the question that was relevant for the Rydberg system is what happens when you introduce the chirality in the system. And I won't go into the details, but what we actually found in a couple of works here about from numerics and field theory is that this is a phase transition where the dynamical critical exponent Z is not equal to one. So you might ask, well, why, why should we care? Well, in one dimensions, having a phase transition where the dynamical critical exponent Z is not equal to one is extremely rare. Because the, this Z, it controls the, scale, the relative scaling between space and time. So when you have Z not equals one, what this tells you is that this, at the phase transition, there's no emergent conformal symmetry. And this is extremely rare in 1D. And in fact, this is the only known strongly coupled critical point for a generic quantum phase transition between two gap states uh, with such a property you know, that's known to date. So this was rather theoretical, but you might ask that, is there a way to measure this experimentally? And the Rydberg system actually presented the first experimental measurement of such a phase transition. And the way you do it is through what's known as the kibble zurich mechanism. So the kibble zurich mechanism proposed by Kibble in the context of cosmological defect formation uh, is as follows. So when you're going through a phase transition, <clears throat> if you're adiabatic, then your system remains in the ground state as you go through. However, near a phase transition, you know that there is a diverging time scale because the gap is closing. And no matter how slow you go, you'll never be adiabatic. And that's what's depicted here in, in, this, in this picture. So as, suppose you start somewhere here, at time minus infinity, and you ramp up some parameter. As you get to a certain point, uh, your gap is closing, and you're no longer adiabatic. At that point, the correlations can, in the system can no longer grow and the system gets frozen. Uh, the correlations get frozen at this point. Okay. And while you go through the phase transition, the system really can't respond to the changing parameters and it remains in this frozen uh, state, which is called this impulse regime. 
And then once it comes out, uh, it unfreezes at this point, which is at time plus t. So this is what's known as the adiabatic impulse adiabatic approximation. But as a result, you see, because you didn't really, you weren't adiabatic throughout the transition, what happens is that there is always a finite density of defects when you emerge on the other side. So you're never fully in the ground state. And what Kibble showed was that, Kibble's work showed, is that if you take like a linear sweep across a phase transition, this correlation length that you get on the other side, it saturates with this particular combination of critical exponents, which are obtained from the exponents I showed you earlier. And for this, so this is real experimental data, which was published in 2019. And so here what you've seen is the sweep into the final detuning at different speeds. Okay. And so you can see that for the fastest speeds, which is this 40 megahertz, these yellow dots, uh, the correlation lengths are really short, which is of the order of like one. Whereas for the slower sweeps, this correlation length is pretty large and it's around five, which is exactly what the cables work mechanism would predict. So like the slower you go, the larger is your correlation length and the lower is your density of defects. And actually using, using the scaling of this correlation length, you're able to obtain some estimate for what this exponent nu, which is this combination of nu plus one plus nu z should be. Okay. And so for instance, is there a question? I, if, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. Um, uh, this, uh, this, this transition, is, isn't it very similar to the landau zener transition? And the correlation length uh, that you write there, that expression, although I don't remember, but it seems to be related to the asymptotic properties of the parabolic cylinder function, which appear in the asymptotic solution of landau zener transition when you're far away from the non-adiabatic point. Isn't that the same thing? Yes, so you can actually derive this result from Randall Zeno transitions. And in fact, I like, uh, think Dittiman Sen has a, has a nice book where he actually derives this in terms of Randall Zeno. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. So now that we have some idea for how this correlation length should behave, uh, by studying their scaling, we can extract this exponent, which is nu over one plus nu z. You can see that for the Ising case, uh, which is the Z2 region over here, this is the theoretical, the green line is a theoretical prediction. And he, here's what you obtain for, from experiments. The more interesting case is this Z3 region, where this dashed line is actually our best theoretical prediction. And you can see this very nice plateau where the experimental data points actually coincide with, with the theoretical predictions. So what this shows is that the Rydberg quantum simulator was able to calculate the critical exponents of a theory that would be highly non-trivial if you asked anyone like 10 years ago, for instance. And this is almost really magical in a sense because this is fundamentally a non-equilibrium process. And you know, you're going through a phase transition, you're making defects. And with all of that, you're actually ending up measuring some equilibrium critical exponents. Uh, is there a question, I think? Shashi? Uh, uh, hi, Ryan. I actually, uh, uh, so this Gibble Zurich mechanism that you mentioned, how is it different that if I quench the system instantaneously at a point, like there is a kind of sudden quench, maybe a step function? Because there as well, we kind of freeze the system um, uh, just before whatever it was, and then we evolve the system according to like a new Hamiltonian. And if I get you correctly, uh, beyond this time scale minus t, essentially that's what happens. So, so in a sense, uh, it's just, a, I mean, it's another way of saying that uh, the problem is studying the non-equilibrium physics uh, in case of a sudden quench. Uh, 
Sure, you you can think about it, you know in that sense that you you know you're in one Hamiltonian for this point, and then at this point you've frozen the Hamiltonian, and you remain in that Hamiltonian, uh, and the Hamiltonian doesn't change as a function of time. Yes, you can think about it in that way. I'm not sure what the scaling relations would be. Uh, it, it certainly won't be of this form, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it can be worked out. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so this was the so in 2019, this experiment actually established something very non-trivial with the Redberg atom array in 1D. So now I want to move on to something more non-trivial, which is what happens in 2D. So in 2D, actually, very recently with uh, upgrades to the setup, uh, the experiments are able to make any sorts of arbitrary geometries that you want. So you just see show you some pictures. These, these are actual experimental images. You see how the square lattice, tilted square lattices, you can, or Kagome lattices, anything that you can imagine. And when they want to have fun, or what they can even make is this nice little simulation. This is not simulation, this is an actual experimental image where you have like Mario uh, with Rydberg Adams and Mario can you know, jump over mushrooms. And these are all actual experimental images. Okay. Oops. Okay. Great. So, so we won't be studying uh, atomic Mario, we'll be studying the square lattice. And even here, there's some very beautiful physics which emerges. So to get some sense for what the phase diagram should look like, in this recent paper, we studied the square lattice Hamiltonian with uh, DMRG on a cylinder. And here, what I'm showing you is this phase diagram as a function of two parameters, which is the interaction range and this delta. Okay. And what I'm plotting here is the entanglement entropy. So we have a cylinder. I partition the cylinder and measure the entanglement entropy. And what you see that the entanglement entropy, as we're going across, as we increase the detuning, actually increases for a bit. And once you get into any ordered phase, it drops very sharply. So these lobes of so the entanglement entropy traces out certain lobes. And using these lobes, you can identify certain ordered phases. Now, there's a lot going on in this phase diagram. I don't worry about it, but I'll show you what it means. So what's the simplest state that we can construct uh, on the square lattice? The simplest possible symmetry breaking state arises if we have just the nearest neighbor blockade. For instance, this is the RB over here. And so you can see that if this yellow is in the Rydberg state, then you cannot have any Rydberg excitation over here. So the nearest places where you can put the Rydberg excitations are somewhere here. And so if you extend this across the array, what you get is the so-called checkerboard phase or, or the nail state uh, in the end. And there are many ways to diagnose this nail state. For instance, you, know, you can look at the order parameter, which is the staggered magnetization. And the staggered magnetization would be zero for some while. And once you enter the ordered phase, the staggered magnetization picks up and saturates. Alternatively, you can look at this, instead of looking at a real space picture, you can look at it in Fourier space. And in Fourier space, what you find is in that this state is characterized by a very sharp peak at, at this pi pi wave vector. So again, let me make a connection to what, what this looks like experimentally. So experimentally, you have this phase diagram. And what one can do is start off somewhere deep in the far right in the disordered phase, and then sweep to certain final points, and then just image the system. And what you and you control these sweeps by varying either the Rabi frequency or the detuning in some certain profiles. And what you can see over here is deep in the far left, where you're in the disordered phase. Uh, if you measure the average with the populations, you really see no feature because everything is in the ground state. Whereas on the far right, you can see this beautiful checkerboard state, which comes out because you're in, in the ordered state. And you can see this transition as you go from the disorder to the checkerboard state very nicely as, through the sequence of points. You can also look at the density density correlation function, for in, instance, and that also shows this feature. And you can also look at the magnitude of the Fourier transform. And as you go from the left to the right, you can see this the magnitude of the pi pi peak increasing. 
So these are very clear experimental signatures that you can actually prepare such a state. So what happens when you increase the blockade radius? And what's the next dense, next available phase for dense packing of liquid atoms? So now, you, as I'll show you, there are two possibilities. If I had to draw a cartoon picture, for instance, uh, <clears throat> I would say that, well, there's a Rydberg atom here, and then I can place one over here, and I can make this the square backbone. But starting from the square backbone, I can do something a little different. Let's focus on this column over here. Say I move this column down by one, and I, oops, and I move this column over here up by one. You can see that this picture on the right has exactly the same density as the picture on the left, okay? but it has a lower interaction energy because in this case, you do not pay the energy price from third nearest neighbor interactions over here. But this is where the long range tails of the interaction actually come into play as the question alluded to earlier. And this is what's known as the star phase. And to put it in the language of like computational problems, what the system actually here is solving is the computational problem of dense packing of spheres in, in a given geometry. Okay. So in the classical case, it seems like the star state over here is always the lowest energy solution. And the actual experimental system, if you look at this, this is the numerical snapshot for the star phase. This is what the typical experimental snapshots look like. Okay. And <clears throat> Here you can see that you know, there are regions of local ordering where this it's not as clear as the checkerboard, but you can still see the emergence of this phase very clearly. Now, these are classical phases, and you might ask, well, if these are totally classical, why do we need a quantum simulator? Well, it turns out that there is actually a very interesting phase in between the uh, this, this star phase and the checkerboard phase that I showed you earlier, and that's known as the striated phase. So in the striated phase, the, the the profile looks something like this. And if you stare at this for a minute, you, you'll say, wait a minute, this is the backbone that you showed me earlier and said this was energetically unfavorable. Well, that's correct. The backbone by itself is energetically unfavorable. But if you look at these intermediate sites, you can see that they're not quite in the ground state and they have some partial excitations. And this partial excitations are telling you that they, these, the striated phase is actually being stabilized by uh, the transverse field or this quantum term. So if I have to write down a mean field description for the state, which actually captures the wave function very accurately, what's happening here is that on these intermediate sites, uh, instead of the system being totally in the ground state, what you have is a, a a block factor, a vector in the block sphere that points slightly away from the south pole. So what this means is that you have a ground state, but with a small admixture of the Rydberg state. And similarly, on these yellow sites, you don't have a pure Rydberg, but like Rydberg with a small admixture of ground. And what the system is doing this way is that it maximizes the density of Rydberg excitation. So it gains the most energy from this detuning term, but at the same time, it doesn't have to pay as much of an energy penalty for from the blockade. Uh, so this transverse field lowers the energy of the striated background. And here, uh, just so it's always good to see what the experiments have to say when we make theoretical predictions. And here, this is real data from this paper that was just uh, published towards the end of last year. And so here I'm showing you experimental data from the checkerboard phase. Okay. And this is from the striated phase and this is from the star phase. These are post-selected snapshots so you can see very clear ordering over here. And in particular, if we look at say the order parameters for the checkerboard phase, the striated phase and the star phase, you can see that they form these, these big lobes. Uh, and these lobes actually agree pretty well with what we had uh, predicted numerically as well. And so what, what we have achieved with this quantum simulator is, is to solve a, a very complicated optimization problem, which reveals many exotic density wave order states. There's one very interesting point that I'd like to emphasize here is that using similar Kibble-Zurich type measurements, as I pointed out for the 1D case, 
you can actually measure critical exponents here too. And in particular, by measuring the growth of correlations when you go from the disordered phase to the checkerboard phase, uh, we were able to show the first experimental demonstration of a 2 plus 1D Ising quantum phase transition. Uh, so this phase transition is, has been well known, of course, it's, it's a very standard phase transition. But what happens in condensed matter systems, like you know, a magnetic material, is that the critical field that you need to tune across these two phases is really, really high. It's gigantic, it's several hundred Teslas, and you can't do that. Whereas in this <clears throat> cold atom system, we were actually able to obtain the first demonstration of this quantum phase transition. So the full phase diagram actually has uh, other ordered phases, with more, which are more intricate crystals, but <clears throat> that the, the experiments are still looking into that. So the bottom line is that we've identified several symmetry breaking phases. Um, but what can there be other sorts of ordered phases in the system which are not necessarily symmetry breaking order? And by that I mean can there be topological order in the system? So that's what I'm going to show you in the last uh, 15 minutes of my presentation. But before we go on, are there any questions about the square lattice that I've said so far? Okay. If not, let me move on to what happens in non bipartite lattices. So, when we are trying to look for spin liquid phases, uh, what we know from numerics, uh, numerical simulations over many, many years is that we want to look for frustrated lattices. Okay. And so, in particular, one of the lattices that's widespread and very widely used is, is the so called Kagome lattice. And in this Kagome lattice, if we place the sites, uh, if you place the Rydberg atoms, we get some very interesting physics. So let's look at what happens here. So there, once again, I'm plotting the entanglement entropy, and you can see that there are these regions of very low entanglement entropy, and these lobes are my ordered phases. And these ordered phases actually turn out to be truly crucial for understanding what happens in between them. So in this case, the first ordered phase that occupies this huge lobe over here is the so-called nematic phase. In the nematic phase, the spatial ordering looks something like this, uh, where on every, so one out of every three sublattices on the Kagome triangles that is excited to the Rydberg state, while the remaining two remain on the ground state. So this phase of matter, this breaks C3 rotational symmetry, but it preserves translation symmetry, as you can see. So that's the nematic phase. The other ordered phase that you can find near this top region is the so-called staggered phase. And to understand the staggered phase, you can start from the nematic and ask that what happens if I blockade these green sites as well? Well, you have to place the excitation slightly further apart then. And this, in the staggered phase, you can place them at a distance which is of square root seven, and that generates this density wave ordering. And uh, yes, please, Shashi. Uh, uh, Ryan, uh, Hi. just a, a clarification. I mean, what was the partition for calculating the entropy? Like between what and what? So we are calculating, uh, like we're performing DMRG on a cylinder. So you by partition the cylinder, and that's about the two partitions. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Okay. So these are so this was the ordering for the pneumatic and the staggered phase. And sometimes instead it's useful to look at the profiles in Fourier space instead of the profiles in real space. And they contain equivalent information and we can identify the phases from the ordering peaks. Okay. So now <clears throat> the thing to note is that in addition to the entanglement entropy, there's another way of quantifying these phase boundaries. And to do so, what one can look at is some thermodynamic quantity, like for instance, the ground state energy. And if you look at the ground state energy and take its second derivative with respect to, say, this detuning, what that amounts to is a susceptibility. 
And we know from the theory of phase transitions that if we are looking at the susceptibility near a phase transition, the susceptibility should have a peak. And where wherever it peaks, that's usually a pseudo critical point. That's what these yellow diamonds over here represent. So the susceptibility peaks actually coincide pretty well with the lobes over here. So now I want to focus on this region that lies in between the staggered and the cinematic phase. Okay. And what we find actually when you do this calculation is that the susceptibility actually shows a very clear peak when you're going from this left-hand side to this right-hand side. Okay. Uh, there are other quantities which also show this peak, but what I wanted to emphasize is that if I looked at the entanglement entropy, when I'm going from the, one of the disordered phases to the ordered phases, as you can see over here for the green dots and the red dots, uh, the entanglement entropy rises till you reach the phase transition and then drops very sharply. Whereas here, as you go through this transition or, or as you go through the susceptibility maximum, the entanglement entropy just keeps on rising. It doesn't, it doesn't drop. So what this is telling you is that if if the susceptibility is truly signaling a phase transition, it's not a phase transition to some simple ordered state, for sure. And one might wonder, well, this, you know, we have edges, maybe there's some edge transition going on, which is a certain possibility that we can't rule out. But it's actually, we were able to reproduce the susceptibility peak in exact diagonalization calculations on a torus, so with no boundaries. So this region, this in between uh, over here is what we designate the liquid regime. And it's liquid in the sense that if I look at the spatial profile on the left-hand side, you can see that the spatial profile is uniform, almost uniform, featureless. And even on the, the right-hand side, so of, of these dots, what you can see is that despite some funny effects on the edge, uh, where you see some signs of ordering, the bulk is completely featureless. So what this is telling, and you can confirm that from the structure factor as well. So what this is telling us is that despite being at a large enough detuning or at a very high chemical potential where the system just wants to maximize the number of Rydberg excitations, uh, it is not forming a solid phase. In fact, you're definitely at a detuning where the staggered phase is formed and the pneumatic phase is formed, but and even on the edge, you're starting to see some signs of ordering, but the bulk it resists this ordering for some reason. So in that sense, it's a liquid sandwich between two solids. So this is highly intriguing and it smells a lot like uh, spin liquids. Okay. So let me just give a very quick introduction to spin liquids and then I'll show you the connection. So the idea of behind spin liquid states isn't exactly new. Uh, it has been around for a long time, since the 70s, when Philip Anderson actually wrote down this resonating valence bond wave function. So what Anderson had in mind was something different. He was trying to understand the physics of high temperature superconductivity. activity. Uh, and in that case, if you think of a Mott insulator of, of spins on, say, a triangular lattice, coupled by some anti-ferromagnetic exchange, then you can imagine a state, the wave function that he proposed, where these these spins they form nearest neighbor singlets okay and these singlets they form these dimers which are represented by this ellipse and you can think of a wave function a bronze wave function as a dimer covering of the lattice okay? so it's a superposition with some coefficient cd of all these dimer coverings now this uh quantum dimer model has its own life even if i forget about these degrees of freedom as electrons, and I treat the dimers as fundamental degrees of freedom. And you can see that these dimers can resonate. If, for instance, as you can see, these dimers are resonating, and that's why it's called a resonating valence bond state. So today we understand that this quantum dimer model on the triangular lattice that has what's known as the, the resonating valence bond phase there is actually a Z2 spin liquid. And it's interesting to ask what are the excitations of the Z2 spin liquid. So the first excitation that we can consider is suppose we have an unpaired spin over here, just one. Okay. Um, and if you were thinking about this without the underlying spins, if you were thinking about it just in terms of dimers, this would be a monomer over here, an empty site. And the spin, as you can see, it can hop around and 
propagate by flipping these timers. But if you think about how I would create such a, such a freely moving excitation, I can create such an ex excitation by destroying a dimer, say this red one that I've highlighted over here. But when you try to do that, you immediately see that these spin-ons, they can only be created in pairs by any local operator. And then these, each of these spin-ons, once you've created them, they can hop around independently and they have a life of their own. So this is actually a manifestation of what's known as fractionalization. So you had a dimer degree of freedom and then you fractionalized that into two independent quasi-particles. There's another interesting uh, excitation of this Z2 spin liquid, which is known as the bison. So the way to think about the bison is as follows. So it's like a flux excitation. And at this point in the triangular lattice, we have a bison. We can take a cut, which is this represented by this line, and the wave function with this for the state with the bison is almost the same as the wave function for just the time covering, but with a subtle difference, which is that for every configuration where these dimers cross this this cut, I, my wave function picks up a minus one. So for instance, this configuration comes with this minus one. This configuration comes with a minus one because this dimer intersects this cut only once. And this comes with a minus one. But this configuration over here, this will come with a plus one because there are two of these. So that's that's the bison state. So just to summarize, so we have these anions and anionic excitations in the Z2 spin liquid. So spinons and the bisons, they're both bosons, but they're mutual semions. And their bound state is actually a fermion. So just to summarize, for the Z2 spin liquid, we have these anions that I told you, and they exhibit interesting mutual statistics. Uh, but the Z2 spin liquid, the key defining feature is what's known as topological order. So if I took this system and placed it on a manifold with non-trivial topology, like say a torus, uh, what you would see is that you'd get a non-trivial ground state degeneracy, and in fact, for a torus, you can get a four-fold ground state degeneracy. And the way to think about this is that the Z2 spin liquid is actually a deconfined phase of a Z2 gauge theory. So what does this have to do with all of the Rydberg system that I was talking about? Well, this is, and I'll wrap up in a couple more minutes. And so uh, here's the connection. So, so far I've shown you these pictures of the, the dimers rotating on the, like moving around with the lattice, but I haven't written down the Hamiltonian for the dimers. Uh, a very general dimer Hamiltonian that you can write down is the so-called roxar kivelson Hamiltonian. We have a term that flips plaquettes, and you have an interaction between plaquettes. Okay, and so that's the general quantum dimer model. And what people have studied over the years are these quantum dimer models in various uh, limits, where you have either one dimer per site. That's the famous moschner the dimer model. Uh, or where you have two dimers per site. For instance, here on the triangular lattice, you can see that there are two dimers on every site, which means that this is a loop model. Uh, and this was studied pretty recently by Roy Chaudhary and uh, others. And similarly, for uh, you can study a model with, which has three dimers per site. And although these models look very similar, uh, there is a subtle difference, which is that the Z2 spin liquid in this region is not the same as the Z2 spin liquid over here. Could, and that has to do with what's known as odd or even spin liquids. Uh, as, so a constraint of an odd number of dimers per site leads to an odd C2 spin liquid, and similarly for you know, the even case. So what does that have to do with our Rydberg system? Well, at very large detuning, we can approximately map the Rydberg system to a model of bosons on the Kagome lattice. Okay. So note that in our Rydberg system, the number of excitations isn't conserved. But if you have very large detuning, we can define a filling. So here the filling is one third, because you have like one out of every three sites occupied, and here the filling is one sixth. This was the pneumatic phase that I showed you earlier and the staggered phase that I showed you. And now to make the mapping to the triangle lattice timer model, what we can do is connect the centers of the Kagome hexagons. And what you see is that this forms a triangular lattice. And then we make the association that if there is a Rydberg excitation on that link, 
we place a dime right there. And then when we're drawing this picture, you can immediately see that this forms the solid phase, the pneumatic phase of the even quantum diamond model on the triangular lattice. So our lattice pneumatic phase is exactly this phase and, and the phase diagram of the diamond model. Similarly, if we map out, you know, make this correspondence in the staggered phase of Rydberg's, we can see that this is actually the solid phase of the odd quantum diamond model, which is over here. And so this immediately tells us that in the Daimler language, we know that both of these solid phases are bordered by uh, spin liquid phases, which are proximate to, to these solids. So what we conjecture is that in between, there should be a quantum liquid phase, which is of the odd or, or even Z2 spin liquid type. And I would just like to conclude with by pointing out this very recent experiment, which was put out on the archive um, last month. And we are actually we are considering uh, not the casual lattice, but a closely related lattice, which is this Ruby lattice. And using very similar ideas, which is this mapping from a Rydberg system to Daimler models, uh, what the experiments were actually able to show is that you generate a state which resembles an odd Z2 spin liquid. In this case, the mapping is to a Daimler model of the Kagome lattice. And this it, this would be a, a very big milestone because people have been trying to realize uh, quantum spin liquids in condensed matter systems for a very, very long time. And the program, and this could be the first like, clear cut non-controversial evidence for it. All right, so with that, uh, that brings me to my conclusion. So hopefully in this talk, I've shown you that these Rydberg atom arrays, they're very versatile, scalable platforms for, um, for studying different phases of matter and quantum simulation. We can, we have, these experiments have realized up to 256 qubits. So that's a huge number. And by sh generating these phases, which I've also showed the experimental snapshots of, what the experiments demonstrate is not only do you have 256 qubits, you can generate a coherent wave function for 256 qubits. And that is a, really a, a milestone uh, in this field, I would say. And so in, in one and two dimensions, we have a variety of exotic phases, several interesting phase transitions, and maybe even the first signatures of topological order. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to address any lingering questions if I Right for, this, for such a beautiful talk, it was very well done. So, any any questions? We have yes, we still have some time for a few questions. So, any questions? If not, then let us thank the speaker again. Oh yes, Sudhir, why you have a question? Yeah, you know I uh, I I generally uh, start asking questions because I want to give time to people to start framing their questions. And so uh, my questions are not very, uh, very deep. So, very beautiful and detailed talk, which I did not understand everything, of course, um, that everything should be diluted by, I don't know, 10 to the power something. But I want to know something, which is that uh, there is this very important problem of uh, obtaining virial coefficients for ideal anion gas in ideal gas of identical particles in two dimensions, which becomes very difficult because of counting problem of in braid groups. So you have to do a lot of phase countings. You think these kind of enumeration problems are are addressed are are better addressed by quantum uh, simulators? That's a that's a very hard question. And in general, the challenge with any of these questions, any computational problem like that, is to frame it in a in a language which can actually be encoded on the simulator. So this particular first enumeration question that you uh, have raised, I, I don't believe there is any mapping of that into the Rydberg system. There could be in the future. I can't rule that out. Uh, but since you asked, let me point this out, that there's this one problem, which is known as the maximal independent set problem in graph theory. It is essentially an enumeration problem, which tells you that suppose you have a graph uh, with some vertices V and some edges E. Okay? You want to find out the, uh, an independent subset 
an independent subset of this graph is a subset which is not connected so that no two pairs in this subset are connected okay in the graph uh, so this is a complicated topology problem as you can understand and the maximal independent set asks you is that of this graph what are the nodes that i can isolate which will lead to the largest possible independent set okay. now this is an enumeration problem at heart and but this problem has actually a very efficient representation in terms of the Rydberg system and experiments are actually looking into how, how to solve this essentially fundamentally quantum computation problem with the Rydberg system but i'm sure that as people spend more and more time to looking for algorithms uh, Rydbergs and other neutral atom systems i'm sure there'll be more problems we can we can solve yeah mm -hmm. thank you um, <clears throat> you mentioned in one of your work a connection with semions um, yes yeah. yes for so yeah. that's yeah. a particular value of the fraction right and right right for that particular state of semions, would one be able to write um, something more than just the ground state or its variation as a function of, I mean, other thermodynamically relevant quantities? All right, so what happens here is that in the Z2 spin liquid, you have this, this spin on, which is a quasi particle, and you have a vison, which is uh, another quasi particle. Now, both of these are bosons. And when you take a spin on around the vison, so suppose you keep the vison stationary and move the spin on around it, the spin on picks up a, the wave function picks up a factor of uh, minus one. So that's a pi phase. So that, that's why they're mutual semions. Now, in this Rydberg platform or in any Z2 spin liquid, for instance, you can create these excitations. And in the Rydberg language, what this means is that the dimer covering is not perfect. You have some mon a finite density of monomers, so that are sites which are not connected by any dimers, and those excitations actually can be identified with these spinouts and bisons. So, so you will have particles with these mutual semionic statistics when you prepare this spin liquid in in the Rydberg platform. Yes. And thank you, thank you. And the, so the hope, I, I mean, the, the long-term goal of the field would be that once you have the Z2 spin liquid, maybe you can build a topologically protected qubit. So right now we have 200 qubits, but they're not, they don't have topological protection. But if you're in a Z2 spin liquid phase, that protection comes for free because you're unaffected by local perturbations. Right. I guess we have a question from Shashi. Uh, yeah, so uh, right. Uh, thanks for a, such a beautiful talk, um, quite illustrative as well. Um, I, I kind of uh, wrote to you about uh, in the chat box about the interaction that long range versus the short range. Uh, most of the problem that you have uh, kind of addressed is looks like a short range problem, right? As far as the potentials are concerned. Uh, while the Rydberg atom kind of uh, positive power law interaction potential looks genuinely a long range uh, system. So how are you kind of addressing this and whether it's a genuine candidate for studying problems which have like like long range Kitaev model or, or something like that? It's a very good question. And uh, so let me point out two things about that. So when you have these long range tails, uh, they fall off as one over r to the sixth. And because this coefficient c6, if I'm considering interaction c6 over r to the sixth, uh, you can see that they fall off pretty fast depending on where I am in the blockade regime. So for instance, with say my blockade radius is uh, like 2.5 or something, then it suffices to keep up to third nearest neighbor interactions. Now, if I'm interested in blockade physics beyond third nearest neighbors, then I have to keep the corresponding term in the tail of the interaction, which will determine that. So depending on which parameter regime you're looking at, it suffices to approximate it with a certain number of terms in the tail. 
the other point that I'd like to mention is that when we are studying phase transitions, uh, in, in many cases, these long range tails really don't play much of a role. Uh, and by appealing to universality, you can say that even the microscopics are different for say, a pure transverse realizing model versus an Isaac model with one of our artistic decaying interactions. By uh, universality, the transition is in the same universality class. So that simplifies life for us. So, so I hope this is a twofold uh, answer. Uh, that's nice. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I don't think there are any further questions. So let's thank the speaker again for such a beautiful talk. And now we have the second speaker of the day. And uh, that's Shraddha Singh. So Shraddha, you're around. I can see you. Shraddha? Something wrong with the bandwidth? No, no. But there is a bandwidth problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a bandwidth problem. Yeah. I mean, the error message says something like uh, due to low bandwidth from local computer conditions, it, the video is not available. Okay, we stop our video. Maybe that helps. No, no, no. I think that's more of a local problem. Uh -huh. That won't help. You can see everyone, yes. Uh, uh, Shraddha, we are unable to unmute you because of some bandwidth problem at your end. It seems to have got, no, it's a bit unstable, it seems. Huh? Yeah, there she is. Okay, Shata, all set? Yeah. Good. So let's welcome the next speaker, Shata Singh. She, uh, well, she is an old student. So she did MSc from uh, Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences, did a good job there. Then uh, during her uh, master's thesis, she worked with uh, Kashefi at Sormon and uh, founded the Quantum Protocol Zoo, which is an online repository of the quantum cryptographic protocols. And now she is doing a PhD at uh, the Department of Physics at Yale, where she's working with uh, Steve Gerbin and Shruti Puri on uh, bosonic qubits and error corrections with uh, tailored surface codes. So welcome, Shraddha. It's good to see you after a long time. And uh, it's over to you. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction, Professor. It's wonderful to see everyone again. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, especially given six years ago, Professor Sudhir Jain handed over to me my first book on quantum computation for a reading assignment when I expressed my interest in the field. And I'd consulted with Professor Amiya Bhagwat also for our, um, opportunities in research in QC. So yeah, it's an honor to be presenting today. So 
I am a PhD student, co-advised by Professor Stephen M. Gervin and Professor Shruti Puri. We work closely in collaboration with experimentalists at Michelle Devere's lab as well. And today I will be presenting this work we published last year with Buttis Woyer and Stephen M. Gervin, my advisor. So let me share my screen. Network again. Something wrong with the network again. Shraddha, are you around? See. Can see her. Yeah, she's there. Um, yes, she is. No. Can't see her. I can't see her. I don't think she's around. No, she's there. She's there? Oh, yeah, yeah of course, of course, of course. So I think um, WebEx doesn't support Keynote. I will have to download the app to share my screen. Uh -oh. Sorry about this technical issue. Yeah, it's okay. Is it working all right, Shita?
Ah, uh, probably we need to unmute her. Um, yeah, I'm unmuted now. Okay. So um, I've downloaded the app and it's taking some time to launch and I'm just waiting okay. for that. Let me. हो जाएगा थोड़ी देर इट्स ओके सो लेट मी ज्वाइन फ्रॉम क्रोम इंस्टेड I just okay. I don't know. Can I do it? Hey, it's from Chrome. Joined again. I think we'll have to unmute her. She's unmuted. No, not yet. Okay, Shatta, yeah. all set.
um, maybe I'll see my stream. Oh, my cat. Can you see my screen? Michelle, you have something to say. Michelle. Yeah, no, she was asking that uh, can we see her screen? So I was telling her no. Ah, we are not okay. able to see her screen. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So it would allow me to only share Chrome tab. Um, Michelle, you have a suggestion, it seems. Right. Yes, right. Yes, right. Yes, but, uh, Shanta, are you using a Mac? Yes, I am using a Mac. Okay, so in Mac, you have to give the system permission to show your screens. So you have to go to system settings yeah. and preferences and then. Yes, I just did that actually. Um, Hmm. Ryan, you want to say something more? So Michelle had made a suggestion here that uh, you may try converting your file into a PDF. So can you share PDF instead? Is that possible? Yes, um, I can try. Um, I actually, my system, yes, my system uh, needs the permission. I did grant it, but that seems to be the issue. So I don't, I don't think I can share any specific application yet. Oh. Oh, it's Okay, let me try rejoining you. That should work. Uh, well, the possibility is she could email her uh, presentation to you and we can do that remotely and let her give a talk and the slides could be changed by some of us. That probably would be the uh, worst case scenario, but in principle it can be done.
अनम्यूट ही नहीं कर पा रहे हैं टू सेवन फाइव सिक्स वन कर हम लोग नहीं बोल वो वो नहीं हो रही प्रेजेंटेशन का हो गया प्रॉब्लम हाँ श्रद्धा तुम्हारी आवाज नहीं आ रही है थोड़ी जोर से सर आई एम नॉट एबल टू शेयर माय स्क्रीन एट ऑल हाँ स्क्रीन कर लो शेयर और है वो नहीं रहा कह रही है वो कि स्क्रीन शेयर नहीं हो रहा अच्छा स्क्रीन शेयर नहीं हो रही तुम अगर पीडीएफ uh, फाइल फिर किसी को भेज दो तो वो चेंज करे तुम्हारी क्या करना है कैसे करेंगे अच्छा एनिमेशन है वो शेयरिंग करते समय जो ऑप्शन आता है कुछ मोशन एंड वीडियो वो सब प्रिजर्व करेंगे I I I I think I sh- I- I send you you the the PDF. Yeah. 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 So 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 Nishal 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 Yes. Ah, yes. I'm able to share. So, um, send me the this only. I am uh, Shraddha. I'm sending you in a chat. Oh, can I send it to you in chat? Um. Yes, I think you can. Yeah, email address. Huh. Ah. Email address. I'll give you. Huh. Do you send me the keynote right? Yeah. I'll be able to. Yeah, do it. Yes. हाँ निश्चित शेयर करते देखो तुम्हारा हाँ हाँ नो एक्चुअली फुली स्क्रीन भी शेयर की जा सकती है और नहीं कुछ नहीं है कुछ भी नहीं नहीं उनका शेयर ऑप्शन ही नहीं आ रहा मैं वो किस कर दी मैं 
Fine, fine. It's convincing enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Share it with you, Jason. Hi. I'm waiting for you. हाँ, yes, downloading it. चलो भाई शुरू हो जाते हैं। I think since it was the last talk, everybody was ready to wrap up and technology said no. See, well, we have almost infinite buffer now because this is the last talk. So. Yeah, there it goes. Just a second, just a second. Shadda, your volume is very low. We have been here for a while. Your voice is not coming here. Okay. Can you hear me now? I'm audible now? No. What? What? I'll try my headphones. Is it visible on full screen? Yes, it is. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Shraddha has got it. Shraddha has muted. Muted? Yes. I will mute myself. Shraddha, give me the next question. Yes. So, can I... Am I audible now? Yes. Okay, great. So, yeah, I already gave the introduction and I'm going to present this work we published last year with Batis Royer and Stephen M. Gervin. And I would also like to thank some helpful conversations with these following people here. So, next slide. <laughs> So by now, by now, everybody has an idea that a qubit is a two-level system, which is represented by the block sphere. Um, the two states lying on the zero and one axis, sorry, the two states lying on the z-axis are the zero and one states. Could you press next, next one? Um, then next we have the x eigenstates, the plus and minus states, which are the zero and uh, superposition of zero and one states with a phase of plus minus five. Then next we have the y eigenstates plus minus i states, which are the superpositions of zero and one states with plus minus pi by two um, phase. So if we rotate by uh, along the x-axis by pi, it should take your zero state to one state or one state to zero state. Similarly, if we rotate along z, by pi, it should take your plus state to minus state. My Pauli y operators can be written using the x and z operators as such. 
And thanks, Mr. This is green good. Um, and X and Z should anti -dominate. Now, Steve has already talked about error correction quite a bit, but I still review. Um, it's never bad to go through the same things again. So say we're doing a uh, quantum computation, and as a result of which, we have um, we are we are in a state of a superposition of zero one. We don't know about anything about alpha and beta unless we measure it. Now, how about I say we go through a bit flip? So next slide. That would change the probabilities of getting a zero and a one, but we would have no idea about it. Similarly, we could also have a phase flip where my plus states go to minus state, and that would change the phase of my state. Again, I will have no idea about it um, since it's also an operation, and I would never know that, that this happened due to an error in my system. And that's an issue. Now, what if I create an abstraction of these two level systems with using multiple systems? Here, I've taken, a, I've taken three qubits and gone to a larger Hilbert space of eight levels. I've defined my zero logical and one logical to be the states which need the maximum number of bit flips to be converted into each other. Thus, um, can you press next? Thus, my previous qubit would be in the state alpha zero logical plus beta lo one logical. Um, next. Yes. So this is discrete value, uh, variable error correction. Now, in case of an error, we would go to error subspace. Next, please. These are the states which do not belong to my logical subspace. That means with no logical operation, can I go to these states? That means whenever you are in one of these states, you know there was an error. So say there was a single bit flip error. In that case, my alpha zero logical plus beta one logical will go to the state. Um, next, please. Alpha zero one zero plus beta is one zero one, and both the, uh, and this is a superposition of the states in the error subspace. So we know there was an error. Next, please. Now, error now, correction now. would take these states out of the error subspace back to the closest logical subspace it is. In. Next, please. Now, that looks like it solves the issue, but does it? What if you have two bit flips? In that case, you will go to the wrong error subspace. And say you have one logical, so you were in the one logical state and you had two bit flips, you will go to the lower error subspace here. And what that would do is it will correct the state to zero logical and you have a lot zero log you have a logical error now. So if the bit flip of uh, the probability of two bit flips is significant, you Three qubit code will not help us, and we will need to go to a five qubit code, and so on. Depending on what's the error probability, we would either need uh, an awful lot of qubits to save yourself, or you just need to make better qubits with lower, lower error rates. How about I told you I could do error correction with just one physical entity using bosonic error correction? My next slide says that. Yes, that's right. So. Using a single harmonic oscillator, we can correct small errors. There are several ways to do this. Steve's talk about binomial code, and in this talk, we will focus on position eigenstate spaces, the gottesman kittai Preskill states, also known as the GKP states. Next slide. My talk will be divided into, into the following sections. First, I will discuss with you the ideal GKP encoding, why it makes sense, and what it is, and how it is able to protect us against errors without any additional constraints. Then I will tell you about a realistic encoding of these ideal GKP states. And then I will tell you how to stabilize these and do error correction on these states. Finally, I will show you some numerical results. Um, so let's get started. Next slide. The GKP code words are encoded in phase space. So it is important to know what that is and what are the tools from the phase space that we could use. Let's take a vacuum state. Next. Now. We can define the position and momentum quadratures here with creation and annihilation operators as such. Any noise in the nature can be seen as a small force which changes position or momentum or both of an entity. So let's see what, what displacement in phase space looks like. This particular operator displaces you in along the x-axis. And now the next operator that will be shown on the screen would displace it along the p-axis. 
for um, convenience, I will just I will now use this further notation, this following notation for displacement operators, where an imaginary alpha will displace along the x quadrature and a real alpha would displace along the p quadrature. Any error can be modeled as a small disturbance in the phase space. So that sort of gives you an intuition why we need to encode our qubit in phase space such that we can correct for errors by checking for any unexpected displacement in the phase space or any, any unexpected change in the phase space. To see a more mathematical picture, let's take an example of the oscillator error here. Say we have a photon loss rate of kappa. It can be rewritten as a combination of translations in position and momentum as following for small enough kappa. So this gives us an idea about why we chose phase space to encode this particular um, error correction code. Next slide. We'll show you what, what it is now. So an important reason to be encoding qubits in, a, in phase space is that X and P operators don't commute. And hence, translations in X and P don't commute either. So if one traces a path in phase space and comes back to the origin, as shown by the next figure, then the phase acquired will be equal to the covered area. Um, can you press next? So this exponent would tell you the covered area here. Unless this area is 2 pi, these displacements will not commute. And so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that a quantum state should enclose an area of 2 pi in phase space. To give you an intuition behind why this is the case, I'm going to coin a new term related to error correction, which has been used previously in this conference, the stabilizers. Stabilizers are operators on the logical subspace of which code words are plus one eigenstates of. Stabilizers are important since every time we measure the stabilizer, we're projecting onto the logical subspace. Since we want to correct for bit flips and face flips, we need two types of stabilizers. One that stabilizes the 0, 1 basis, that is TX, and corrects for bit flips or bit flip type errors. And the second one, which stabilizes the plus minus state basis and corrects for face flip type errors. So these two should commute. And why that is? The case because we want our state to be a simultaneous eigenstates of these two operators, Tx and Tp. And that could only happen if the area was, was 2 pi. Now, since we're encoding a, a qubit, which is comprised of two states, the area, com, the area enclosed by R, Tx, and Tp should be 4 pi. And if your errors along x and p are the same, are, have, the same uh, have the same rate, then this is the best choice here. So, can you press next? So this, these Tx and Tp will stabilize my code word. So um, Tp stabilizes the 0, 1 basis. Sorry, um, there's an error here. So Tx stabilizes the 0, 1 basis. Half a tra translation along this axis will take you from the 0 state to the 1 state. And thus, that's your x logical. Can you press next? Thanks. Um, similarly, T, um, Tp, oh, OK. So similarly, TP stabilizes the plus minus space, uh, basis. So going halfway along this stabilizer will take you from the plus state to the minus state. And that's my Z logical. Next, please. Thanks. So now you can see that X logical and Z logical enclose an area of pi. Next. That means my X logical and Z logical anti-commute just like we want. And now my Y logical that can be described as an X translation and then a Z translation with an additional pi by two phase. Next, please. Which is given by this relation here. So we have all our logical operators here. On the left, we have our stabilizer generators, which are the basis for stabilizers. That is any linear combination of TX and TP would stabilize my code space. That is my, my code word would be an eigen state of any linear combination of TX and TP. On right, I have defined my logical operators. Now, let's look at what the states look like. So first, starting with the stabilizer Tx, my 0, 1 basis should be an eigenstate of Tx. And so any, since it's a translation along P, infinitely squeezed states along P at integer multiple of square root of pi are eigenstates of this stabilizer. This here is our, the, last one, the red peaks were the zero state. 
with peaks centered at even multiples of square root pi. And now if I displace by square root of pi, applying x logical, we get the one logical state. Next, please. Similarly, infinitely squeezed states along x are eigenstates of TP. And any infinitely squeezed state along x at integer multiples of square root pi will be the eigenstate of this operator. Shown here are the peaks centered at even multiples of square root of pi, which represent our plus state. And if we move halfway through the stabilizer operator, that is shift by root pi along p, applying z logical, we get the minus state, the minus logical state. Next, please. Now, our code space is the simultaneous eigenstate of these two operators. So it will lie on the intersection of all the previous lines shown, that is on this grid state. So I'm going to list out all everything I've told you about this encoding so far. So first, we have the logical operators. Then I told you about the stabilizer generators and that they commute. Next, please. And next. And then I told you because it comprises, it encloses an area of 4 pi, my x logical and z logical anti commute. Um, next. Yeah, thanks. Now let's see how we can correct errors in this code, uh, in this code space. So here, the peaks that you see, the red peaks are your zero logical um, states and the blue peaks are your one logical state. Since the GKP and GPK, GKP code um, codes are eigenstates of the stabilizers, measuring these stabilizers should give us some information about errors. Um, the, zero one state, the zero one states are eigenstates of this TX stabilizer. Um, sorry, the TX, stab uh, the TX stabilizer stabilizes the zero one basis. And this stabilizer can be written as cos 2 root pi x plus i sine 2 root pi x. Now, when we plot these curves on top of these peaks, we can see that the cosine curves, the peak of the peaks of the cosine curves coincide with the peaks of zero and one states. And the sine curve has no overlap with these peaks. So then, if we measure sine 2 root pi x, that is the imaginary part of the stabilizer, I should get zero as my measurement outcome in case of no error. Next, please. However, in case of error, there will be a small overlap with, there will be some overlap with the sine curve and the measurement outcome will not be zero, but it will be e to the i theta. Next. Now to correct, I will just apply a displacement e to the minus i theta, depending on what side um, of the peak the error pertain. So for example, if we, the peak overlaps with the positive part of sine, I would go right. And if it overlaps with the negative part of sine, I would go left. However, if you see the zeros of the sine curve, which we want to depend uh, base our error correction on, um, are apart from being at the peaks, they're also at just midway between these peaks, that is at root pi by two distance from each peak. So if I move, if the displace, if the error displacement is more than root pi by two, I will be stabilized, I will be, my peaks would be corrected to the wrong peak. So say the red peaks, the red peaks, um, yeah, sorry. So say the red peaks are displaced by root pi by two, then instead of being over to the, to the left, then instead of being overlap, then instead of overlapping with the positive part of sine, it would be overlapping with the negative part of sine and hence, you will be matched to the blue peak instead of the red peak, and that's a logical error. That is, you went from zero, one, zero logical to one logical. So this code space can correct for errors only if the display, the display, the magnitude of displacement is less than root pi by two. Next. Um, let's see how to implement this measurement uh, of stabilizers. So we take an oscillator state psi and a transform in its ground state, apply a rotation along y by pi by two, to change this G, um, to change this transform ground state to the plus one eigenstate of the X operator of the transform, that is G plus E. Now, to measure the stabilizer, I will apply con a control displacement of two root pi, that is U, which applies a displacement of two root pi along P if you're in the excited state, else does nothing. Now, what this does is, it has a back action on the transform such that the transform's Sigma y operator has an expectation value of sine two root pi x. Can you play, press next? 
Yes. So that means if I measure the Y of my transmon, I will get what I wanted. And that solves the problem. So I will just make, how, how do I measure Y on my transmon? I just apply um, a rotation by X, a rotation along X by pi by two. Next, please. And then I measure my qubit in the Z basis. Um, yes, yes. Depending on the measurement outcome, I will displace um, my oscillator state by plus delta or minus delta. Similarly, for TP, I can do the same process using U, where um, using the following U, where I displace using the operator e to the minus i2 root pi p if my qubit is in the E state. Now, the issue with this scheme is that I'm trying to do bitwise correction for continuous errors. So like I told you in the previous scheme, I should get, um, so the result of measuring sine two root pi x should give me e to the i theta in case of error here, I will just get a measurement outcome of plus minus one. With, where if it's plus one, I will displace towards the right. If it's minus one, I'll displace towards the left by a fixed quantity delta. Now, to in, to get the, this does not get the full information, but it gets one bit of the information about errors. So in order to get the full information about the errors, you have to, you have to do it multiple times. You have to do multiple rounds of destabilize, perform multiple rounds of destabilizer measurement circuits. And for each of those rounds, you have to do this plus minus delta correction based on the measurement outcome. So there's a lot of post-processing, which makes the entire process slow and gives way to more errors. An autonomous protocol instead does not measure qubits, so we can reset the qubit without any post-processing, which makes the entire circuit faster and less prone to errors. Let's see how we can do that. Next, please. These peaks here for zero and one indicate that our states can be written as such. Next. Where we have peaks at all even multiples of root pi for zero state and all odd multiples of root pi for one in position. So what we're measuring is equivalent to measuring this X modular quadrature next and correct accordingly next. Thanks. Now a second approach for stabilization in dissipa is dissipation engineering, which has been used to stabilize other bosonic codes like cat codes, etc. The idea is building a recall force to stabilize the peaks in the middle of these planes. Next, yes, the green lines shown here um, can be seen as a recall force, which traps all the peaks in the middle of these pins. And this gives way to our autonomous stabilization protocol. This was for the ideal GKP codes, but in practice, we don't have ideal GP, GKP codes with infinite energy. We have finite energy GKP states. Next, please. So, so far we have been trying to measure the stabilizer of the ideal GKP state. So the previous method will project the state onto the infinitely squeezed states that have infinite energy. Measuring these exact stabilizers adds a lot of energy in the system. And in practice, measurement device has finite precision, so energy would be finite, but still we want to have good control over the number of photons in the system, which is not in taken into account by the previous method of measuring the ideal stabilizers. The approach of dissipation engineering, however, that I discussed in the previous slide aims at stabilizing a finite energy GKP state. So before discussing our stabilization technique, let's see what finite energy states look like. Next, please. I can describe these states as applying an envelope operator E to the ideal GKP states, which simply reduces the energy of the states away from the origin. As a result, the peaks, instead of being infinitely squeezed, now, next, have a finite width delta, and the total width of this envelope is one by delta. As delta tends to zero, we move toward, move closer to an ideal GKP state. Now, we know that these things are not plus one eigenstates of the ideal stabilizers. Translation by two root pi in either direction will now shift the center of the grid. So we want to find the stabilizers of these finite energy GKP states, which is done by the following similarity transformation. And note that these two finite energy GKP stabilizers also commute. Next. Yeah, then fixed stabilizers can be rewritten as such. Next, please. Which can then with small delta approximation can be written as such e to the i2 root pi delta x pi delta plus i pi i p delta. Now, notice that this operator here inside the brackets is actually squeezed A operator, and the eigenstates of this operator are the squeeze states. Can you press next? Since our stabilizer is a function of the squeezed A operator, these squeeze states will also be the eigenstates of our finite energy states, finite energy 
um, GKP stabilizers, right? And now for error correction, we need to measure these weird stabilizers, which are neither unitary nor Hermitian. X by delta plus IP delta has an imaginary part and a real part. We do not know how to measure it, and hence dissipation engineering comes to the rescue. Next. Yeah, next slide. Thanks. We will control the energy in the cavity using a qubit by an engineered dissipation such that we do not need any measurements. Next. So depending on the Hamiltonian, we can choose the ground state that needs to be stabilized. Here in this circuit, the qubit acts as a zero temperature bath, whereby resetting the qubit, we can we extract one bit of entropy in every round in exactly the right way to stabilize a GKP state. So the logarithm, so let's see what dissipator we want here. Um, if you take the logarithm of our stabilizer, we get this operator where we get this modular x quadrature. Next, please. Modular x quadrature and standard p quadrature because of the multi-value nature of the logarithm. And that stabilizes these, these modulo squeeze states. So the dissipation map thus generated by this operator will stabilize the modulo squeeze states. We shall do the same thing for speed stabilizer. And so if we plug in this operator into the dissipator, it brings any state back to the code space. So for fun, we encoded, um, we coded a master equation using this dissipator and generated this following movie, which will show you how a vacuum state is taken to the GKP, finite energy GKP states with this dissipator. Can you play? Yeah. So you get this beautiful grid states by applying this dissipator. And um, so, um, using this dissipator, we can get our, state, um, our circuit for getting finite energy GKP states. I will not bother you with the calculations and show you immediately the three circuits that we obtained using this dissipation map. Can you press next? Thanks. So depending on how you decompose your, um, your terms in the dissipation, um, in that dissipation operator, you get these three different protocols. The first one being the first order scheme where if you, which is basically, if you just decompose your E to the A plus B terms into E to the A, E to the B, you get this first um, circuit. This was also implemented by Michel Devere's group in 2019. They, however, did not reset the qubit. This is the autonomous version of their protocol. What they did was they measured the qubit and applied a feedback displacement as shown in the previous slide on mesh, uh, stabilizer measurement circuit. However, in circuit model of computation, these two circuits are exactly the same. Um, it's called sharpen and trim because what it does is um, the first part of the circuit basically sharpens your peaks, so less decreases the delta by which your peak, uh, peak's width is defined. And resulting that basically increases the energy of the system. So the trimming now decreases the energy of the system and shrinks your, not doesn't shrink your code, but trims your code by applying a Gaussian envelope. This requires two steps to stabilize either uh, quadrature. So in total, one round of stabilization requires four steps two steps to stabilize your X quadrature, two steps to stabilize your P quadrature. Now coming to the second order schemes, if you include the commutator term E comma B in the decomposition, you get the second order terms. The, I, the good thing is you can do, using these schemes, you can do stabilization using just one step. So that's a good thing. And that's the benefit you get by adding the second order correction. Next please. Yeah, so uh, we applied, so I'm gonna show you some numerical results here. What we did was we applied stabilization along the P quadrature and stabilization along the X quadrature, alternatively repeated this process multiple number of rounds using the circuits um, given in the previous slide. Here we are plotting channel infidelity, which is which tells you how far is the state in my oscillator from the finite energy GKP states. I've induced photon loss in the cavity at the rate kappa, and have plotted on the x-axis photon loss rate kappa delta t, where delta t is the time taken by one round um, of stabilization, which includes the stabilization of x quadrature and p quadrature ones. So here are the curves for the three protocols. The red line is the fork encoding, which mentioned by, as mentioned by Steve in the morning, is when you take your the zero and one of levels of your harmonic oscillator as your qubit. 
our error correction code is only good enough if we beat this red line. So anything below, say, seven or 800 microseconds of fit, uh, photon loss rate will not be good for the first two schemes, sharp and trim and small, big, small. Here you can see that small, big, small has a better, has a higher slope compared to sharp and trim. And this is because of the second order correction. And the third, the third scheme, big, small, big, however, shows an even better break-even point. So using the big, small, big protocol, you can achieve break-even point at just 100 microseconds, which is great because the current transmon microsecond, uh, transmon lifetime, um, lifetime is around 245 microseconds. So, so yeah, that's very promising. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, wait. <laughs> yes, so what we're plotting, um, the next one, yeah. So what we're plotting here, just, just uh, that's it. What we're plotting here is channel infidelity, which is one, one, X, Y, and Z. That is, I stabilize my qubit, and then at some point I'm projecting onto either the plus one eigenstates of X, that is the plus logical state, or, and in another protocol, uh, in another simulation I did, uh, projected to plus Y state, and another simulation I projected it onto plus Z state, and now I'm plotting the, and I, now I take the channel fidelity to be the average of these three um, different simulation results, and I'm plotting the mi one minus um, of that. The experiment uh, that the Deverett group did is somewhere here, which is above the break-even point because they were able to break achieve break-even for the X states and the Z states, but not for the Y states using the square code I showed you. There is another type of code, which is the hexagonal code for which X logical, Z logical, and Y logical are all equal in length, which is not the case for square code. In that case, they were able, able to even break, uh, achieve the break-even point. So they were just right, right around the break-even point. But is that good? Do, you, do we want to stay on the break-even point? No, we want to do better than the break-even point. So in order to do that, we have to go left. Next, please. And that would mean that we would need to be at around 900 microseconds of photon um, transmon lifetime, which is basically, which basically needs us to decrease either kappa or delta t. And that would mean you either need to make better transmons or increase your gate time. And that's how we can improve um, upon these results. So with that, I would like to conclude that with dissipation engineering, we were, to we were able to find the exact energy stabilize the way to measure exact energy stabilizers, resulting in improved autonomous stabilization of protocols. And thank you. I will end my talk here and re I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Shatna, also, for thank such you. a nice thank talk. You. Well done. Also, so, thank you, Mr. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. Any questions? We can take lots of them. There is no problem. The last talk of the day and the symposium. So, any questions? Nishal has a question. Yes, looks yes. like he always had a question. Nishal, you have a question, it seems. Yeah, hi. Yeah. yeah. Am I unmuted? Yeah. No, I I, I, uh, I uh, didn't understand what uh, this fork encoding was. Okay. So in your harmonic oscillator, mm -hmm. you have n equals 0, 1, 2 to n levels, right? If you just take the n equals 0 as your ground state and n equals 1 as your excited state of the qubit, that is the 0 and 1 level of your qubit, and take basically abstract a qubit out of those two levels, that's your fork encoding. I see. I see. And we just want to do better than the lifetime of that 0, 1 uh, fork encoding. Because oh. that is the simplest way you can encode a qubit using a harmonic oscillator. So if you want to do anything more complicated, you should definitely do better than that, right? Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? 
if yeah. done, then uh, let's thank the speaker again. So thank you, Shraddha. We have done a nice job. So keep it up. Well done. Thank you. So over to you, That's Sudhir Bhai. Uh, ah, okay. So um, I thank now uh, Professor Amiya Bhagwat for taking the responsibility to chair this session. And uh, of course, uh, all the students, everybody did a great job. Uh, so now we have come to the end of our conference. And I uh, would like to invite uh, Professor Kailash Rostegi to say a few words uh, if Dr. Rostegi is there. I need to come here. Yeah, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Like on the. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No. Yeah, we can hear you. No. Unka, unka. Uh, uh, sound is not. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We can. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's better not. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, as an outsider, I thoroughly enjoyed this uh, workshop. Uh, it, it is uh, started with uh, pretty old people and uh, ended with very young people with a great uniform quality of uh, presentations. Only thing I would wish is that there are more of these. And uh, this time you have uh, focused uh, more on theory and uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, it was uh, very impressive indeed, the collection of speakers you have uh, managed uh, with the all nitty gritty details uh, given so lucidly. It's really amazing. It's absolutely. Uh, fantastic that uh, it will be really very, very helpful to all the young people who are getting into this field. Thank you. And I hope this dialogue will continue and uh, expand to other areas of quantum technology, um, namely sensing uh, other uh, types of qubits and uh, in all of those, uh, DRC particularly has a lot of engineering uh, expertise to contribute, both by interaction and actually by their facilities and expertise in fabrication. So all the best, and uh, thank you so much for organizing this and taking all the trouble of uh, doing all the hard work that is required for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your encouraging words. I like the help of our scientific secretary, Dr. Prashant Shukla, yeah. sitting on my right here. Thanks a lot. And I have a whole lot of people to thank, not only our BRC, the director's office, and the DA secretariat in Delhi, and the Ministry of External Affairs, I had to take the political clearance for all the foreign speakers. And in the middle of all the COVID, all the offices being closed, and True. people with 15% with attendance, it's a miracle that all this was done within a space of 17 days. Yeah, no, it's uh, very, very well organized. It was Thanks just so. that, I mean, um, people just knew so well and it was very nice. They just did it like magic. So uh, it was nice. That, and all, all the speakers agreed. I'm very grateful to everybody. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, if Professor Apoor Patel would like to say a few words. I would like to thank Sudhir for taking all the trouble and uh, 
getting an excellent set of people to talk about all the recent developments are going on in this particular field in particular those things related to superconducting uh, qubit uh, technology and certainly it was very helpful for me to know what all things are going on around the world and i hope it is the same for the others as well thank you sudeep thank you thank you thank you uh, i must add just one thing which is very personal which is that all this <clears throat> i had the confidence only because some of our best students were all over the place and and their advisors immediately agreed they said that oh yeah these people are very wonderful so it is also to uh, to an extent because of these young students who are doing so well that all the older faculty people at yale and augustus merzi and people at in florence and other places etc there are our students who have been great ambassadors and, and then ryan agreed to see uh, all of us uh, all of these people i have i mean seen them so so young little children and they are giving uh, they have given talks there i have sit down to learn what they have done and i really feel fantastic at So that's the real reason. Yeah. And here we have Nishchal, who is my former student, you know, helping out with this with another former student, <laughs> with uh, Shraddha, and you know, things working is is like uh, very nice, very very exciting. So yeah. Uh, so uh, we have just one last thing to do before we close. Uh, if if everybody could. Um, Oh, switch on their video. We could take a picture or a <laughs> screenshot. But somebody could take a screenshot if everybody could um, open their videos. But I don't know if people are willing to do that. Okay, so are they all? Professor Kailash was speaking. Yes. और लोग नहीं अकोमोडेट होंगे ऐसे नहीं होगा कि स्क्रीन छोटी होती जाएगी जैसे लोग जुड़ेंगे ऐसा नहीं हो पाएगा होता है ऐसा ऐसा होता है हम्म या गुड अक्षय राइन राइन इज गॉन हां अक्षय कट प्लेस हो जाए ना आई थिंक या समबडी मिशन कैन यू टेक अ स्क्रीनशॉट एंड देन शेयर not everybody is there but whatever can it should be is it done print screen on that oh no 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 वो श्रद्धा वो जो तुमने लगाया था ना अपना उसमें बिल्कुल ऐसे लगा है जैसे जब छोटे होते हैं तो वो दो रिबंस लगाते हैं ना चोटिया में लाल यू अंडरस्टैंड या ओके हो गई पिक्चर ओके द पिक्चर इज डन ऑल राइट वी हैव जस्ट वन लास्ट थिंग विच विल टेक लेस देन मिनट and we will switch on the national anthem thing will not and i ask everybody to please raise for the national anthem yahan par karo i was just and then this thing will start china china china
Okay. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Is it